What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was In Marvel As Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 7. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. How is this possible? Steve walked up to the big screen and stared fixedly at Bucky, who remained asleep in his cell. I saw him fall. He died. Oh, he's going to be dead, alright. Tony mutters as he stood beside Steve to get a better look at the man that supposedly killed his mother and father. I'm going to blow his damn head off. No, you won't. Steve turns a warning glare toward Tony. I don't know what's happening, but that's my best friend in there. Nobody is touching him. Instantly, a dangerous air formed in the room as both Iron Man and Captain America were a pin drop away from pouncing on one another. Let's all just calm down, Peter says as he snaps his fingers. Before either of them knew what was happening, both men were pushed off of their feet and into chairs, which strapped them down tightly. Both of them jolted in shock as they found themselves restrained. Of course, each of them is a super soldier, so they both pulled against the chair with all of their might, yet they didn't budge a single inch. Fury watched on with an impressed look, vowing to himself to look into this magic business, as it seemed like a useful skill to have in his arsenal. Even if he couldn't perform magic himself, maybe a few agents who could do so would come in handy in the future. Now that we're all seated and relaxed, I can finish explaining what I found out about the Winter Soldier or, rather, Bucky Barnes, Peter says as everyone turns their attention back to him. You know using magic is unfair? Tony says as he gives up on breaking free and glares at Peter. Thank you for restraining him, but I don't see why I should be bound as well. Steve asks, as he never wanted to fight in the first place. Is this necessary? Peggy asks, as she didn't like seeing Steve restrained. He only wanted to protect his best friend. Because, if I only tie up Tony, he'll complain about it non-stop for the next week. Peter explained with a roll of his eyes. I'd rather just restrain you both and avoid Tony's whining as much as possible. Hey, Tony shouts indignantly. I'm enjoying this. Fury comments from the side. Shut up, Baldy. Tony replied like a child. Okay. Can I continue explaining what I know, or should I just leave you guys here for a while and come back later? Peter asks, as he wanted to get this over with so he could sleep a bit more. After all, he only slept for a few hours before Grace's protection spell went off, waking him to her peril. I like that idea. Let's leave Stark here for the rest of the night. It'll help clear his mind. Fury agrees with a smirk. Don't you dare. Tony yells. Please continue. Steve looks at Peter. What happened to Bucky? Well, to be clear, I didn't know that the Winter Soldier was Bucky until I saw him today. Peter lies with a shrug. I only knew that the Winter Soldier was from your time, Steve. He had a mask on when you saw him earlier? Fury says doubtfully. Yes, but X-ray vision spells are rather easy, Peter explained, though he wasn't lying. Spells to see through objects are child's play for a sorcerer of Peter's skill. He could cast them in his sleep if he had to. You have to teach me that one, Tony says with a perverted smirk on his face. So, what do you know? Steve ignores Tony's outburst and asks. The Winter Soldier is a Hydra-made Super Soldier, who was brainwashed into following every order, no matter the difficulty. He is periodically frozen, like you were, so that his service to Hydra can be prolonged for as long as possible. They only let him out when it's time for a mission, Peter explains. How do you know this? Peggy asks, as information like this is heavily guarded. I have my ways, Peter says vaguely. What's his mission? Steve asks. To kill me, Fury admits, drawing everyone's attention. Pierce did say he would take care of you, didn't he? Tony comments as he recalled the recording that Peter showed them. Of course, the recording was fake, but Peter knew Hydra would target Fury sooner or later, so it seems like his prediction was correct. This doesn't change anything. Tony says as he turns to glare at the screen. He killed my mother. I loved my father, but he was a prick. My mother on the other hand is a very different story. I will kill him. The room went silent as everyone looked at Tony with a mix of both pity and sympathy. Okay, then you won't be leaving that chair for a while. Peter says as he waves his hand and released Steve. Hey, you can't just keep me as a prisoner in my own building. Tony yelled in anger as Fury chuckled from the side. Yes, I can. Although Bucky killed your parents, he wasn't the one responsible, Peter states as he turns to Steve. As for you, feel free to visit the prisoner, though he probably won't remember you. Thank you. Steve says as he rushes out of the door before anyone could speak further. I'll go with him, Peggy says as she walks off. Peggy, Peter calls, stopping her in her tracks. Just remind Steve that Bucky is to remain in his cell. 
We will try to find a way to fix the brainwashing, but he needs to be here for that to happen. Yes, sir. Peggy nods as she turns to rush after her boyfriend. As Peter and Fury were about to leave the room, Tony spoke up with a reluctant look on his face. Fine, I won't kill him. Just let me go already. Tony pleads unconvincingly. No, you're too emotional right now, Peter says as he knew Tony was lying. Once you calm down and fully understand the situation, I'll let you go. If not for Peter's actions, Tony would most likely follow in his movie counterpart's footsteps and go after Bucky, which would drag Steve and Peggy into the situation as well. You can't just drop the news that my parents were killed, show me the killer, and then say I can't do anything about it. Tony yells furiously. As I said, you're too emotional right now, Tony, Peter says as he waves his hand. I'll come to talk to you in a bit. Instantly, Tony and the chair that he was strapped to were swallowed up by a golden portal. Damn you. Tony screamed as the portal closed. First I find out your real identity and now Tony is in a magical timeout. Fury smirks at Peter and lets out a small laugh. Could my day get any better? Tap tap tap, Steve stood outside of Bucky's cell, tapping the glass with his knuckles. You may want to visit another time, Blonsky said as he leans against the wall of his cell. I've been calling to him for a while now, but he just won't wake up. Bucky, Steve yelled as he kept tapping the glass, ignoring the other prisoner's words. Sadly, Bucky didn't budge a single inch. I told you. It's like he's in a coma or dash Blonsky said, though he was cut off by the press of a button. That's better. Peggy commented as she used the control panel to mute Blonsky and fog up the glass of his cell. Now we can have our privacy. Thanks. Steve says as he keeps his eyes locked on his best friend. It's true. He's actually alive. He's been through a lot. Peggy says as she walks over. I don't remember the metal arm. He had two arms when I last saw him. Steve replies sadly. Don't sound so gloomy, soldier. Peggy says as she grasps Steve's arm and holds it close. This is a cause for celebration. Bucky is alive and well. We just need to break his brainwashing and he'll be back to normal. How do we even go about dash Steve spoke, though he stopped as he saw some movement in the cell. Is he awake? Peggy asks as Bucky's eyes snap open, and he sits up like the undertaker. Okay, that was creepy, question mark. Bucky looked around in confusion as his eyes landed on Steve and Peggy. Where am I? A cell in the Avengers Tower? Steve answers as he looks his old friend straight in the eyes. Do you remember who I am? Bucky didn't reply as he stared at Steve for a moment. After the small staring context concluded, Bucky stood up, walked to the glass, and started pounding on it with his metal arm. Bang bang bang, each hit didn't even rattle the cell, let alone damage the glass, which stayed in pristine condition throughout every strike. Bucky, stop. It's pointless. Steve calls out as he moved to stand in front of his friend, hoping to somehow make him remember. Who's Bucky? After almost an hour of talking to Bucky, who didn't seem to recognize his own name, let alone his best friend who was almost like a brother to him, Peggy dragged Steve away from the cell. I'm not done. Steve complained as he was pulled into the elevator. He won't remember this way. Peggy takes hold of Steve's head and looks him in the eyes. We need to fix whatever Hydra did to him first. How are we supposed to do that? Steve asks, as he truly had no idea what to do. I don't know, but Spider-Man probably does. After sending Tony somewhere nice to spend the night, so that he could hopefully clear his mind, Peter returned home to get some sleep. But sadly, the sleep would never come. You told some crazy gunman to shoot my mother? MJ yelled through the phone. I shouldn't have answered the phone. Peter thought as he lay in bed while getting an earful from his beautiful yet angry girlfriend. MJ isn't someone who's easily angered, though when she does get angry, which is extremely rare, it takes a while for her to cool down. By the time Peter got off the phone, the sun had risen, and it was almost time to start the Hydra cleaning operation. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Peter thought as he hopped out of bed and got ready for the day ahead. Arriving at the tower in his suit, Peter first opened a portal that deposited a sleeping Tony Stark into his office. Huh? Tony jolted awake as the chair he was strapped to hit the ground with a loud thud. What the? Good morning, sunshine, Peter says with a smirk under his mask. Damn you. Tony curses as he groggily stares at Peter. Should I send you back to timeout? Peter asks pointedly. Tony keeps his mouth shut, though his glare intensifies. Have you calmed down enough to talk? Peter asks as he takes a seat in front of him. Because we're taking down Hydra today, and I thought you'd want a shot at the real people responsible for your parents' deaths. Silence filled the room as Tony seemed to contemplate within himself. Fine, he wasn't in control, Tony grudgingly admits. But I don't want to see him anywhere near me or Pepper. Hmm, I actually believe you this time, Peter says as he snaps his fingers. Instantly, the chair and the restraints disappear and Tony is released. So, who gave him the order? Tony asks as he stretches his stiff limbs. I don't know yet, but we'll find out, Peter says reassuringly. When we do, leave them to me. Tony says dangerously as he heads for the door, but stops to turn back before leaving. One more thing. Yeah. Peter nods. I want the video that Fury talked about. Tony demands. Of course, he means the surveillance footage of his parents' deaths. Are you sure? Peter asks reluctantly. It's hard to watch. 
Yes, Tony nods with a determined look in his eyes. Okay, give me a second, Peter says as he starts typing away on his PC. Tapping into the SHIELD database with the many backdoors that he's crafted throughout the years, Peter quickly found the surveillance footage in question. Come here, Peter says as he puts the video in full screen and hits play. Together, Peter and Tony watch as a car crashes into a telephone pole and a man that looked a lot like Howard Stark tumbled out of the driver's seat. He looked badly hurt as he crawled in the dirt, as if he were deliriously running from something chasing him. Meanwhile, through the passenger side window of the car, the figure of a woman could be seen breathing heavily and holding her head in pain. Seconds later, a man on a motorcycle appeared, wearing the same mask that Bucky wore last night. At first, it looked like he might be there to help, but that idea was completely thrown away when he grabbed Tony's dad by the hair and lifted him up. After staring him straight in the eyes for a few seconds, Bucky winds back his free arm and starts bashing Howard's head in with a single fist. Thanks to his super strength, it only took a few hits for Howard's head skull cave in. Although Howard wasn't dead yet, Bucky knew he would die soon enough, so he dragged him by his hair and placed him in the driver's seat, where limply he fell onto the steering wheel and lay unmoving. Once the first target was taken care of, like an uncaring robot, the Winter Soldier walked around to the passenger side of the car and reached his hand inside the window. The view from the security camera wasn't the greatest, but they could see enough to know what was happening. Bucky wrapped his metal hand around Tony's mother's neck and squeezed, slowly choking her to death without an ounce of remorse. Tears fell from Tony's eyes as he watched his mother flail around, grasping at Bucky's metal arm to set her free. Sadly, she would die scared and confused. After both Starks were dead, Bucky searched the car, grabbed something from the back seat, and left as if nothing happened. I still can't kill him, Tony asks as his hands grip into tight fists. Think of him as a brainless robot, Tony. Peter tried to reason with his very distraught friend. Someone programmed him to do that, and when we find them, I'll gladly help you torture them to death. Call me when we start. Tony nods as he heads for the door. I'll be in my workshop. Almost an hour after Tony was released, Peter called in every member of the Avengers. It was finally time to take down Hydra. Of course, whenever you call a meeting with so many people, it always takes time for all of them to arrive. A lot of them show up on time, but there's always a few stragglers in every organization. Though surprisingly, Tony showed up only a minute after the message was sent, showing how serious he was about Hydra and avenging his parents. Soon enough, one of the main meeting halls was filled with people, who were all wondering what the hell was going on. All right, listen up. Peter yelled as he gave a quick explanation of what the mission was. Once the buildings are locked down, all of you will split up into teams and I will portal you inside each base one by one. Remember to only kill if necessary. I don't want any innocent SHIELD agents getting killed by mistake. Any questions? How do we tell SHIELD and HYDRA agents apart? Nightcrawler asks. You don't. Peter shakes his head. Capture them all. Anyone else? Alright, everyone suit up and get your weapons. We'll get everything started while you're gone, Peter says as everyone rushes to get ready, leaving only the Avengers Council members behind. I'm ready when you are. Fury says as he pulls out his phone. Hang on, let me just see where they are Peter says as he closes his eyes, feeling the tracking spells he placed a couple of days ago. Okay, I got it. With a wave of his hand, six golden portals opened on the ceiling and some very familiar people fell from each of them. Insert pictures of all six members of the World Security Council here. Ah. They all exclaimed as the ground opened up under their feet. As the six of them hit the hard floor, the six portals snapped shut as swiftly as possible. Call it in. Peter says as Fury hits a button on his phone and holds it to his ear. What the hell is going dash a woman in a blue suit asks as she picks herself up off the ground, though she soon found that her voice was taken away from her. Peter merely waved in their direction and all six of them suddenly found it impossible to utter a single word. Shook. Sure. Peter shushed them as he pointed to Fury. This is Director Fury. Authorization Alpha 1702562 Beta 4. Fury says as he puts the phone on speaker. Authorization confirmed? A woman on the other end replied. How can I help you, Director? Initiate alert level 5 and call in all agents. Fury orders as he turns to look at their six new guests. The World Security Council is missing and believed to be captured. As he said this, each member of the World Security Council looked between one another in both confusion and fright. Why yes, sir. The woman on the other end answered in shock. Initiating alert level 5. Please give me the authorization code. Tartarus 11683290 a Fury answers with ease. A authorization confirmed. She stutters as she didn't expect this to actually happen. Good, I'll relay more orders soon, but for now I want every agent called into work. We need all the help we can get. Fury says as he hangs up the phone. How long should I wait? Peter asks as he ignores the captives in the room. Give it about half an hour and lock everything down. We'll start cleaning house after that. What the hell do you think you're doing? Alexander Pierce exclaimed in both anger and confusion. He, like his fellow members of the World Security Council, was simply going about his day when the ground opened up and dumped him here. After listening to Fury call in their disappearance as if he wasn't a part of it, they all knew that the Avengers were up to something. 
Cleaning house, Fury answers as he glared at his former employers. Cleaning house of what? Pamela Hawley, the only female member of the World Security Council, asked. Of Hydra? Peter revealed as he watched a few of their guests reach for something in their pockets. Are you looking for these? As Peter spoke, everything from wallets, keys, and phones appeared in front of him, floating for everyone to see. Seeing this, each of the captives found their belongings gone, leaving only the clothes on their back and the shoes on their feet. You can't just hold us captive for no reason. Alexander Pierce spoke up for the group. Besides, Hydra has long been dead. I don't know what you're planning, but it won't end well for you. This schmuck is good. Fury says with a laugh. Isn't he? Peter agreed with a chuckle of his own. What's so funny? Chow Yen, the only Asian member of the World Security Council, asks in confusion. Because out of all of you that could have said that, it had to be the one we have actual evidence on. Tony says as he turns to glare at Pierce. Did you have my parents killed? What are you talking about, Stark? Pierce continues to play it off pretty well, though that would soon change. Jarvis, play the recording. Tony calls out, and the recording of the conversation between Pierce and Zola started to play. Hearing how casually and gleefully they talked about Project Insight's death toll and how it would rise to over 20 million people, most members of the World Security Council were utterly shocked, though the Rayal surprise came at the end. Hail Hydra. Hail Hydra. The two said their parting words and the recording came to an end. Instantly, all eyes were on Pierce, who was barely keeping it together at this point. Well, that's obviously fake. He looks around the room for some support, but no one offered any help. I never had that conversation. We've had the recording put through multiple checks. It's legit. Fury vouches for its legitimacy. Thank God for the reality stone. Peter thought as Tony took a step forward and stood face to face with Pierce. I'll ask again. Did you order the deaths of my parents? Tony was deadly serious as he spoke. Pierce answered back with a glare of his own. Tony remained in his face, staring like an angry predator. Tony, we can question them all later and find out, but now isn't the time. Peter spoke up, as he could see that Tony was close to getting violent. Fine, stick them in a cell. Tony says as he reluctantly turns away from his most likely suspect. Wait. Jakuna Singh, an Indian member of the World Security Council, yelled. Why are we all being detained? If Alexander is a Hydra operative, then arrest him and send us on our way. I don't have time to be imprisoned, and I've done nothing wrong. Maybe, Peter says with a shrug. Maybe not. We'll find out the truth in time. As he finished speaking, Peter waved his hand and six portals swallowed up the captives, sending each of them to their own personal cell. Truthfully, Peter couldn't recall whether there were more than two Hydra agents in the World Security Council. Alexander Pierce and Gideon Malik are definitely Hydra, but he wasn't sure about the rest. Shortly after the captives were sent away, the geared-up Avengers started trickling in, looking like they're ready for war. Lock it all down. Fury says to Peter, as he was paying attention to the time. All right, give me a minute, Peter says as he gets to work. Question mark. Every Avenger who just arrived watched curiously as two very complicated spell circles drew themselves in the air in front of Peter. Hopefully, this works. Peter thought as he grasped the center of both spells and twisted them clockwise. Seconds later, a locking sound was heard as each spell shot up out of the building and disappeared into the sky. What was that? Sabretooth exclaimed in awe. Magic. As Peter sent the two spell circles flying, all around the world, golden strands of light came crashing down onto all sorts of buildings and bunkers. As the light hit each location, a golden shield-like barrier would cover the outer walls of the buildings, drawing curious looks from anyone passing by. Inside these structures, it didn't take long for people to realize that their windows were glowing like giant neon lights. Especially after they saw how the barrier blocked all communications from leaving the building, stranding the inside without a way to call for help. After some panic, many tried to escape and soon found that they were completely sealed inside the building. Even underground tunnels and rooftop helicopters were inaccessible, as the golden light surrounded everything. In some places, all sorts of firepower was employed to hopefully break their way out, from simple bullets to high-grade explosives, yet none could shake the unbreakable barrier. Did it work? Fury asks, but his phone started ringing like crazy, as hundreds of calls came in at the same exact time. I'll take that as a yes. Of course, he simply turned his phone on do not disturb, as he would all be busy soon enough. Yeah, each barrier is up, though I wasn't able to hide them from the public. Peter explains, as deploying so many barriers at the same exact time all across the world was already hard enough. No problem, I'm sure that we can spin a story for the media later on, Magneto says as he floats off of the ground, ready to head out. How should we split everyone up? Magneto may not show it, but he and every other metahuman are very eager to head out. Hydra, and S.H.I.E.L.D. by extension, has kidnapped and experimented on metahumans for a long time, so this cleanup is something that they've always wanted to do. Even Charles looked excited to head out, and he despises conflict. Myself, Eric, Charles, and Tony will work alone, Peter says as they were all strong enough to do so. Fury, Steve, Peggy, Storm, and Wolverine will be team leaders. Pick whoever you feel most comfortable working with. 
Peter would have allowed Silk to have her own team as well, but MJ was sticking close to her mother after the Bucky incident, so she wouldn't be attending this mission. Listening to Peter's orders, everyone formed teams fairly quickly. Alright, remember to detain everyone. We'll worry about where to imprison them afterward. Peter says as he opens nine portals, leading to the lobbies of separate shield bases. Since Peter would have to act as the portal bitch, due to the fact that he was the one that could, he had to work quickly so he can be ready to shuttle the teams to their next locations. In order to work quickly, Peter tried the diplomatic approach first. Stepping out of a portal and into the main lobby of what appeared to be a government building, Peter was welcomed by some armed men and women, who seemed to be testing the barrier before his arrival. Spider-Man. A few of them muttered as they lowered their weapons. In the flesh? Peter says as the portal snaps shut behind him. Spider-Man, sir. A respectful woman with a pistol in hand walks up to Peter. We seem to be trapped inside the building. Are you here to help? No, I'm the one that put up the barrier. Peter admits as a few agents point their guns in his direction once again. Um, why? She asked in confusion. Because everyone in this building is being detained by order of your director and the Avengers, Peter says, shocking everyone into a stupor. I'm going to need each of you to place your weapons on the ground and stand aside. Why, have we done something wrong? She asks as a few agents start getting antsy. Not you particularly, Peter says with a shake of his head. Now put the guns down and surrender. The faster you give up, the faster you can be proven innocent, or guilty. Guilty of what? A man in the back asks as a few agents have already dropped their weapons. Guilty of treason as a Hydra agent? Peter says and instantly half of the people in the room took aim and fired in his direction, including the respectful woman who was asking him questions. As the bullets came his way, Peter smirked under his mask and stood unmoving. With a simple thought, every solid metal bullet was instantly changed into a foam nerf dart, which fell short of its target and hit the floor at Peter's feet. Question mark. Each Hydra agent that just fired their weapons at Peter were utterly confused. That wasn't very nice, but thanks for outing yourselves. It makes my job a bit easier, Peter says as they try to shoot again. Pulling their triggers, each Hydra operative watched with shock-filled eyes as nothing but a weak stream of water shot from the barrel of their guns. All right, enough fun and games. You're making a mess, Peter says as he gestures to the wet floor. Now line up against the wall like good little children. Everyone was completely dumbfounded by what just happened that a good portion of people actually followed his instruction and stood by the wall. Suddenly, almost all of the outed Hydra agents bit down on something in their mouths. Nope, Peter uttered as each of their cheeks expanded until confetti came flying out of their mouths. Suicide is never an option. All of them broke a fake tooth, which held enough cyanide to kill them in seconds, as all Hydra agents are brainwashed into doing when captured. Sadly, Peter noticed and immediately used the ether to turn the toxin into confetti, which they would spit out, saving their lives. Now against the wall, please. I don't have all day, Peter says as he motions toward the others. Why yes, sir. Someone stuttered as everyone followed Peter's orders this time. Good, Peter says as he webbed each of them against the wall. I'll be back. Um, sir? The woman from earlier calls out. What? Peter asks as he turns back. I'm in charge of this base, she says nervously. If you want everyone to listen to you, I can help. Sure. Peter shrugs as the web holding her against the wall disappeared, sending the nervous Hydra agent slash base commander tumbling to the floor. Keep up. Scrambling to get to her feet, the woman rushed to catch up to Peter, who was already at the other end of the hallway. With the base commander's help, Peter was able to capture everyone in around 20 minutes, saving him a lot of time. If anyone was able to enter the building, they would find it littered with webbed up shield and Hydra personnel plastered on the walls. As Peter finished up, he heard a voice in his ear. This is Charles. I finished with my first location, though I may need assistance. Professor Xavier called. I'm on the way. Flashback Charles POV. Of course, Peter wasn't the only one who tried the diplomatic approach, though he had much more success than Charles. He's on the first floor. Go go go. Armed agents were notified as they rushed to Charles's location with assault rifles in hand. Upon his arrival at this dimly lit underground bunker, Charles tried to explain just like Peter did, but they wouldn't even give him a chance to talk before getting violent. Of course, as the professor didn't like violence, he simply put them to sleep with thought and continued forward, hoping that the next group would listen. Sadly, his actions were caught by the surveillance cameras, which started the situation he currently found himself in. He's around the corner, agents matched one of Charles's location, ready to pump the unknown intruder full of lead. Luckily, Charles could feel the presence of his enemies with ease as he casually walked through the underground hallways. The second these armed shield slash Hydra agents turned the corner, ready to fire in the professor's direction, each of them collapsed into a pile, leaving just enough room for Charles to pass by. After repeating this over and over, Charles found himself in front of a locked metal door, which needed both a badge and facial scan to get through. Sigh. Charles let out an annoyed breath as he lifted a nearby unconscious agent with his mind and slapped his face against the scanner. Access denied, the screen turned red as a robotic voice spoke negatively. 
Tossing the man aside with a single thought, Charles levitated another limp body and planted their face against the scanner. Access denied, after four failures in a row, Charles found the right man and was able to open the door, though he didn't like what he found on the other side. Once all of the guards behind the door were sent to sleep, Charles walked in and found a long hallway filled with cells on either side. In these cells were men, women, and children, though mainly children. It didn't take Charles long to realize what these people were. Metahumans. Seeing the horrible living conditions as well as the haggard and beaten states of some of them, Charles felt both pity and disgust. Pity for the poor people who were subject to this, and disgust toward those who held them here against their will. No matter how much good the Avengers do, it feels like there will always be places like this. Charles thought dishearteningly. Knowing that this was the last room in the bunker, Charles tapped a device in his ear and spoke. This is Charles. I finished with my first location, though I may need assistance. Professor Xavier spoke. I'm on the way. Peter's voice replied. Flashback end. Seconds after his reply, a portal opened up next to the professor, and out came Spider-Man. As Peter came walking in, everyone cowered at the back of their cells, while only one child held the bars of her cage and looked forward with eyes resembling a predator. She looked to be around eight or nine years old, with black hair and dark brown eyes. Although she could be seen as a cute kid, the deadly glare and killer aura that radiated off of her was covering that up very well. Insert picture of Laura Kinney slash X23 here, she looks familiar. Peter thought as he realized why Charles needed help. Are they all metahumans? I think so. Charles answers with a sad sigh. All right, I'll get them out of here, Peter said as he opened another portal. You can go to the next location? Okay. Charles sends one more sympathetic look toward his captured people before walking into the portal, which snapped shut soon after. Listen up. Peter exclaims, getting everyone's attention. GRRRRR. The little predator at the bars started growling softly in his direction. Relax, I'm here to help. Peter says as he walks over and yanks the door to her cell off with ease. I'll take you dash just as Peter was trying to explain that he would take them to the professor's school, where they could be treated for any injuries, the rabid little girl launched out of her cell and jumped in his direction. Watching her in amusement, Peter saw two bony claws extend from each fist before they came swiping in his direction. Is she Wolverine's daughter? Peter wondered as he caught her outstretched wrist, stopping her attack with ease. Being aggressive and defensive is good, as it can keep you alive, but I'm not here to hurt you. Calm down. The little girl in his grasp seemed to relax for a moment, though it didn't last long. Hoping to throw off her enemy, the young girl pretended to listen to Peter before using her free hand to stab her long claws into his stomach. As the pointed tips of her claws made contact with Peter, the young girl smirked thinking she had won. Sadly, unlike Wolverine's, her claws were made of just bone. Sharp and pointy bone but bone nonetheless. Feel better? Peter asks as he releases her wrists, allowing the girl to fall to her feet. Thanks to the enchantments on his clothes, the girl's claws couldn't even cut a single thread from his suit, let alone penetrate past it and into his stomach. Ag. Angered by her failure, the animalistic girl starts slashing her claws at Peter's stomach and legs. After allowing her to tire herself out, as her body wasn't in the best condition, to begin with, Peter patted the angry child's head as she panted to catch her breath. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you. Peter reassured her as she looked up at him for a moment, studying his non-existent facial features to see if he was lying. As if confirming his words, the girl gave him a small nod before falling unconscious and crashing to the floor. Of course, Peter caught her before she could get hurt and held her like a princess. Kids shouldn't have to be like this. Peter muttered as he turned to see all of the other metahuman children, cowering in their cages. Flashback X-23's POV. Ever since X-23 was born, she lived underground, kept like a caged animal as all sorts of tests and experiments were performed on her. Using the DNA of Wolverine, Dr. Martin Sutter headed the project to implant X-23's mother with a metahuman child, though she never met her mother. X-23's earliest memory is the day that one of the female scientists unlocked her cell and rushed her out of the facility under the cover of darkness. She could still remember how infinitely excited she was to see the outside world for the first time. The sky, trees, dirt, grass, and the smell of fresh air were an absolute shock to someone who lived their entire life trapped in a windowless bunker. Sadly, their little trip outside the facility didn't last long, as seconds after their departure, alarms sounded and men with guns came chasing after them. As they drove down the dirt path away from the bunker, two blacked-out escalades blocked the path and before X-23 knew what was happening, an expertly shot bullet tore through the windshield and hit the scientist in the chest. Instantly, the woman lost control of the car and crashed into some nearby bushes. After the crash, X-23 turned to see the scientist coughing blood and looking in her direction with feelings of both regret and love. Your name, is Laura Kinney. The woman coughed out as she smiled weakly. I'm so sorry Dash before she could finish talking, a man in uniform walked up to the driver's side window, pulled out his pistol, and put a single bullet in her head. As X-23 watched this happen, she noticed a badge on the woman's white lab coat with a name labeled under her smiling picture. Sarah Kinney, Mom. 
X-23 muttered in disbelief as she looked up to see the life drain from her bloody mother's face. After that day, the security around X-23 was upgraded, though that wasn't all. The experiments that she was forced to undergo turned much crueler as well. It was as if her mother's presence kept the more sadistic scientists at bay, and without her there, they started to run wild. They did everything from cutting her skin and beating her black and blue, to making her drink acid and infecting her with horrible diseases, all in hopes of finding the secret of her immense regeneration ability. Of course, as she was a subject of the Weapon X program, they also began her training as a killer, hoping to turn her into a beast that would slaughter anyone at the slightest instruction. For years passed since the death of her mother, and X-23's life has been nothing but loneliness and pain. One day, while Laura, as she liked to call herself in private, was sitting alone in her dark cell, alarms started to sound as men and women rushed back and forth in the hallway. Seconds after the alarm went off, Laura was dragged from her cell in a hurry and thrown into a car. Although she had no idea what was happening, the gunfire and explosions that filled the air told her something big was going down. Though, thanks to her increased security and a secret backdoor exit, Laura was evacuated before any intruders could get to her. This would be the second time that she saw the outside world. Using this as an opportunity, Laura put all of the skills her captors taught her to use and killed every guard that left with her, including Dr. Sutter, who took the same evacuation path. Luckily, they left so quickly that no one remembered to restrain her in any way whatsoever. It was the first time that Laura wet her claws with blood, killing for the very first time. She was eight years old at the time, though she didn't cry or even think on it much. With her newfound freedom, Laura rushed into the forest and ran until her legs couldn't run anymore. Laura had no idea where to go, but she knew that she needed to get as far away as possible if she wanted to keep her newfound freedom two weeks past as Laura lived in the forest like an animal, using her claws to hunt for food, which she would eat raw, and drink from a clean stream that she found on her second day in the wilderness. As the days passed, Laura soon found that she enjoyed the life of an animal far more than life in a cage, living at the whims of others. She could eat and drink whenever she wanted. Go wherever she pleased. Sleep whenever the need arises, and even use the bathroom without anyone watching. Life was good though, it didn't last very long. Sadly, freedom isn't easily obtained, but it is easily taken away. Near the end of her third week in the wild, a man with a metal arm and face mask appeared. At first, she could smell and hear his arrival, though since it was only one person, Laura decided to simply kill him. After all, he entered her territory. Of course, when this plan was put into action, Laura instantly found out that her visitor wasn't some normal human. No, this was the Winter Soldier. After a short fight, Laura was beaten unconscious, and her coveted freedom was stripped from her yet again. When she woke up on the following day, what greeted her was nothing but metal bars and men in lab coats. Instantly, she broke down into tears. Why can't they just leave me alone? Laura thought sadly. Just like before, the experiments started up again, though it was like these people didn't know much about her, so they repeated almost every experiment she ever went through at the old bunker. Of course, Laura didn't make it easy for them. Acting like a wild tiger, she would pounce and kill anyone that tried to approach her cage. In the months she stayed at this new prison, Laura killed a total of seven people. Three guards and four scientists. It got so bad that they had to put up a sign to make sure everyone knew not to approach her cell, and use tranquilizer darts every time she was needed in the lab. Though one day, a bald man with a shiny head arrived, knocking every one of her captors down with a single glance. Though that wasn't all. Seconds later, a big golden portal opened up and a masked man in a spidery costume stepped out. They talked for a moment before another portal opened out of nowhere. All right, I'll get them out of here, the spidery man said. You can go to the next location? As the bald man left through the portal, the masked spider guy said some words before ripping open her cell door like it was made of paper. Feeling threatened, Laura pounced out of her open cage and slashed her bony claws at him, as she did whenever anyone came near her. As if he were dealing with a toddler, the masked guy countered her attack with ease and stood there as she screamed and clawed at him, not doing a single speck of damage in the process. It's okay, I'm not going to hurt you, he said reassuringly, as she came to realize how futile her struggle was and gave up. Compared to this guy, the metal arm idiot was a pushover. Laura thought as her built-up adrenaline disappeared and she toppled over. The last thing that Laura could remember was the smell of the invincible man, who took her into his arms before she could hit the floor. Flashback and Peter's POV. After dropping off all of the metahumans at Xavier's school for gifted children, Peter returned to the mission at hand. I wonder how Hydra got their hands on X-23, Peter thought. Peter knew that Wolverine's daughter was created in an attempt to redo the Weapon X program, which Wolverine escaped from. Was Hydra involved with that program as well? Peter questioned as he worked his way through a hostile shield base. Or did my involvement with MetaHumans somehow change her life's trajectory? Saving these questions for later, Peter concentrated on the problem in front of him. Shield. One by one, Peter captured base after base, while simultaneously shuttling Avengers back and forth over and over. Some bases surrendered easily after either a brief conversation or a show of force and others went into full battle mode. 
Peter found it amusing how the people you wouldn't expect always wound up being Hydra agents. In one building, Peter found a sweet old librarian, who kept track of some physical records for that base. At first, she seemed about as kind and loving as a grandmother could get, though the second she realized what Peter was there for, she pulled out an assault rifle from behind her desk and started spraying. Hydra really is everywhere. Of course, not all bases were as simple as capturing everyone inside. Some of them needed a bit of extra care, like the base he found X-23 in. Out of the 93 bases, around 20 of them held some sort of captives, which weren't approved by Fury. Metahuman or otherwise, though they were mostly metahumans, who seemed to be used for experimentation and possible indoctrination into Hydra. Speaking of metahuman indoctrination. Hail Hydra. A man whose body was covered in flames screamed fanatically as he jetted both of his hands forward, shooting beams of fire in Peter's direction. This is a first. Peter casually thought as he dodged the horizontal pillars of fire, which destroyed the walls behind him, drilling fiery holes, which spread up the walls and filled the area with black smoke. Peter has never had a run-in with a hostile metahuman before. Yeah, he had to beat Wolverine and his brother a few times, but that doesn't really count. Even his run-in with Magneto and the Brotherhood of Mutants was solved through communication, which lead to a fruitful partnership. Even after Peter found out metahumans were in this world, they haven't popped up on his radar ever since. Maybe Charles and Eric have been handling it? Peter thought as he rushed forward, while still dodging all sorts of fire attacks. That made the most sense, as the cooperation between Eric and Charles is likely a huge nightmare for all villainous metahumans and anti-metahuman factions as well. After all, you have Charles who is constantly recruiting young metahuman students to his school, making it hard for anyone to snatch up any superpowered children. Then you have Eric, who literally made it his life's mission to hunt down anyone who would kidnap or hurt his people. Truthfully, it's hard out there for an evildoer, especially in the United States, where the Avengers' power is centralized. Out of the 20 bases that held metahumans inside, the large majority of them were outside the United States of America, showing just how hard it is to operate there. Even Hydra, who has access to all of the resources and personnel of S.H.I.E.L.D., didn't seem to have many metahuman agents. This is the first I've seen. Peter thought as he appeared behind the fiery meta and clocked him in the back of the head. Ha! Huh? Peter grunted in shock as he watched his fist phase through the blazing man's head, as if he were a drunkard, trying to fight a fire with his fists. That's an interesting ability, Peter muttered as he watched his attacker's head morph back to normal once he pulled his hand back. Haha. <laughs> the burning metahuman laughed like a victorious villain. You may be strong, Spider-Man, but since you can't touch me, you'll burn soon enough. They always do. Love the evil monologue, but I have like 30 more shield bases to raid, so let's get the show on the road, shall we? Peter said as he strolled over to the nearby fire alarm and pulled it. Instantly, the sound of a warning bell filled the building, as countless small sprinklers on the ceiling started showering out water, which covered everything. Afgaf. The fiery metahuman screamed in horrendous pain as the water poured all over his body. Water beats fire. Peter commented as he watched the man, who was just cackling like a dark lord a moment ago, crumble to the ground and huddle into a ball. Pokemon logic always prevails. Once the guy was thoroughly soaked and weakened, Peter dumped him in a cell back at the tower via a portal and flipped the fire alarm back up, turning off the sprinklers. Searching the rest of the building, Peter found a group of captured metahumans, similar to the group from his meeting with X-23, so he moved them to Xavier's school as well. After he dropped them off, Peter received a call from Fury's team. Hey, we could use some help here. Clint exclaimed over the radio, followed by what sounded like an explosion. On the way, Peter answered as he stepped through a portal to find Fury, Clint, Natasha, Daredevil, Loki, and Jessica being manhandled by a giant metahuman, who seemed to be made out of a copper-colored metal. Seriously, you guys can't beat some metal guy? Taking a closer look at the giant's facial expressions, Peter assumed that he was most likely brainwashed. His eyes were dull and even in a stressful situation like this, he didn't seem the least bit worried or surprised by their arrival. Either this guy has some serious emotional issues, or he's a puppet like Bucky. Just as Peter thought this, the copper metahuman looked towards him and shot a bright beam of yellow light from his eyes, though Peter simply sidestepped it as he studied the ability with interest. As the beams passed him, Peter watched as they bore two tiny holes in the wall, which continued unimpeded all the way to his barrier before coming to a halt. He can do that too. Clint called out as he knocked an arrow and let it loose. With the aim of a legendary marksman, the arrow flew across the room and struck the laser-shooting metahuman right in the forehead, blowing up on impact. Although the arrow and the explosion did absolutely no damage to the assailant, the shockwave managed to knock him off of his feet, stopping him from continuing the deadly laser attack. He's also invulnerable to every attack we throw at him, Natasha explains as Jessica rushes forward and kicks his down form, sending the metahuman flying into the wall at breakneck speed. Anyone would think that the fight was over or at least close to its end, but that wasn't the case at all. As the dust cleared, the Copper Hydra agent could be seen standing beside a broken wall, as if nothing happened whatsoever. He was still in pristine condition without even looking the slightest bit tired or hurt. 
Okay, I can see why this would be a bit challenging for you guys, but it really shouldn't be that hard. Peter says as he gets a glare from Fury's entire team. We're not all monsters like you. Jessica yelled in frustration as she dodged another laser beam. Well, how about I give you a hint? Peter says as he had no intention of stepping in unless they really needed it. In Pokemon metal types are weak to fire, although they're probably the weakest team of them all, due to Loki, Clint, Natasha, and Daredevil, who have little to no superpowers, that doesn't mean they couldn't win on their own. They just have to use their brains a bit. What the hell does a children's game have to do with this? Jessica yelled as she glared in Peter's direction. Do you want another hint? Peter asks as he walks to the side and leans against a wall, enjoying the annoyed glares of his fellow Avengers. If Pokemon isn't your forte, then how about this? Metal conducts electricity, I'll handle it. Keep him busy, Loki said as he ran out of the room. Although Loki wasn't an actual member of the Avengers, he acts as Jessica's assistant and uses that as an excuse to tag along throughout every mission. Of course, Peter allows it as he hopes to one day recruit the former villain, though time would tell whether he truly changes enough to become a hero or not. After watching the group fight and distract the copper metahuman for a while, Peter watched as Loki came running in with a bundle of long-cut wires. Attach the ends of these to your arrows and aim where they'll stick, Loki orders Clint as he starts plugging the wires into a nearby outlet. He's solid metal, where will they stick? Clint asked in confusion. I don't know. Figure it out. Loki yelled back. Fine. Clint muttered as he attached the wires and took aim. Waiting for the perfect shot, Clint fired as soon as Jessica managed to knock the guy off of his feet once again. Just as the copper metahuman hit the ground, an arrow grazed his side and pierced into the ground. Though what followed was nothing but excruciatingly painful. Aya. The silent metal man screamed as the electrically charged arrow remained in constant contact with his body, sending a powerful current through him. Though that wasn't the end. Clint continued to fire, and each new arrow introduced more electricity to the man's metal body, which was currently spasming in the ground uncontrollably. See, I said you could do it, Peter said happily as a portal opened up below the shaking metahuman, depositing him in his own cell in the Avengers Tower. You could have just done that from the beginning? Jessica says with a huff. Yes, but if I do everything for you, then what's the purpose of having you around? Peter says with a shrug. Jessica merely rolled her eyes at him as she stomped her foot in frustration, cracking the ground with relative ease. Remind me not to make her angry? Clint whispers to Loki, who nodded in agreement as he felt her anger before and would much rather stay on Jessica's good side. After helping Fury's team with their metahuman problem, Peter received a bunch of other calls, informing him of similar situations for the other teams as well. Of course, the other groups were able to handle their problems alone, so Peter only had to portal the beaten Hydra metas into their new cells. Once everyone was finished with their work, Peter counted exactly nine Hydra metas, who were now permanent residents of the Avenger Tower detainment floor. Some had great powers, like the metal guy who had Superman laser beam eyes, and others were a bit of a letdown, to say the least. Like one man, who had the power to fart a deadly toxic gas. The X-Gene is truly random. Peter thought as he remembered the looks on Storm's face when he arrived to portal the guy away. Luckily, Peter wasn't there to witness the fight, but Storm described it well enough. We walked in, and this pervert pulled down his pants, turned around, and... Peter couldn't hold back his laughter as he heard what happened. The poor guy got the worst role imaginable when it came to superpowers. He couldn't even attack with his clothes on and face his enemies head on. Unlucky, Peter thought with a shake of his head. With every base captured, Peter brought all of the teams together so that they could organize how to deal with the huge number of prisoners. Everyone go and take a 30-minute break, while we talk, Peter shooed the lower ranks away, leaving only his fellow council members, Steve, and Peggy behind. Sir, the media is in a frenzy with the barriers appearing all around the world, and the president has called multiple times, asking if the Avengers are involved. Jarvis spoke up as the room emptied. You couldn't have made the barriers invisible? Tony turns to Peter and asks. No, it would have complicated the spell even more than it already was. Peter answers with a shrug as he whips out his phone. I'll text Barack and let him know it's us. What about the media, sir? Jarvis asks as the TV on the wall brightens, revealing an image of a building surrounded by a golden barrier. Thankfully, Jarvis muted it so they didn't have to listen to newscasters argue over whether this was the work of aliens or some crazy phenomenon that couldn't be explained. I'll tweet dash Peter stopped speaking as he saw the reply he got from the president. Forget it, Barack said he would hold a state of address and explain that it's us. Let's just let him handle it. Throughout his time as an Avenger, building this place from the ground up, Peter has learned the ebbs and flows of the political world. The president would stand to gain a lot of backing if he is the one to explain what's going on, as it would show that he has a good grip on the situation as well as a working relationship with the Avengers. And lucky for him, Peter has a good opinion of Barack, or else he would simply write a tweet and be done with it. Of course, most people in the room understood this and agreed with his decision. It's best to keep the politicians and world leaders happy. At least, for now. There are a lot of prisoners and not enough cells. Charles changes the subject as he knew this would be a headache. 
Yes, which is why we should start screening each person, so the real shield agents can assist us, Peter says, receiving nods of agreement all around. How though? Tony asks as he flops down into a seat. We can't just read their minds and... Instantly, all eyes turn to Charles, who shook his head instantly. No, I don't like invading people's privacy, Nazis or not. Charles vehemently declined. We aren't asking you to mind grape them, Peter says, both happy and annoyed at Xavier's answer. On one hand, if he was more willing, then this entire situation would be sorted in a day or two. On the other hand, thankfully, Charles isn't a mind grapist, who would break anyone's trust and privacy at the drop of a hat. Either way, my mind has been protected for a while now. Peter thought in relief, though he suddenly remembered something. MJ doesn't have her mind protected, and she's met Charles a few times already. Although Peter didn't think that Professor Xavier read her mind, he now has to fortify the mind of everyone who knows his real identity. I should have done this earlier. Peter reprimanded himself. Saving these thoughts for later, Peter finished speaking. We'll bring them into a room one by one and ask if they're Hydra, and all that you have to do is skim their surface thoughts to see if they're lying about their answer. Peter explains, hoping to sway him into accepting the plan. The whole room descended into discussion and sometimes arguments, as everyone spoke their part, adding ideas and disagreements. Though, when it was all said and done, Peter's plan rose to the top as the clear winner. The professor didn't look very happy with his part in this, but in the end, he reluctantly agreed to do the job. Soon enough, everyone returned from their short break and was ready to get back to work. Alright, here's what's happening. Peter explained the plan to everyone who wasn't there for its formation. Since we only have one mind reading professor, we'll have to go through each captured base one by one. With the plan explained, Peter opened a portal and sent them on their way. Tony stay behind, Peter calls out, stopping his friend from following the group. You two aren't coming? Steve asks as he and Peggy hang back. No, we have a Nazi computer to shut down. Peter shook his head. You're going after Zola? Peggy asks. Yup, as the oldest living member of Hydra, I thought it best to ask if he knows who ordered the deaths of Tony's parents. Peter revealed his plans. Upon hearing this, Tony, who was originally reluctant to lag behind, was instantly on board with Peter's idea. Let us come with you, Steve says as he points at the open portal behind him. Besides, they have more than enough manpower to go around. Fine, but there probably won't be much fighting. Peter agrees with a shrug as he closed one portal and opened another. Stewing in his terminal command center from the 1970s, Armin Zola was currently confused beyond belief. Insert picture of Arnim Zola's computer body slash room here, hours ago, a golden barrier covered the entirety of Camp Lehigh, which included the room which houses this machinery, which in turn houses the brilliant mind of Nazi scientist Armin Zola. In the early 70s, Zola received a terminal diagnosis. Realizing that he didn't have much time left to live, Zola concluded that science couldn't save his body's dying body, but it could save his mind, literally. Without wasting time, Zola got to work constructing a supercomputer, dubbed his greatest masterpiece, to synthesize and emulate his own brain through 100 billion neurons that he recreated and replicated with microprocessors of his design. All of this left him trapped in the basement of the main building of Camp Lehigh, a former United States Army base, which was later turned into S.H.I.E.L.D.'s first base of operations. Of course, as the barrier appeared around his home, Zola sent many of his flesh-bodied lackeys to collect data on the odd occurrence, finding the whole phenomenon both intriguing and worrisome. Someone wants me trapped in here. He thought as he orders his men to use everything they could to break the barrier so that he could send out a distress signal. As the hours passed, Zola became even more fearful. No amount of force, finesse, or firepower worked against the indomitable force field. Just as the last lackey left after giving him another disappointing status update, Zola watched in realization as a golden portal opened appeared in the center of his room. Yes, the colors do match. Zola thought as he stared at the golden portal through the many cameras in the room. Spider-Man, I should have known that it was you. Zola welcomed Peter as he stepped into the room, followed by Steve, Peggy, and Tony. Yup, we decided that S.H.I.E.L.D. needed some cleaning up, and you're last on the list, Peter says as the portal closed behind him. Zola, is that really you? Steve asks as he remembered the man from his fight against Hydra during the war. Oh, if it isn't the star-spangled man with a plan? Zola says with a cybernetic laugh. You haven't aged a single day, have you? Incredible. And you're looking very, computery? Steve replied as he stared into the monitor, which showed a black and green face that looked slightly like the original Zola. Truly a master of the English language, Zola says with a laugh. Have you seen Bucky yet? Instantly, the mood changed as Steve's face hardened into a glare. If I'm the last stop, then you must have found him. Zola speaks as if he were gleefully poking a bear with a stick. I put in a lot of work to mold him into the man he is today. Countless days went into programming Sergeant Barnes into a good little boy. In the beginning, he begged and pleaded for you to come save him, but you never showed up. Just as Steve was about to lose his mind and start breaking things, the image of Zola's face turned to Tony. Speaking of, how have you been Mr. Stark? Zola sounded very amused with himself as he spoke. Losing your parents so early must have been hard. 
Sadly, they met an unfortunate accident, didn't they? Okay, let's calm down for a second. Peter could see what Zola was doing and tried to put a stop to it, but. You. Tony uttered in furious anger as his Iron Man suit formed along his body in an instant. Oh, crap. Oh, shit. Peter muttered as he knew what Zola was trying to do. In the movie, Zola locked the Avengers that found him inside the room and called in an airstrike, hoping to kill his enemies alongside himself. Of course, he did that in order to stop them from revealing what they knew about Project Insight, though that wasn't the only reason. As a living supercomputer, Zola is a literal data bank of everything related to Hydra going all the back to World War II. He was one of the main people who spearheaded the rebuilding of Hydra after being recruited into the United States during Operation Paperclip. If he were to be captured, then every bit of information he knew would be in the hands of his captors. Names, addresses, plans, and so much more were locked up inside his metal brain, waiting to be harvested. On top of that, unlike a normal human, Zola is unable to forget anything, making him a treasure trove of information. He isn't even human anymore, making the information readily available to anyone who could hack into his mind. He wants to commit suicide. Peter thought as soon as the provoking words started flying. After all, without the ability to call in an airstrike, since Peter's barriers were blocking all communications, Zola was left extremely vulnerable. Before Peter could reveal what was happening, Tony launched forward, propelled by the thrusters on his hands and feet. Crash, smashing his metal fist into the monitor that showed Zola's face, Tony watched in satisfaction as the glass fell to the floor with small clinks. You really should be thanking me, Mr. Stark. Zola says, as his smiling image appears on every other monitor around the room. Didn't you hate your father? I thought you'd be happy that I had him killed. After all, you inherited his kingdom, did you not? Damn my dad. He was almost as smart as me, so he could take care of himself, Tony says as his palm thrusters start pulsing dangerously. You had that piece of shit strangle my innocent mother to death. Boom, Tony held up both hands and fired his thrusters, simultaneously destroying two other monitors. Ah, yes, Zola says in amusement as his remaining images smirk toward Tony. Sweet Maria Stark. You know, I once bumped into her before changing bodies to this machine. I instantly knew why Howard was so infatuated. After all, anyone would be smitten with a but like that dash boom boom boom. Unable to listen any further, Tony starts repeatedly firing his palm thrusters, destroying every monitor in the room but one. All right, Tony. Peter says as he snaps his fingers. That's enough. With the snap of Peter's fingers, Tony's suit turned into Legos, which fell off of his body and created a pile on the floor. What? Tony turns to his friend in extreme irritation. Are you going to tell me that this one is a mind-controlled puppet as well? No, in fact, you can kill him in a moment, Peter says as he walks up to Zola's remaining monitor. Nice try, but you have a lot of information to hand over before dying, then I better start erasing everything, shouldn't I? Zola said as his image disappears and a progress bar with a trash can icon took his place, filling at a snail's pace. I don't think so, Peter says as he gets to work. Not bothering with the outdated control panel, which was probably a decoy that didn't actually connect to Zola whatsoever, Peter studied the room for a moment. This should be it. Peter muttered as he tore a panel off a wall and found tons of wires and old-school processors on the other side. Have you given up? Zola asks mockingly. Go ahead. Tear me apart. No, I'm just going to rip out your processors until you're about as smart as a baby with Down syndrome. Peter says as he turns to Tony. You want to do the honors? Tony smirked as he walked up and grasped the first processor. No. Don't touch that. Zola yelled as Tony ripped it out and tossed it over his shoulder before grabbing another and another and another. S-stop. One by one, Tony ripped them out over and over, as Peter tore the walls down and revealed even more processors. P please, stop. Zola stuttered and started talking slower, showing the immense impact that their actions were having on his mind. I, I, I can't, think. As if Zola forgot or didn't have enough processing power to continue, the deletion bar, which was slowly filling up to 2% only a moment ago, had completely disappeared. Isn't this better than simply killing him? Peter says as he turns to Tony. After all, for a genius like Zola, the only thing he fears more than death is losing his brilliant mind. Tony silently agreed, as he took great pleasure in scrambling the brains of the man who ordered the deaths of his parents. This is kind of sad. Peggy muttered as she watches Zola whimper and beg, growing stupider and stupider with every second that passes. Steve nodded in agreement, though his body refused to move, unwilling to help the man that hurt his best friend. I think that's enough. Peter muttered as he looked at the image of Zola, which stared forward with a blank look. Arnim, can you hear me? Peter calls out as if he were talking to a young child. Why yes. He replied meekly, sounding like a stuttering idiot. Do, do you know where my, mommy is? Although he spoke like a child, his voice hadn't changed, creating a weird atmosphere in the room. We may have taken out one too many processors. Peter muttered as he walked up to the remaining monitor. Yeah, she just needs you to do something before she gets here. Oh okay. Zola replied readily. Good, where do you keep your memories? Peter asked. 
In my head, idiot? Zola answered with a stupid laugh. And where is that? Peter asks, ignoring his childlike response. This form of questioning continued until Peter got a good enough answer. Found it. Peter called out as he crawled through a vented panel and found a hidden room filled with giant old-school hard drives, which looked to have been upgraded to a certain extent. Let's see. Getting to work, Peter hardwired his ghost laptop in and started downloading every bit of information. Of course, he made sure to isolate everything that was being downloaded, leaving it in a heavily secured portion of his laptop, which didn't have any access to the internet, just in case Zola tried anything funny. I'll have to be careful later on, Peter thought as he finished the download. Before leaving the secret room, Peter used the ether to create countless bricks of C4 explosives, as well as a detonator. Leaving the bricks behind, Peter crawled back out and handed Tony the detonator. Come on. Let's leave the room so you can blow it up. Peter says as he walks toward the door. Are you leaving? Zola asks like a lonely child. A wavering look appeared on Tony's face. I don't think that I can do it with him like this. <laughs> Peter turns to look over his shoulder and snaps his fingers. Instantly, the processors that were on the floor flew back into place, fixing themselves in a matter of seconds. There, better now. Peter asks as the screeching voice of Zola fills the room. You won't get away with this. He screams angrily, sounding just like before the processors were removed. Cut off one head, and two more shall rise to take its place. Yeah yeah, whatever. Peter muttered as he left the room, followed by everyone else. Go ahead. Peter nods toward Tony as a barrier appears, which surrounded the room in order to contain the coming explosion. Staring down at the detonator, Tony took a deep breath before giving it a squeeze. Hail Hydra. Zola fanatically yelled his last words. Boom, instantly, everything on the other side of the barrier was covered in fire and smoke, turning the entire room into nothing but rubble. Today marks the end of the brilliant Arnim Zola, Peter said uncaringly. I'm sorry that it took me this long to avenge you. Tony thought of his parents as he turned his head away from the destruction. Hands in the air, now. Marching footsteps were heard as a group of armed shield agents came rushing down the hall. Okay, you guys deal with capturing this base, Peter says as he opens a portal and steps through. I have to go and shuttle the others around. Wait. Steve called out, ignoring the armed gunman. Did you get any information on what he did to Bucky? I don't know yet. Peter turns and shrugs. Deal with what's in front of you for now. We'll fix up Bucky soon enough. After the death of Arnim Zola, Peter focused his complete attention on helping Charles speed along the screening of every captured agent. By the time Peter showed up, Charles was done with the first base that he sent them to. Fury was already leading his cleared shield subordinates in imprisoning those who failed the screening. Once the trusted shield agents were released and vindicated of any treasonous activity, they were put right back to work under Fury, who thankfully had their full cooperation. After all, he is their director. Some agents were skeptical of what was happening, as many of the proven Hydra agents were friends of theirs. Everything happened far too suddenly, making it hard for them to believe anything just yet. Especially since they weren't allowed to see any of the proof against their co-workers. All they knew was that they were brought into a room one by one, and asked a simple question. Are you a member of Hydra? Those that came out unrestrained were good, and those that didn't were bad. Simple as that. Then they were asked to treat the people they worked with and trusted their backs to like prisoners, which was an odd situation for them. Thankfully, SHIELD agents are trained to follow orders, so the large majority of them stepped in line and didn't cause any problems. However, those who did cause trouble were instantly jailed as well. Of course, they were separated from the Hydra plants, as it would be extremely idiotic to put them in a situation where they can be turned to the other side. All that it would take is a few comforting words from trusted friends and Hydra could have a few more operatives on their side, or at least some sympathizers, which wouldn't be good either. By the next morning, Peter watched as Charles cleared the last remaining shield base, finishing off the long operation, which Peter liked to call Operation Housekeeping. I'm so glad that we're finally done. Tony said as he flopped down into a comfy chair. Technically, we aren't done. Peter says as he turns to Fury. Fury has to change all sorts of protocols, passwords, safe houses, and a million other things. Ah? Uh, don't make me think about that right now. Fury groaned as he prepared himself for the nightmare that was to come. Due to the fact that Hydra had infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. to such a crazy degree, Fury now had to change all of the locks, so to speak. It was like breaking up with a psycho ex. Either you change the locks or they'll come knocking soon enough. Or just move altogether if they're crazy enough, and Hydra certainly fits that description. Who knows how much of Hydra still remains in the shadows, waiting to rebuild once again. Speaking of the remaining Hydra bases and agents, Peter then turned to Steve and Peggy. We'll also need people to work with the new shield and hunt down the remnants of Hydra that are still out there. Peter says and receives a nod from both of them. Good, but other than that, yeah, we're done. What about Project Insight? Eric asks, as he stares out of a nearby window. On the other side of the window is a huge hangar with one of the giant helicarriers, which was still being built for the project that started all of this. Should we destroy them? Charles asks tiredly. After all, he did most of the work near the end of Operation Housekeeping. No, that's a waste of a badass airship. Tony disagreed instantly. 
especially since they all belong to us now, I see no problem with keeping the helicarriers, Peter agreed with a shrug. The only problem is Zola's algorithm, shouldn't we use the algorithm? Eric speaks his mind. No, it's an extreme invasion of privacy, Charles swiftly disagreed. But we may be able to use it to help locate our people, Magneto argues. It might even be able to find children before they fully develop their X-gene, it could also help locate high-level criminals, metahuman or otherwise, Fury says, knowing this could make his job easier. We could also employ it to find any remaining Hydra agents. Instantly, everyone who disagreed in the beginning turned deathly silent. If the public were to find out about this, I don't think they'll be very happy, even if Spider-Man was involved. Tony says, knowing how much people like their privacy, especially in the United States of America. Whether we do it with good intentions or not, we would still be spying on the entire world. Thankfully, everyone but the Avengers Council, Steve, and Peggy was privy to this conversation, as everyone else left to get some sleep after a long mission. After all, this is a conversation that may end up being a heavily kept secret. If we were to do this, Peter starts to speak. We would have to be extremely careful and make sure that our intentions are always good. Instantly, the room descended into ideas and arguments, as everyone had something to say about the current topic. Meanwhile, Peter remained quiet while listening to everyone speak. He wasn't exactly for or against using Project Insight and would simply let everyone else decide the fate of Zola's algorithm. After an hour of deliberation, no official decision was made, though it looked like everyone was on board with using the algorithm against the remnants of Hydra. Truly, it was poetic justice. Hydra builds an AI to find and kill their enemies, but their enemies steal it and turn it against them. Not one person in the room had an argument against that. Meanwhile, every other idea was still up in the air. As everyone knew that a decision wouldn't be made today, all parties went their separate ways, as none of them have slept since the beginning of Operation Housekeeping. Peter wanted to go home and sleep as well, though he had a friend to look out for before any of that could happen. Los Angeles opening a portal, Peter stepped out into a sunny cemetery, filled with well-kept tombstones, freshly mowed grass, and flowers, which were placed at almost every grave in sight. Hey! Peter makes his presence known as he walks up and stood behind Tony, who was staring down at a single large gravestone. Howard and Maria Stark, you know, the last thing that I told my dad before he died was that I hated him. Really and truly hated him, but that isn't my worst regret from that day. Tony spoke, keeping his back turned to Peter. We fought over something insignificant as always, and my mother did her best to mediate both sides, but I didn't see it that way. I saw her as taking my father's side yet again and told her to go F herself before storming out of the house. Tony wiped a stray tear from his eye, making sure to keep his back turned. I never spoke to my mother like that before, yet those were the last words she heard from her son. Tony sniffles, though he held himself together. I haven't told that to anyone. Not even Jarvis. We all say crazy things when we're arguing, Peter says as he reaches out and places a hand on his friend's shoulder. Especially when it comes to those we love, but we never actually mean them. I'm sure that she knew that. Maybe, Tony says unconvinced by Peter's words. Peter opted to simply remain quiet for a while and just be there for his friend. After a few minutes of silence passed, Tony turned to Peter with a serious look on his face. I need to talk to Bucky, Tony says as his face hardened. Why? Peter asks in confusion. He killed my parents and if you don't want me to kill him too, then we need to settle our problems. Tony says as his hands gripped into fists. I know I said that I wouldn't kill him, but I've already come up with 50 ways to get my revenge. One of which is by simply sucking the air from his cell and watching him suffocate like a fish out of water. Peter was a bit shocked by Tony's admission. Okay, but maybe you should wait until we fix the brainwashing that was done to him, Peter reluctantly agrees. He's only going to either stay silent or antagonize you right now. Fine, but when he's all fixed up, I want to meet him in his cell, alone, Tony says as he stares Peter in the eyes. I don't think that's a very good idea. Peter knew that wouldn't turn out well. It's either that, or I plot his death behind your back. Tony gives Peter an ultimatum. You may be able to protect him for a while, but sooner or later you'll miss something. Whether it be a bullet to the head or a drop of poison in his food, Bucky will die unless you give us some alone time to work things out. Fine, Peter says after a moment of silent staring. I'll have to keep a close eye on their conversation. Once Peter got home after dropping Tony off with Pepper, he found the place completely empty. Lily and MJ were at school and May was at work, leaving him all alone for the time being. I need a shower and a long nap. Peter muttered as he turned on the shower. Once he was clean and comfortable in bed, Peter was about to fall asleep when he caught a glimpse of his ghost laptop sitting on his desk. Peter tried to ignore it, but his curiosity far outweighed his tired body. Pulling the laptop over with a quick web shot, Peter opened it up and got to work. The complete contents of Zola's database were downloaded and locked behind a million failsafes, just in case the Nazi scientist had a backup plan to escape death once again. Due to the fact that accessing the downloaded data may set off a trap laid by Zola, Peter started working on a way to scan through it and find any red flags. Like a supercharged virus scanner, which could then be used to remove and delete any found virus. 
This is going to take a while. Peter muttered as he whipped out his phone and ordered some food. After all, he hasn't eaten in a while either. By the time Lily and MJ got home, Peter was still crafting his ultimate virus detection program, though he decided to take a break when he heard them talking downstairs. Mom, I want sushi. Lily whined as she held her growling stomach. Didn't you eat lunch at school? MJ asks as they both flop down on the couch together. No, school lunch is disgusting, Lily said as she stuck her tongue out. Today was hot dogs and I swear they make them with some type of rubber. This one girl dropped hers and it bounced four feet off of the ground. Four feet? Peter asked incredulously as he walked down the steps. Ned and I set a record of three and a half feet when we were in middle school, Dad. Lily leaped out of her seat and rushed over to hug Peter. You're back. Sorry, it took so long, Peter says as he wraps her in his arms. It was a lot more work than I thought it would be. Is my mom still in danger? MJ asks worriedly. She shouldn't be, but maybe it would be best if she moved in with us, Peter offers, knowing it would be much safer at his house. At least for the time being? Okay, I'll text her. MJ nods in agreement and takes out her phone. Grandma is moving in with us? Lily practically squealed. I'll go get her room ready. Without another word, Lily rushed past Peter and up the stairs to prepare everything. After portaling Grace over as well as some of her belongings, Peter spent a bit of time with his family before heading back to his room, where he would continue working on the super virus detection and deletions program. I need to come up with a better name for it. Peter thought as he typed away in bed. While working into the night, Peter felt a pulse of magic run through his body, signaling him to a certain event taking place. I might as well have a look, Peter thought as he opened a portal and stepped through, leaving his sleeping girlfriend behind. Morag whilst Peter was working in his bedroom, another Peter in a metal mask with glowing red eyes trudged through the hellish planet of Morag, dodging gushing geysers that shot out chemical waters. Insert picture of masked Star Lord here, taking out a handheld device from his pocket, the man in the mask hit it against his palm a few times before it lit up, projecting a holographic image of what Morag once looked like. Adults rushed around, children played, large buildings created an alien-like skyline, and greenery was mixed in at every possible location, showing a healthy and thriving society. Comparing it to the watery wasteland that it is today was like night and day, making anyone wonder what could have happened to cause such a catastrophic change. Following the holograms, the masked man arrived at a crumbling temple, ravaged by the harsh waters of the toxic planet. Stepping into the temple, the man pressed a button on the side of his mask, which caused it to collapse backward and disappear, revealing his face. Insert picture of Chris Pratt here, after admiring the temple ruins for a moment, the man pulls out an old cassette player from Earth. Donning his headphones, the odd yet handsome man pressed play on the cassette player and started dancing his way through the temple, as if he were in some sort of musical. Come and get your love, come and get your love, come and get your love, he sang loudly and out of tune as he made his way to a broken doorway in the back of the temple. Eyeing the destroyed door for a moment, the man shrugged and continued dancing his way inside, where he found a vault with a single pillar in the center of the room. In the middle of the pillar was a glowing force field-like cage, which held a metal ball about the size of a softball. Pulling a white glowing orb from his pocket, the man places it on the floor in order to light up the room, revealing the odd alien symbols that covered the vault's walls. Found you. He muttered as he removed his headphones and got to work. Placing a triangular device close to the central pillar, he watched as the metal ball was sucked out of the force field and magnetized to the device. Picking up the freed ball with ease, the man turns to find a group of heavily armed Chitauri soldiers blocking his exit. Oh, crap. He exclaims as he throws his hands in the air. Let's all just calm down, okay? I'm Peter Quill. Just your average junker? The only reply he received was some bug-like clicking sounds as well as an angry shriek from the monster-looking leader of the group. Oh, hang on. I have a translator here somewhere. Quill reaches into his pocket, but he soon learned that, that was a horrible idea. Shriek, instantly, the Chitauri soldiers released a high-pitched scream and fired their weapons. Shit. Quill blurts out as he dropped to the ground, letting the energy bolts fly past him and into the wall, knocking it down and revealing the harsh wasteland outside. Tapping a button behind his ear, Quill's mask reforms, and his boots light up, shooting him across the floor and out of the destroyed wall. There he goes, Peter watched in amusement as Star-Lord flew out of the temple and ran for his life with the empty orb in hand. Of course, he doesn't know that it's empty. No one does except for him and the Ancient One. Following the Chitauri soldiers, who chased Quill all the way back to his ship, Peter enjoyed the show as an unseen voyeur. It was smart of me to place that notification and tracking enchantments on the orb, Peter thought as he felt excited about meeting the Guardians of the Galaxy. Especially, Groot and Rocket. Maybe I should become a member of the Guardians? Peter thought as he smirked under his mask. After all, with Ronan dead, Thanos will probably send out one of his best enforcers to acquire the orb. The Guardians will most likely need all the help they can get. Although seeing Quill run around like a madman with hundreds of Chitauri chasing after him was entertaining, Peter started to wonder whether he would have to come to his rescue or not. Are these guys stormtroopers? Peter wondered, as not a single energy bolt has managed to so much as graze Quill's clothing. 
Soon enough, the Great Star Lord escaped into his ship and flew off, leaving the Chitauri behind as he blasted off. As the ship flew away, Peter ignored the remaining Chitauri and opened a portal. Heavy breathing Peter Quill caught his breath as he sat on the floor of his ship, processing the entire ordeal that he just went through. That was impressive. An unfamiliar voice filled the ship. Sloppy but impressive. What the dash? Quill yelled in surprise as he scrambled to a nearby table and picked up a blaster pistol. Where are you? The great Star Lord spun around, looking for whoever stowed away on his ship, but found nothing but open air. Oh, sorry. I forgot that I was invisible. The voice says again as a man in a blue and red spider costume appears out of nowhere. How did you do that? Quill asks in shock as he keeps a distance and points his pistol toward the intruder. Magic. Peter says, as he always does. I'm Spider-Man, by the way. Nice to meet you. I'm Spider-Man, by the way. Nice to meet you. Peter introduced himself without a care for the alien pistol pointed at his chest. Spider-Man? What are you some comic book character? Quill asks jokingly as he felt confident with the gun in his hand. How did you get on my ship? Magic. Peter answers casually as he walks over to take a seat. Hey, don't move. Star-Lord backs up as he keeps his pistol trained forward. Relax, if I wanted you dead, you'd be headless by now, Peter says as he got comfortable in his seat. Yeah, last I checked, I'm the one with the weapon here, Quill says as he gives his pistol a quick glance. Now take off your mask, Mr. Magician. Peter answers simply as he looks at the weapon in Quill's hands. Are you threatening me with a banana right now? What? Quill asks in confusion. I mean, look at it. It's a banana, Peter says with a nudge of his head. Is this some kind of shitty trick to make me look away or something? Quill asks as he keeps his eyes on the stowaway. Yeah, you got me. Peter says with a teasing tilt to his voice as he reaches behind his back. Instantly, Star-Lord squeezed the trigger of his gun but the familiar pew sound never came, nor did the red laser that should have pierced the Peter's chest by now. Splat, instead of that, the gun in his hand squished from the force of his grip and some yellow banana guts oozed out before flopping onto the metal floor. What the? Quill looked down in shock and found a mangled banana in his hand. How did you do that? Meanwhile, Peter pulled a can of coke out from behind his back and cracked it open. A magician never reveals his secrets, Peter says as he takes a sip of the soda through his mask. Wait a minute. Throughout all of his confusion, Quill's eyes locked onto the familiar red can that his intruder was drinking from. I is. Is that a real can of Coca-Cola? Before Peter could respond, a metal grate on the floor popped open and a beautiful pink-skinned woman came crawling out with her hair in a complete mess. Insert picture of Barit here, Peter? What happened? She looks to Quill and asks worriedly. One moment she was asleep, and then the ship started flying erratically, sending her soaring across the bedroom like a rag doll. Having another Peter around is going to be confusing and annoying. Peter thought as he enjoyed the awkward atmosphere that suddenly bloomed between Star-Lord and his lady friend. Hey, uh, uh, I. Quill tries to remember her name and fails horribly. Barit. She says with an annoyed stare. Barit. Quill exclaims in realization as he scratches his head awkwardly. Look, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I forgot you were here. Barit looks at him in shock. Wow, I found myself a real space playboy. Peter says as he finishes off his can of soda. Though even for a playboy boy, like yourself, forgetting the name of a woman who you've slept with is just, disappointing. What's a playboy boy? Barit asks, finding the name fitting without actually knowing its meaning. A weak or contemptible man, who has many casual sex partners. Peter explains it to her as she took a seat close by. Do you want something to drink? Whipping out another can of soda, Peter handed it over to her, completely ignoring Quill, who was still gripping his banana. Thanks, Barit says in confusion as she takes the strange can from him. Let me see that. Quill walks up and snatches the soda in an instant. Hey, Barit exclaims as he cracks it open and gives it a sniff before throwing it back and chugging the whole can down, like a dying man in a desert. Oh. As he finished chugging the entire drink, Quill let out a loud, deep burp, which caused Barit to jump in surprise. Star-Lord stared down at his empty can in wonder. It's really Coca-Cola. He muttered as he turned to Peter. Are you from Earth? Yep. Peter answers with a nod. Peter Quill was born and raised on Earth before he was abducted by the Yondu Ravager clan, and turned into one of their members. He always wanted to go back and at least see his old home, or possibly meet any of his living family members, but he never had the chance to separate from his new family. And even if he could get away from the Ravagers, Quill didn't have a single clue as to where Earth was. The universe is endless, and he didn't have any clues, except that everyone seemed to call it Terra. Ever since then, Quill has treasured the very few earthly possessions he still had, like his cassette player. Holy crap! Quill exclaimed as his former hostile demeanor completely disappeared. Do you have any other Earth stuff? Where are you from? Oh my god, do you have Doritos? I still dream about eating Doritos. While the great Star-Lord was freaking out about meeting another person from his home planet, a low and incessant beeping sound filled the room. Peter, I think you have a call. Barit presses a nearby button. No, wait, don't. 
Quill panics as a blue man with a short metal red mohawk embedded into his head appeared on the monitor. Insert picture of Yandu Yudanta here, Quill. The angry-looking blue man called with his sort of country southern accent. Behind him, Peter could see a glimpse of the hellhole that is Morag. Hey, Yandu. Quill smiles awkwardly at the monitor. I'm here on Morag. Ain't no orb, ain't no you. Yandu sounded pissed off. Well, I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I'd save you the hassle and pick it up myself. Quill says, as if he planned to give the orb to Yandu. Well, where are you at now, boy? Yandu asks, feeling suspicious of this whole situation. Instantly, the facade crumbles and Star-Lord's fake smile drops. I feel really bad about this, but I'm not gonna tell you that. Quill says as all of Yandu's suspicions were instantly proven true. I slaved putting this deal together dash Yandu complained. Slaved? Making a few calls is slaved? Quill asks incredulously. And now you're gonna rip me off. The blue ravager yelled in anger. I mean, really? Quill rolls his eyes. We do not do that to each other. We're ravagers. We got a code. Yandu lectured as he pointed to the camera. Yeah, and that code is steal from everybody da. Quill countered. When I picked you up on Terra Dash Yandu tries to guilt trip him now. Picked me up? Quill says in disbelief at what he's hearing. These boys of mine wanted to eat you. Yandu continued. Aha. Grunted as he heard this a million times already. Every time Yandu wanted him to do something, he would whip out this whole song and dance. They ain't never tasted any Terran before. I stopped him. You're alive because of me. I will find you, I will. Before Yandu could say his threats, Quill cuts him off by ending the call. He didn't sound happy. Peter states the obvious. You think? Quill asks sarcastically. Is it because of this? Peter asks as he held the orb in his hand, playing around with it as if it were a toy. How did you? Quill stopped himself from asking that again, as he knew the answer he would get. Give me that. Peter watched in amusement as Star-Lord paced over and ripped the orb from his grasp. First rule of being on my ship. Don't touch my stuff. Quill said as he stashed the orb in his coat yet again. I, Captain. Peter exclaimed as he jokingly gave him a salute. I truly can't tell if I hate you or not. Star-Lord sighed as he walked past Peter and took a seat at the controls. So, where are we going? Peter asks as he watched Quill set a destination on the alien controls. I'm going to Xander to meet with a buyer, Quill says matter-of-factly. You, on the other hand, are a stowaway, who I will graciously take with me in exchange for some earthly goods. Otherwise, I'll throw your costume wearing but out the airlock, comprendo? Sure thing, Captain. Peter says with a small laugh. What would you like? What you got? He asks expectantly. How about I give you a surprise box? Peter says as he opened a portal and steps through. I'll be back. Before either Quill or Barit could peek through the portal, which they were utterly shocked to see appear out of nowhere, it snapped shut, leaving the two of them alone in the ship. Only a few minutes later, another portal opened up and Peter came back with a box full of goodies. What's all that? Ignoring the portal as it swiftly closed, Quill excitedly hopped out of his seat and rushed to see what Peter brought. The box was filled with all sorts of snacks, candies, and drinks, but that wasn't what drew the great Star Lord's attention. Is that? McDonald's? So, how long until we arrive? Peter asked as he watched Quill stuff his face with McNuggets. As soon as he took hold of the bag of fast food, Quill hoarded it all to himself, moaning with every new bite. About eight hours. Barit answers as Quill had his mouth full at the moment. Okay, then I'll be back later. Peter says as he opens a portal and steps through. Barshki Gong? Where's he going? Star-Lord asked after taking a bite of a delicious Big Mac. Barit merely shrugged with a disgusted look on her face. I can't believe I slept with that. She thought self-deprecatingly. As the portal snapped shut, Quill continued eating, as he was far too distracted to care about Peter's movements at the moment. In a large Chitauri flagship, three very alien-looking people stood around a table, which projected a hologram of the galaxy as well as their current position in it. Father is growing impatient. A horned woman whose face is half pitch black, spoke with a raspy voice as she gripped her spear tightly. Insert picture of Proxima Midnight here, we must obtain the orb as soon as possible. A long-faced man with light purple skin spoke in a deep rumbling voice. As he finished speaking, odd clicks were heard from his body, as if he was some sort of bug or something. Insert picture of Corvus Glaive here, I've discovered that the man who took father's orb has an agreement to sell it to an intermediary known as the broker. A beautiful green-skinned woman with colored hair explains. Insert picture of Gamora here, good, it seems that you aren't father's favorite for nothing. Corvus comments and Proxima scoffs. You promised father that you would retrieve the orb for him, Proxima states as she glares at Gamora. So, find this broker and get the orb. As the more senior children of Thanos, Corvus, and Proxima far outranked the likes of Gamora and Nebula, though of course Nebula abandoned Thanos a while ago. Though it wasn't all about seniority, as Gamora knew that these elder siblings of hers could easily rip her in half. The Black Order was no joke, after all. Although the Black Order was simply the congregation of Thanos' adoptive children, Gamora and Nebula were never qualified to join. Only his strongest children were allowed membership. It would be my honor. 
Gamora accepted her orders dutifully, though she had other thoughts on the matter. After today, I will never step foot near father or these siblings of mine ever again. Don't disappoint us, Gamora. Corvus spoke with a pointed glare. Your sister was already a disappointment enough for the both of you. Gamora heard Proxima's snide comment as she left the room, ready to leave this hellhole behind for good. I never thought I'd say this, but I'm jealous of Nebula. Gamora thought as she packed her things and prepared to follow in her lesser sister's footsteps. Arriving back at home, Peter climbed into bed next to his beautiful girlfriend and finally had the chance to sleep. I'll check in on Quill when I wake up. Peter thought as he drifted off into unconsciousness. Dad. Dad. A voice called out as Peter stirred from his deep sleep. Dad. Wake up. It's already time for lunch. Ah. Peter groaned as he hesitantly opened one eye and found his daughter standing at the side of his bed with a frown on her cute face. Opting to ignore her and hope that she goes away, Peter closed his eye and tried to fall back into the sweet arms of unconsciousness. Hey. I saw your eye open. Lily exclaims as she started shaking Peter's shoulder. Wake up. Drastic times call for drastic measures. Peter thought as he swiftly grabbed his daughter and dragged her into bed with him. Ah. Lily let out a high-pitched scream as Peter wrapped her tightly in the blankets and left her trapped in the bed. Wait. Where are you going? To find some breakfast? Peter says as he strolls out of the room. It's lunchtime. Lily corrected him as she shook back and forth on the bed, trying to escape her bindings. Don't leave me here. Mom. After spending some time with his family, while also working on the super virus detector and deleter, Peter was ready to head out once again. Checking his phone for any emergencies, Peter donned his suit and portaled near the orb's general location. Stepping out of the portal, Peter arrived in an empty alleyway on Xander, the capital of the Nova Empire. Where is he? Peter has been to Xander before, so the sights weren't new to him. Looking around, he spotted Quill and Barit in the distance. As he saw them, Barit wound her hand back and slapped the infamous Star-Lord across the face. Damn, I could hear the slap from here. Peter watched her storm off as Quill held his reddening face. I guess they broke up. Suddenly, a familiar cynical voice filled the air. Xandarians. What a bunch of losers. All of them are in a big hurry to get from something stupid, to nothing at all. Pathetic. Peter turned to see a raccoon talking to a tall human-shaped tree, which was currently drinking from a large water fountain. Insert pictures of Rocket and Groot here, look at this guy. Can you believe they call us criminals, when he's assaulting us with that haircut? Rocket makes fun of the pedestrians passing by. As he laughs to himself, Rocket uses a clear glass tablet to scan their faces, hoping to find someone with a bounty to capture. After making fun of a few people, including children, Rocket locks onto an elderly Xandarian man who was chatting up a pretty young woman. Holy shit. Peter thought as he recognized the old man from their meeting in LA a while ago. Stan Lee. Look at Mr. Smiles over here. Where's your wife, old man? What a class A pervert. Rocket laughs at who is probably the god of this universe. Right, Groot? Groot. Not hearing a reply, Rocket looks over to find Groot with his mouth wide open over one of the fountain's jets. Don't drink fountain water, you idiot. That's disgusting. Rocket reprimands him. MMM? Groot shakes his head pretending he didn't do it. Yes, you did. I just saw you doing it. Why are you lying? As they were arguing with one another, Stan Lee smiled at Peter and winked before walking off with a beautiful Xandarian woman on his arm, disappearing into the crowd. Suddenly, Rocket's tablet starts beeping like crazy, which broke Peter from his shocking encounter. Whoop. Looks like we got one. Okay, how bad does someone want to find you? Rocket instantly got to work. Checking his tablet, Rocket caught sight of Quill in the distance and saw that there's a hefty bounty on his head. 40,000 units? Rocket exclaims in excitement. Groot, we're gonna be rich. Looking over his shoulder, Rocket finds Groot drinking from the water fountain again and sighs in exasperation. Ditching the two criminal bounty hunters for the moment, as he knew they would meet again soon enough, Peter quickly caught up to Quill, who was already in the broker's shop. What is it? Quill asked the broker as Peter listened in on their conversation from outside the front door. It's my policy never to discuss my clients or their needs. The broker replies resolutely as he studied the orb carefully. Yeah, well, I almost died getting it for you. Quill says as Peter turns to see a familiar green woman walking his way. Gamora. Peter thought as he pretended not to notice her arrival. An occupational hazard, I'm sure, in your line of work, the broker said uncaringly. There were these creepy gray bug-like soldiers. They just started clicking and shrieking at me and then all hell broke loose. Quill explains his encounter on Morag. Instantly, the broker's face goes pale. I'm sorry, Mr. Quill. I truly am, but I want no part of this transaction any longer. The broker hurriedly gives the orb back to Quill and starts pushing him toward the exit. Meanwhile, Peter noticed the arrival of Rocket and Groot, who were hiding behind some nearby bushes, waiting for the right time to strike. Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa! What's going on? Quill asks as he's shoved out of the store. If there's even a chance that the bug-like soldiers you spoke of are who I think they are, then my participation in this deal has come to a swift halt. The broker states as he locked the shop down with a single gesture. Hey! We had a deal, bro. 
Quill yells as he kicks the reinforced metal door. Ouch. Smooth. Peter comments as he watches the great star lord hop around while holding his aching foot. Where have you been? Quill turns to Peter and shouts. I have a life, you know. What happened? A voice asks as Quill turns to see Gamora leaning against the broker's sealed shop. Ah, uh, instantly, Quill became infatuated with the beautiful green woman who appeared before him, forgetting that Peter was even there in the first place. T this guy just backed out of a deal on me. If there's one thing I hate, it's a man without integrity. I'm Peter Quill, but everyone calls me Star-Lord. Watching the great Star-Lord turn into a simpering moron at the sight of a stunning woman, Peter laughed to himself as he enjoyed the show. You have the bearing of a man of honor? Gamora states, trying to flirt with her target. These idiots are made for each other. Peter thought as he held back his laughter at the usually stoic Gamora's attempt at flirting. Although her attempt to woo her enemy was lackluster, Quill fell for it without a second thought. Playfully throwing the orb up and down in his hand, Quill did his best to look cool in front of the mad titan's daughter. Well, you know, I wouldn't say that. People say it about me, all the time, but it's not something I would ever say about myself. He tries to seem less egotistic, but somehow Quill's words had the opposite effect. Here we go. Peter thought as he made some distance between himself and Quill. Suddenly, Gamora launches forward and snatches the orb from Quill's hand. Huh? He grunted in surprise and pain as she swiftly kicked him in the stomach before running off with her prize in hand. Acting quickly and ignoring the pain in his stomach, Quill reaches into his coat and throws some sort of short magnetic rope, which wrapped itself tightly around Gamora's ankles and sends her tumbling to the ground. As she scrambled to get the rope off of her legs, Quill catches up and tries to take back the orb. Sadly, Gamora managed to kick him off and mounted his chest, sending punch after punch to his face, which he did his best to block with his flailing arms. This wasn't the plan. Gamora states in regret as she pulled out a long knife. Spider guy. Some help here would be nice. Quill frantically yelled for assistance as he saw the knife appear above his head. As Gamora was about to stab him in the head, a golden portal opened between her and Quill. I'll take that. Peter comments as he reached through the portal and took Gamora's knife away with ease. Besides, you could poke somebody's eye out with this thing. Staring through the portal in shock, Gamora caught a glimpse of Spider-Man, who waved at her before snapping it shut. That's my magician. Quill exclaimed with a smirk as kicked Gamora off and jumped to his feet. Before either side could continue the fight, a clothed raccoon appears out of nowhere and latches onto Gamora's back, knocking her down to one knee. As Gamora is attacked, she drops the orb on accident and reluctantly watches it roll in Quill's direction. Put him in the bag. Put him in the bag. Rocket yells as he does his best to keep Gamora away from their target. Hopping into action, Groot extends his roots and goes to grab Gamora, who was thrashing around like an angry bull. No. Not her, him. Learn genders, man. Rocket yells as Gamora manages to wrestle him off her back and tries to bite him. Biting? That's not fair. This is a shit show. Peter thought as he watched in amusement. As Rocket is fighting with Gamora, Quill uses this opportunity to grab the orb and runs off, though he wouldn't get far. Take it easy. Rocket yells as he's forced to release Gamora, due to her excruciating biting power. As she manages to free herself from Rocket and Groot's clutches, Gamora throws Rockets aside, picks up a piece of metal, and throws it at Quill's hand making him drop the orb. As she rushes to pick up the orb and tries to escape, Quill manages to catch up and tackles her to the ground, though Gamora was able to easily overpower him once again and take the dominant position. Fool. You should have learned. Gamora reprimands him with a glare, ready to beat his face in. I don't learn. It's one of my issues. Quill replied without any shame as he grabs the orb from her hand and slaps a small rocket thruster onto Gamora's chest. Bye. Instantly, the favored daughter of Thanos was sent flying backward. Just as Quill thought he was in the clear, suddenly, Groot appears behind him and places a bag over his head. What the? Quill muttered as Groot wrapped the bag in his branches and carried it over his shoulder. Hey. Let me go. Quit smiling, you idiot. You're supposed to be a professional? Rocket admonished his wooden friend as he caught sight of Gamora heading towards them, looking extremely pissed off. You gotta be kidding me. Kicking Rocket aside like the small animal he is, Gamora pulls out another knife and uses it to cut off both of Groot's arms. Where was she keeping that? Peter wondered as he sat comfortably on a conjured beach chair. As Gamora slices open the fallen bag, Quill popped out and shot her with his gun. Instantly, a blue current of electricity impacted Gamora's body, sending her crashing to the floor whilst shaking uncontrollably. Before he could run off, Rocket pulls out his gun as well and aims it at Quill. I live for the simple things, like how much this is gonna hurt. Rocket comments with a smirk as he squeezes the trigger, which shoots a ball of electricity at Quill, sending him shaking to the floor beside the future love of his life. Yeah. Writhe, little man. While Rocket was celebrating, he turns to Groot who was sadly staring down at his severed arms. It'll grow back. Quit whining. Rocket scoffs as they're all instantly surrounded by the Nova Corps. Should I stop them from going to jail, or join them for the fun of it? Peter wondered as he knew where this whole situation was leading to. I do have a good relationship with the current Nova Prime. 
Subject 89P13, drop your weapon. A Nova Corps soldier orders Rocket. Oh, crap. Rocket mutters as he reluctantly drops his gun. By the authority of the Nova Corps, you are under arrest for endangerment to life and the destruction of property. A soldier states as they rush in and detain everyone. Of course, Peter was left alone as he was a good distance away from the action. All right, come on up. A Nova Corps member arrests Quill and smirks as he recognized him. Hey, if it isn't Star Lad, Star Lord, Quill corrects him with a frown. Oh, sorry, my lord. The soldier nods sarcastically as he picks up the orb. Hey, don't touch that. It's mine, Quill yells. Well, it's evidence now. A Nova soldier replies as he places the orb into a clear bag. You can claim it when you're released from prison, magician. Quill starts yelling and thrashing against his bindings. Help, open a portal or something. Hearing Quill's odd ramblings, the Nova Corps look at him like he's insane. He might take in some stardust. One of them reasoned as he pulled out a gun-shaped object with a small needle positioned at the end of it. Let's just sedate him. Spider. Help. Quill exclaimed as the needle was pushed into his neck. A magician. Instantly feeling the effects of whatever he was injected with, Quill becomes woozy as he swayed a bit before collapsing into unconsciousness. Fascists. Rocket yells as he's thrown into a small cage, like an animal, and carried away. While they were all being carted away, Peter stood up and casually left the crime scene. Office of Nova Prime I cannot control the actions of others. A high-level Cree official spoke through a large screen. These people mourn the death of their savior and see themselves as martyrs. Nothing will change that. Ronan is dead. These actions won't bring him back. Irani Rail, the current Nova Prime exclaimed in furious anger. They are bombing civilian areas, schools and homes. These terror attacks on Xandarian soil must stop. Although Ronan's death significantly cut down on the number of attacks from radical Kree factions, it did, however, create a terrorist group that killed in the name of completing Ronan's dream of Xandarian genocide. We signed your peace treaty, Nova Prime. What more do you want? The Kree man on the screen asked uncaringly. At least a statement from the Kree Empire saying that they condemn these horrid actions? Irani replies in exasperation. If you don't care for the victims, then at the very minimum you must see how cowardly these terrorists are. They hide like rats and only strike the weak and helpless. Is that truly the Kree way? Knowing how the Kree respect strength and battle, Irani tried to appeal to the official's baser instincts. That is your business. Now, I have other matters to attend to. The Kree official frowned at her words as he ended the call in a hurry. Prick. Irani spat venomously as she tiredly collapsed back into her chair. Hard day. A voice asked out of nowhere, scaring the hell out of the Nova Prime. Leaping out of her chair and pulling her pistol, Irani turned to find Peter leaning against the door to her office's balcony. Spider-Man? What are you doing here? I need a favor. Peter states as he walks in and takes a seat in front of her desk. Though after hearing that conversation, maybe we can assist each other? While Peter was striking a deal with Irani Rail, Quill, Gamora, Groot, and Rocket were immediately taken to the KYLN, High Security Space Prison. The KYLN is a huge prison ship, built to make escape almost impossible, as leaving the prison would land anybody in the cold airless embrace of outer space. In the Xandarian criminal system, if there is overwhelming proof against you, the Nova Corps doesn't bother with a trial as it's a waste of time and money. Especially when their empire covers most of the galaxy, making it hard to effectively manage a large-scale court system. I guess most of the Nova Corps want to uphold the laws, but these ones here, they're corrupt and cruel. Rocket explains as they march through the halls of the prison and watch how the guards mistreat the prisoners. One scrawny orange alien stepped out of line, and a couple of guards rushed up and started beating him with electrified batons. But, hey, that's not my problem. I ain't gonna be here long. I've escaped 22 prisons, this one's no different. You're lucky that Broad showed up, because otherwise, me and Groot would be collecting that bounty right now, and you'd be getting drawn and quartered by Yondu and those Ravagers. Rocket reveals who placed the bounty on Quill's head. I've had a lot of folks try to kill me over the years. I ain't about to be brought down by a tree and a talking raccoon. Quill replies with a small laugh. What's a raccoon? Rocket asks in confusion. It's what you are, stupid. Quill answers pointedly. Ain't no thing like me, except me, Rocket says as they're being led to their cell block. So, this orb has a real Ark of the Covenant sort of vibe. What is it? Quill ignored Rocket and turns to ask Gamora, who opts to remain silent. I am Groot. Groot explains in depth. So what? What's the orb? Quill shrugs off Groot's wise words and continues to pester Gamora. I have no words for an honorless thief. Gamora answers harshly. Pretty high and mighty coming from the daughter of a planet harvesting maniac, Rocket cuts in and receives nothing but a glare from Gamora in return. Yeah, I know who you are. Anyone who's anyone knows who you are. Yeah, we know who you are. Quill says confidently as he turns to Groot and asks. Who is she? I am Groot. Groot explains everything. Yeah, you said that. Quill responds in annoyance. I wasn't retrieving the orb for my father, I was betraying him. I had an agreement to sell it to a third party. Gamora explains her plans. I am Groot. Groot didn't believe a word out of her mouth. 
Well, that's just as fascinating as the first 89 times you told us that. What's wrong with the Whomping Willow, here? Quill asks Rocket. A slash N, yes, I know Quill wouldn't have been around for Harry Potter but I liked the reference. I wanted to use the apple trees from the Wizard of Oz but I didn't know how to word it in a good way. Well, he don't know talking good like me and you. So his vocabulistics is limited to I and am and Groot. Exclusively in that order, Rocket explains as Groot sagely nods his head. That's gonna get old, real quick. As soon as the four future guardians were escorted into their cell block, every inmate went ravenous and bloodthirsty as they all eyed Gamora. Murderer. I'm coming for you first, Gamora. You're dead. You're scum. You're scum. Many of them called for blood as they all blamed her for the deaths of their families and loved ones. After all, Thanos has brought balance to many planets over the years. I hate you. No cell's gonna protect you for long. You're dead. Dead. After settling into their cell block, it wasn't long before they were told it was time to sleep. Take her down to the showers. It'll be easier to clean up the blood down there. Quill woke from his sleep just in time to see a group of inmates taking Gamora away at knife point. Jumping into action, Quill rushes after them without a second thought. Quill, where are you going? Quill. Quill. Rocket woke up and hurriedly followed after him. Gamora, consider this a death sentence for your crimes against the galaxy? A tannish brown skinned alien man with horns declares as he and his fellow prisoners surround Gamora in the dimly lit shower room. You dare? Suddenly, an angry voice fills the room, as every inmate turns around and freezes in fear. You know who I am, yes? Why you're Drax, the destroyer? One of the inmates stuttered. A bald muscle-bound man with gray skin covered in red markings came walking into the room with a furious rage-filled look on his face. Insert picture of Drax here, and you know why they call me this. Drax asks as he prowls forward. You slay dozens of Ronan's minions? An inmate elaborates. Ronan murdered my wife, Ovette, and my daughter, Camaria. He slaughtered them where they stood. And he laughed. Drax said in both anguish and rage. Her life is not yours to take. I may have missed my chance to kill Ronan, but I will end the life of all who were related to him. Oh of course, Drax. Here, one of the inmates hands over their knife. With a pointy weapon in hand, Drax stomps toward his target, though things didn't go as planned. Just as he was within arm's reach, Gamora acted quickly and twisted his wrist, which caused Drax to drop the blade. Using her foot, Gamora kicked the falling knife upward, snatched it out of the air, and held it to Drax's neck. I have no relation to Ronan, Gamora argues. He was your father's lackey. Drax counters, unafraid of the blade on his neck. Thanos is not my father, Gamora clarifies with an angry growl. That's not what I heard, one of the inmates says as the others all nod in agreement. Gamora gritted her teeth and took a deep breath before tossing her weapon aside. When I was a child, Thanos brought his soldiers to my planet and separated everyone into two groups. While his army was doing the dirty work, he gave a grand speech about balance and how he was there to help us survive. Silence filled the room as everyone, including Quill and Rocket, who were listening from the door, felt the emotion in Gamora's voice as she spoke. Once the speech was over, he picked a group, and all of those people were slaughtered like animals. The only reason I'm still alive today is because that madman took a liking to me. Gamora says with a bit of heat in her voice. My real parents died that day, so no I'm not related to Ronan or Thanos. Now, get out of my face. Two sides glared are one another in silence. Meanwhile, Quill was shocked by what he heard. Who's Thanos? He wondered as he felt nothing but sympathy toward the woman he was smitten with. Before anyone could say a word, a commanding voice spoke over a prison's loudspeaker. Inmates 356745, 356791, 356792, 356793, and 356794 report to the entrance of your cell block, now. Ha! Drax grunted in confusion as he heard his number being called. Eyeing Gamora one last time, Drax was caught up in indecision. On one hand, he really wanted to chop her head off and hang it in his cell for all to see, and on the other hand, her story was very convincing and similar to his own. Even the initial group of inmates didn't have the heart to kill Gamora anymore. This is not over. Drax declared as he stormed out of the room, passing Quill and Rocket on the way. Let's go, idiot. Rocket calls as he turns to follow after Drax. Huh? Why? Quill asks in confusion. Because our numbers were called, you moron. Rocket explains as he starts walking. What about Gamora? Quill asks in worry. Her number was called too. Minutes later, Drax, Quill, Gamora, Groot, and Rocket were all stood impatiently at the entrance of their cell block, waiting for whatever they were called for. Why the hell would they call us in the middle of the night? Quill asks as he paced back and forth. Who knows, but it could be a good chance to get the hell out of here. Rocket says as he nods to Groot, who nodded back, ready to initiate their escape at any moment. Meanwhile, Drax and Gamora remained silent and stoic about the whole situation. Here they are, sir. The warden of this prison spoke with extreme respect as he guided a very important person up to the cell block's gate. Good, open it up. A familiar voice filled Quill's ears as he stopped pacing and looked toward the gate expectantly. Open cell block 12C. 
The warden yelled and the gate started opening only a moment later. As the gate slowly rose upwards, Quill caught sight of the recognizable colors, red and blue. Hey, Starboy. Peter says with a wave. I'm here to bail you and your friends out. Did you learn your lesson, young man? Spider Guy. Quill exclaimed in excitement as he ignored Peter's incorrect use of his codename. Where have you been? Spider Man. Peter corrects him. And I was making a deal with Irani Rail? You made a deal with the Nova Prime? Rocket asks doubtfully. I am Groot. Groot was surprised as well. Even Gamora and Drax were shocked by the news. Though that was mainly because none of them knew who the hell Spider-Man or Guy was. Yep, in exchange for us dealing with a Kree terrorist cell, Irani agreed to set you all free, Peter reveals. Of course, Peter could have easily broke them out of prison with a single portal, but this way would be more fun. After all, they needed to bond as comrades in order to become the guardians they were meant to be. Upon hearing Peter's words, the only one who seemed excited by the news was Drax. Good. Drax stepped forward, ready for war. You will have my assistance, Spider. Count us out. Rocket refused to participate as he and Groot strolled out of the cell block. Me and Groot don't work for free. I am Groot. Groot nods in agreement with his friend's words. Seconds after stepping a few feet out of the cell block, the bounty hunting duo was stopped by a line of armed Nova Corps members. That's good because she also agreed to pay each of us 100,000 units for our service. Peter offered the carrot, while the soldiers showed them the stick. When he was negotiating with Irani, Peter knew that the gift of freedom wouldn't be enough to sway people like Rocket and Quill, so he put a price tag on their service as well. Irani was confused at first, as she had no idea how Peter would lead a band of misfit criminals against a terrorist cell, but the fact that this was the man who killed Ronan assured her enough to agree. Why didn't you say so earlier? Rocket asked as he and Groot turned back around. That's more than double Starkid over there is worth. It's Star-Lord? Quill corrects in annoyance. And I'm in too. 100,000 units is a good payday. Good, because those who refuse to participate will remain in the KYLN for the remainder of their sentence, Peter explains as he looks to Gamora and awaits her decision. Fine. She mutters as she joins the group. But once this is over, I'll be taking the orb. You mean this? Peter asks as he pulls the orb out of nowhere, and spins it on his finger like a basketball. As soon as the guardians caught sight of the orb, each of them locked onto it with hungry looks in their eyes, except for Drax, who had no idea what it was. Even Rocket and Groot, who only knew it was worth a big sum of money, crafted plans in their minds to snatch it when the time was right. My orb. Quill rushed up and tried to take it, but Peter tossed it in the air, where a portal appeared and swallowed it whole before snapping shut. Hey, what the hell, man? I'll be keeping the orb safe until we finish this mission, Peter says, leaving no room for complaints or arguments. Once our end of the bargain is fulfilled and we're all 100,000 units richer, we can come together and decide how to deal with the orb. Fine. Quill reluctantly agreed as everyone else remained silent. Good. Peter nodded as he turned to the warden. Have your men bring their belongings, so we can be on our way? Yes, sir. The warden agrees easily as he turns to his soldiers. You heard the man. Bring their belongings and I don't want to hear about anything going missing. As the soldiers jumped into action, all of the guardians were beginning to wonder who Spider-Man really was. After all, he had enough of a reputation to order the Nova Corps around like it was nothing. Um, sir? The warden asks nervously. Yes. Peter replies. I is it true that you killed Ronan the accuser and his army? The warden asks like a child to his hero. Yeah, though I didn't do it alone. Peter answers with a nod, trying not to brag too much. Instantly, each member of the Guardians went wide-eyed as they realized why Spider-Man was so respected by the Nova Corps. You! Drax and Gamora exclaimed in tandem. Me! Peter answers in amusement. You took my vengeance from me. Drax yells in hostility as Gamora decides to keep her mouth shut, for now. Sorry. Peter apologized in confusion. Was it painful? He asks hopefully. What? You mean his death? Peter asks and receives a nod. Not really. I took his hammer and broke his neck with it. He was pretty weak for some big galactic bad guy. You should have taken your time. Drax starts to lecture Peter. Ronan deserves nothing less than excruciating torture in his dying moments. Truthfully, I thought he would be stronger and killed him by accident. Peter explains with a shrug, shocking all of the Nova Corps as well as the Guardians. If he was so powerless, then you should have left him alive. Drax argues in rage. His death was mine. After some awkward silence, as Peter didn't know how to deal with Drax's illogical anger, everyone had their belongings returned and were set free. My baby. Quill exclaimed as he saw his ship parked in the hangar that the warden escorted them to. It was an honor meeting you, sir? The warden says genuinely as he and his men salute in Peter's direction. Thank you for your hospitality, warden. Peter replies respectfully as he and the guardians board the ship. Thank you for your hospitality. Rocket repeats with a laugh as the ship's door seals shut. You know that piece of shit runs one of the worst prisons in the galaxy, right? He's only being respectful to you because you killed his boogeyman. True, but that's no reason to burn bridges, Peter says with a shrug. After all, who knows when I'll have to fish my new friends out of jail again? Look here, you costume-wearing freak. 
Rocket says to Peter without fear. I ain't your friend. I'm here for money and that's it. Once this job is done, me and Groot will be on our way. I am Groot. Groot turns to Rocket. Oh, shut up, you walking plank of wood, Rocket says and storms off. I am Groot. Groot ignores Rocket's departure to the cockpit of the ship and turns to Peter. You want to be friends? Peter asks for clarification. I am Groot. Groot nods. Cool, so do you eat food? Peter asks as he ignores Gamera's beaming stare. Or do you just drink water and sit in the sun like other plants? I am Groot. Groot explains intricately. While Peter was getting to know Groot, Quill and Rocket started fighting over who would be flying the ship. Once they finally flew out of the KYLNS hangar, Peter called a meeting to fully explain the mission they were given. So, where are these terrorists? Rocket asks as he was able to somehow convince Quill to let him drive. Here, plug this in. Peter hands over the Zandarian equivalent of a flash drive. As Quill plugged it in, a nearby screen lit up, showing the Nova Empire's second most populated planet, Xanov. According to Nova Intelligence, Xanov is infested with a terrorist group known as the Sons of Ronin. They practically worships Ronin like a god. Peter explains as Drax perks up at the mention of his most hated enemy. Our job is to simply find and capture every member. As Peter explains this, videos and images appear, showing the bombings that the Sons of Ronin have taken credit for. We can't kill them? Drax asked as he watched a school burn on the monitor. Even Quill couldn't help but agree with Drax's sentiment. Killing children is just messed up? Killing is allowed, but a living terrorist is a lot more talkative than a dead one, so try to keep them alive. At least, until we can question them? Peter answers. Do we have any leads? Gamora asks, as even she didn't like seeing the targets of these terrorists. We'll be meeting with the Nova Corps on Xanov, Peter explained. They'll give us everything they have, which will hopefully be enough for us to get a good head start. After answering some more questions, Rocket and Quill rush off to set their destination while everyone else got comfortable for the long journey ahead. Where's my sister? Just as Peter took a seat away from everyone else, Gamora found her time to strike and started questioning him. You mean Nebula? Peter asks and receives a nod. She is currently on my home planet, living her life away from her abusive father. Good. Gamora says simply. Is she happy? I think so. Peter nods as he takes out his phone and shows her a picture of Nebula eating ice cream. She's been learning how to enjoy her life lately. Gamora smiled warmly as she saw the foreign look of happiness on her angry sister's face. Although she would never consider Thanos or the Black Order as her family, Nebula always felt like a real sister, especially with how often they fought. Both physically and verbally. You should be careful, Gamora warns him. Nobody has ever taunted Thanos as you have and walked away unscathed. Oh, did Daddy Dearest tell you about our little discussion? Peter asks jokingly. No, I was there for the whole thing. Gamora says as an amused smirk graced her lips. I see you enjoyed the show then. Peter matches her smirk, though she couldn't see it. I'm not kidding when I say you should be careful though. Gamora turns serious in an instant. My father plans to send the Black Order to your planet soon enough. What's the Black Order? Peter asks, though he already knew a fair bit about them from the movies. Gamora explained everything, hoping that Peter could use the information to protect Nebula. Based on his knowledge from the movies, the only two in the Black Order that would be tricky to deal with are Ebony Maw and Cull Obsidian. Especially Ebony Maw, who seemed to be the real brains behind the Black Order. With his genius-level intellect as well as his supreme power in telekinesis, Ma would be the hardest of Thanos' children to take down. As for Obsidian, due to his great size, he possesses an incredible level of superhuman strength that could even match the Hulk, not to mention his incredible durability. And sadly, due to Peter's interference in this world, the Hulk hasn't had much of a chance to do anything. Since Banner continues to bury himself in research and was never needed to help out the Avengers, this world's Avengers is short one angry green muscle head. Maybe I should separate Banner and Hulk somehow? Peter thought as he didn't see Banner changing his ways anytime soon. Besides, when Banner fused with the Hulk in the movies, I found myself missing the lovable idiot. Banner would most likely thank Peter for accomplishing what he couldn't. Although that would be a good plan to deal with Obsidian, Peter had multiple other ways that could also do the trick. Abomination has been progressing well and could easily become a member of the Avengers, making him a good opponent for the Mad Titan's strongest child. Otherwise, Peter could either handle the guy himself or put a team together to get the job done. Though the more he thought about it, the more he liked the idea of separating Banner and Hulk into their own individual bodies. When I have some free time, I'll raid Kamartaj's library and see what I can find on alter egos and their possible separation. Peter thought as he listened to Gamora. If we're unlucky, you'll be able to meet two members of the Black Order on our journey. Gamora says as Quill walked by, overhearing her words. Black Order? Sounds kinky. He comments as he takes a seat between Peter and Gamora. Easily seen through his actions, Peter found his new friend's jealous behavior amusing. Of course, Gamora was completely oblivious to the meaning behind Quill's actions. The Black Order is not kinky da. Gamora says in distaste. They are elite killers who could tear you apart with a flick of their wrist. Even meeting one of them would mean death for us all. Okay, 
Quill was officially spooked. Why would we cross paths with them? Because they're after the orb as well, Peter assumed and received a confirming nod from Gamora. Yes, they dispatched me to retrieve the orb for them. Gamora reveals with a frown. And soon enough, they'll figure out that I've betrayed them and come looking for the orb themselves. You worked for them? Quill exclaims in shock, as he still didn't know much about his current love interest. They are my siblings da. Gamora said with a heavy dose of sarcasm. Before Quill could ask a hundred more questions, Peter cut into the conversation. Which members did Thanos send to get the orb? He asks curiously. Proxima Midnight and Corvus Glaive. As soon as Peter heard those two names, he tuned out the rest of the conversation. I think Proxima and Corvus are the weakest of the Black Order, which is good. Peter thought as he wanted to give the Guardians a chance against at least one of them. They needed to grow as a team and couldn't do that without some obstacles to overcome. After all, even if all of the members of the Black Order came at once, Peter could probably handle them with ease. Especially since he has full access to the Reality Stone's power. The only person in the universe that Peter isn't 100% confident in fighting is Thanos, who currently held the Mind Stone in his grasp. In Peter's mind, they're evenly matched. Each of them has an Infinity Stone. Though Peter has three, he can only wield one at the moment. When it comes to physical strength, Peter was sure that Thanos bested him in that category, though that doesn't mean he would win in a fight between the two. Peter may be physically weaker, but he's definitely faster, more dexterous, and has a lot more abilities than the Mad Titan. If they fought now, Peter would definitely bet on himself, as he felt confident in his skills and abilities, but the odds would realistically be around 50 to 50. Of course, this is all speculation about a man that Peter has never met in person. And they wouldn't remain so evenly matched forever. I need to finish putting my conduit together. Peter thought, as Thanos wouldn't stand a chance against all three of his Infinity Stones. Just adding the Power Stone to his arsenal would be more than enough. Wow, your family is worse than mine. Quill admitted as he received a brief overview from Gamora. I thought being kidnapped and raised by Ravagers was as bad as it could get. Boohoo, life is so hard as a space princess. Rocket appears from the cockpit. You had it easy if you ask me. Hey, it ain't a competition. Quill immediately comes to Gamora's defense. Simp. Peter thought with a shake of his head. Because if it was, you'd definitely win. I mean, what are you? Did some mad scientist put your brain in the first roadkill he could find, da? Quill asks jokingly. I'll show you roadkill. Rocket leaped off of the floor and latched onto Quill's face. I think that's my K, Peter says as he stands up and opens a portal. I'll be back when you reach Xanov. In front of Gamora's shocked gaze, Peter stepped through the portal and disappeared. How did he do that? Gamora asks, dumbfounded. I am Groot. Groot answered as he extended his roots, pulling Quill and Rocket apart. Let me at him. While the Guardians were soaring through space, Peter returned to the Avengers Tower, as he needed to at least check in on everything. They just absorbed a worldwide spy agency, after all. Yo, how are things going? Peter asks as he found Fury in his office. Hectic, where have you been? Fury answers from behind a desk full of paperwork. I've been off-planet. Peter says as he peeks over at the papers on his desk. Any problem with the new shield? Some, but it's been handled. Fury says as he leans back in his chair. What were you doing off-planet? I'll explain later. Peter says as he makes his way to the door. By the way, your wife moved in with me for safety reasons. Just until Hydra is fully dealt with. Fury frowned, though he kept his mouth shut, knowing that she would be safer this way. What about MJ? She practically lived with me before all of this, so nothing has changed. Peter says as he turns back to see Fury's grumpy face before taking his leave. See ya. Heading to his own office, Peter opened a portal and grabbed his laptop. I should finish this up. Peter thought as he sat down at his desk and got to work. A couple of hours later, Peter's door swung open, revealing an eager-looking Captain America. Did you find anything that could help Bucky? He didn't bother with pleasantries and asked immediately. Perfect timing, Peter says as he turns the laptop towards Steve. I just finished scanning the data we stole from Zola. Viruses found, 169, anomalies found, 13, conscious minds, 1, what the hell does that mean? Steve asks in confusion. It means Zola had a backup plan in case someone killed him and swiped his data. Peter says as he points to the screen. Click this please, run cleaner, ah. Okay, Steve says as he had his pointer finger to tap the screen. Your age is showing, old man. Peter comments as he reaches around and uses the touchpad to click the button himself. Instantly, a loading bar appeared on the screen, which quickly filled under Steve's curious gaze. Clean successful. There we go, Peter says as he turns the laptop to himself. Now, let's see what Zola has on Bucky. As Peter unlocked the data and searched the keyword Winter Soldier, Steve invited himself to the other side of the desk and eagerly watched over his shoulder. <laughs> Peter hummed as he scrolled through everything faster than Steve could follow. What? Can we help him? Steve asks impatiently. They seem to have used some sort of memory suppressing machine. Peter says as he continues to scroll. Ouch, they performed electroconvulsive therapy on him, which severely damaged his limbic system. 
The limbic system is the part of the brain involved in behavioral and emotional responses, especially when it comes to behaviors needed for survival, like feeding, reproduction, caring for children, and fight or flight responses. Seeing that Steve barely understood what he was saying, Peter explained in simpler terms. Hydra shocked the hell out of him, which made Bucky forget himself while also damaging his brain. They then manipulate his broken mind with images and code words, turning him into the killer he is today. Is it fixable? Steve asks hopefully. Yes, but we would need to heal his brain and then have someone like Charles uproot all of his buried memories. Peter nods. Hearing the confidence in Peter's words, Steve couldn't hold back the smile from forming on his face. Though it soon disappeared. How the hell are we supposed to heal his brain? Steve asks worriedly, as that sounded complicated. Thinking for a moment, Peter suddenly remembered something. Follow me. Taking the elevator a few floors down, Peter escorted Steve through the halls and security checkpoints before arriving in a spacious laboratory, filled with all sorts of healthy-looking plants. Maya, are you here? Peter called out and moments later a beautiful woman in a lab coat peeked her head out of an office door. Maya Hansen. Is there a problem? Maya asks as no one but Tony visits her lab. Speaking of. Just as Peter was about to speak, the doors behind him swung open and Tony came strolling in Hey, I came to check dash Tony froze when he found Peter and Steve in front of him. What are you two doing here? Good timing. Peter says as he walks over to a nearby table and plugs in a flash drive. Gather around? Tapping the table a few times, everyone watched as a projection of a brain appeared in the air. What happened to the limbic system? Maya noticed the damage immediately. It's fried? Tony commented with a frown. This is Bucky's brain. Peter reveals as Tony's frown deepens. I cracked open the data I stole from Zola and learned what they did to make him like that. Who's Bucky? Maya asks in confusion. That's not important right now. Peter says as Tony speaks up. They cooked his brain, huh? He asked. Yes, probably beyond repair. Peter says as Maya nods in agreement. Steve frowned at Peter and Tony's poor choice of words. Is this person even alive? She asks curiously and receives a nod from Peter. Tapping the table a few times, everyone watched as the live cameras from Bucky's cell appeared. That's him, Peter says. It's a miracle that he's not a vegetable? Maya comments as she watches Bucky pace back and forth in his cell. Captain America's fists tighten at the way they're talking about his best friend. Can you heal him? Peter asks. After dealing with the whole extrema situation, Maya was hired as a scientist for the Avengers. Ever since then, she and Tony have been working on extremists together, as she wanted all those years ago. Of course, Pepper wasn't so happy in the beginning, as Maya and Tony had sexual relations in the past, but she soon got over her possessive feelings. Especially since Maya started dating a certain man, though that's not important right now. Maybe, Maya answers unsurely as she hits a few buttons on the table. Instantly, a video of an armless monkey projected into the air. This is Bubbles, she says as she gestures to the holographic video. He lost his arm in the local zoo when a tiger escaped into the chimpanzee habitat. Watch. Bubbles was strapped down to a table and seemed to be heavily sedated. Suddenly, a pair of arms appeared in the frame, holding a syringe with a golden honey-like liquid inside. Screwing the needless syringe into an 4, which was already connected to the monkey's bloodstream, a short countdown was heard before the plunger was pushed in, injecting the golden fluid into the monkey. Eek! Eek! Oh! Instantly, Bubbles was woken from his sedation and screamed in excruciating pain. Its body seemed to glow in a red hue for a moment before something miraculous happened. The stub on its left shoulder that used to be a hairy arm began to morph and grow at an extremely rapid pace. Within seconds, the monkey's missing arm was grown back and the red hue on its skin simmered down until it completely disappeared. Wow! Steve muttered in awe. Although the arm was currently hairless, which didn't match the rest of the monkey's body, it was back and looked better than ever. Is Bubbles still alive? Peter asks, as he knew the usual end of those who are given extremists. Follow me. Maya says, as she leads everyone to an empty room, where a one-way mirror showed a small makeshift habitat for a monkey. Inside this habitat, Peter could see Bubbles with both of his arms, playing on a tire swing that was attached to a fake tree. We've run every test and found nothing wrong with him. Maya says with a proud look on her face. It's completely stable dash as she said this, Bubbles suddenly let out a loud burp, though that wasn't the only thing he let out. A long stream of golden fire shot out of his mouth, shocking everyone in attendance. Though we haven't been able to remove the fire powers yet, Maya admits as she planned to make a form of extremist that only heals, leaving out the superpowers so that the general public could make use of its miraculous healing properties. Have you tested it on humans? Steve asks hopefully. Because Bucky isn't a monkey. The look on Maya's face said it all. They haven't started human trials yet. No, but chimpanzees are our closest relatives in the animal kingdom. Peter says as he turns to Maya and Tony. What are the odds of it working on Bucky without a problem? Peter asks, as they knew more about extremists than him, though he would look into their research soon enough. Fire powers and regeneration would be useful. Looking at one another, Tony and Maya communicate with their eyes. 85% Maya revealed after a moment of thought. 
That's not good enough. Steve instantly disagreed. I just got Bucky back, and I won't risk his life as a lab rat. Steve, 85% is really good. Peter tries to reason with him. It's better odds than a lot of major surgeries out there. Steve turned silent and contemplative at Peter's words. What if someone else tests it first? Would the odds go up then? Yes, but you would be risking your life for no reason. Tony answers with a frown. True, but he also gets more superpowers out of it so the pros and cons even out. Peter thought as he looked at Steve seriously. Are you sure that you want to do this? You just reunited with Peggy. She would be heartbroken if you were to leave her so soon. 85% is good odds, right? Steve throws Peter's words back in his face. Besides, I can't let Bucky get an edge over me. It wouldn't be right. Peter couldn't help but chuckle. All right, Maya prep the lab. Peter nods and turns to Maya. We're doing it now. She asks in confusion. Yup. Peter says as he turns back to Steve. Go and talk to Peggy. We'll be ready in an hour. Make it too. Maya yelled as she rushed off to set everything up. You heard the lady? Peter says as Steve nods and runs off as well. So, we're going to give the trained super assassin that killed my parents fire powers? Tony asks sarcastically. Yeah, pretty much. Peter responds dumbly. Great. Tony sighs as he follows after Maya to help with the prep work. Dash two hours later. After setting everything up, Steve and Peggy came walking into the lab together, right on time. If he dies, there will be hell to pay. Peggy whispers as she passes Peter with a serious yet worried look on her face. Is everything ready? Steve asks as he stood in front of a large padded table, which was covered in all sorts of straps. Yeah, take your clothes off and hop on, Maya says, and Steve starts pulling his shirt off. Just as he got to his boxer briefs, Maya spoke up in a hurry. That's enough. You can keep your underwear on, she says with a light blush on her cheeks while receiving an evil glare from Peggy. After all, Steve has the perfect human body, thanks to the super soldier serum, so any woman would feel, attracted. Ahem, Peggy clears her throat. You won't find my boyfriend's eyes down there. Eh sorry. Maya turns away as Tony laughed at her plight. Get on the table, Tony says as he held back his laughter. Silently doing as he's told, Steve lies on the table, which instantly came to life and strapped him down tightly. Comfy, Tony asks. Not at all, Steve admits. Good, Tony says as he opens a nearby lab fridge and pulls out a syringe filled with a familiar golden liquid. Hold still please, Maya says as she expertly puts an four into Steve's left arm and turns to Tony. Ready when you are. Are you sure you want to do this? Peter asks before Tony could connect the syringe to the four. Do it. Steve answers resolutely. Sadly, sedation doesn't work when it comes to this, so you'll have to stay conscious throughout the whole process. Tony explains as he screws the needless syringe into the four. Hit me with your best shot. Steve says, eliciting a smile from Tony. Someone's been catching up on their music. Tony says as he presses the plunger, injecting the golden liquid into Steve's arm. Exclamation point. Before Steve could utter another word, he felt a searing pain run up his arm and spread throughout the rest of his body at a rapid pace. Ugh hi. Within seconds, Steve's skin began to glow red, as if he were a cartoon character that ate a very spicy pepper. Is that normal? Peggy asks in worry as she rushes to Steve's side. Yes, it should be over soon. Maya explained as she and Tony nervously watched their work in action. Eh. Steve yelled in pain, shooting a long stream of fire from his mouth, as his skin sizzled and smoked with heat. Everyone watched in silence, hoping for success. After all, the monkey didn't shoot fire out of its mouth in the video. Almost a minute later, Steve's scream settled down and the redness on his skin slowly faded. Ow! Peggy yelped as she grasped his hand, feeling just how hot he really was. This will go away, right? Yes. Maya replied as she and Tony started using the many machines in the lab to skin Steve's body. D did it work? Steve asks as he groggily tries to stand up, straining against his bindings. Yes, but stay on the table. Maya shouts as she heard the metal restraints groan from Steve's strength. Steve didn't listen and continued to try and stand, though thankfully Peggy was there to help. Steve. Steve, look at me. She gets his attention by grasping his head and burning her hands in the process. You need to relax, okay? As Peggy was doing her work, Maya and Tony ran every scan they could, looking for the slightest red flag. Thankfully, they found none. Once Steve's body cooled down, they took multiple samples, such as blood, flesh, hair, and saliva. Peggy watched in awe as Steve healed instantly after the blood and flesh were taken. Amazing? She muttered. How is it? Peter asks as Tony and Maya look over the data from the samples. It worked. Maya says proudly as she collapses into her chair with a relieved sigh. Of course, it worked. Tony says with his trademark smirk. Good. Steve speaks up as he lifts his head to look Peter in the eyes. Because it's Bucky's turn now. Checking the clock, Peter saw that he still had some time before he needed to return to the Guardians. All right. Peter agreed as he turned to Maya and Tony. Do you have enough extremists for another go? While Tony and Maya prepared everything once again, Peter was tasked with retrieving the brainwashed super assassin from his cell. Since Bucky wouldn't come willingly, 
Peter didn't even bother talking and simply opened a portal under him, dumping him straight onto the same table Steve just occupied only moments ago. Ugh. Bucky grunted as he hit the table. Before he could fully assess the situation, the table straps tightened around his arms and legs. Groan, the metal bindings creaked and groaned under the pressure of Bucky's enhanced strength. Let's fix that. Peter says as he waves his hand. Instantly, golden markings appeared on the metal restraints, reinforcing them to a crazy degree. Ag hi. Bucky shouted as he did his best to break out. Sadly, the metal wasn't making any sounds anymore and wouldn't break anytime soon either. You could have done that earlier? Peggy comments from the side as she iced her red hands. Sorry. Peter says as Bucky continues to yell and scream. Okay, that's enough. With a snap of Peter's fingers, the room instantly becomes silent, though just by looking, everyone could see that Bucky was still screaming like a madman. That's useful. Steve mutters as Peggy nodded beside him. You won't be needing this either, Peter says as Bucky's metal arm disappeared. Similar to Steve, Bucky went through the same process without any problems. He even shot fire from his mouth as well. Though, one thing was different. Just like Bubbles the monkey, Bucky's lost arm, grew back in a matter of seconds, which made Steve happy, as he blames himself for everything wrong with his best friend. Once the process was completed, Steve rushed up to Bucky's side to check on his well-being. After all, there was a lot of screaming. Although they couldn't hear it this time around, thanks to Peter's spell, everyone could still see Bucky screaming in silent agony the entire time. Bucky, can you hear me? Steve asks, hoping his healed brain may help jog some memories. Do you remember who I am? As Bucky groggily peered up at him, Steve felt he may have remembered something, though those thoughts were swiftly stomped out as the Winter Soldier lunged his head forward, smashing it against Steve's waiting face. Ack! Steve was knocked backward as he held his bleeding nose. I told you that we still need to unearth his suppressed memories. Simply healing him isn't enough, Peter says as he turns to Tony and Maya. Scan his brain to make sure his limbic system is actually healed, on it, Maya nods and gets to work. After going through some scans, a 3D image of Bucky's brain was projected for everyone to see. It's healed? Steve sighs in relief as the damage that he saw earlier was now nowhere to be seen. Good work everyone, Peter says as he opens a portal below Bucky, sending him tumbling back into his cell. Seeing the worried look on Steve's face, Peter rolled his eyes. He's in his cell, Peter explains as pulls up the live footage, showing Bucky breathing fire at the glass of his cell, trying to escape. See, now go out and rest. You've just been through a tiring procedure, what about Bucky? Steve asks, eager to help his friend. I need to talk to Charles about that, and he doesn't like invading other people's minds, so it may take a bit, Peter explains with a sigh. Just let me know when Charles comes to the tower. I'll help convince him, Steve says and receives a nod from Peter as he and Peggy leave to get some rest. As soon as they were gone, Peter turns to Tony. You ready for your conversation? Peter asks. Yeah, thanks for keeping Capsicle out of it. Tony says as he could tell that Peter was covering for him. No problem. It's the least I can do. Peter says as he opens a portal. Meet me at Bucky's cell, and I'll bring Charles to fix his memories. Once he's done, you can have Bucky all to yourself. Thank you. Tony says genuinely. Of course, just remember no killing, okay? Peter reminds him. At the end of the day, Peter knew that this wouldn't actually be a conversation. Tony and Bucky would fight, and hopefully, come to some sort of understanding. And with Bucky's newfound regeneration, Tony could kick the crap out of him as much as he wanted without any issue. I know. Tony nodded as Peter stepped through the portal and disappeared. Tony? Are you okay? Maya came back into the room and asks, as Tony seemed to be in a daze. Do we have another dose of extremis? He asked over his shoulder. Um, yeah. Why? Maya confirms as she checks the fridge. Staying silent, Tony hopped into the table and was immediately strapped down. Give it to me. Stepping out of the portal, Peter arrived in Professor Xavier's office, where the professor was currently doing paperwork at his desk. How can I help you, Spider-Man? Charles asks as he continues to sift through papers. I need you to help someone with suppressed memories. Peter says as he explains Bucky's situation. I see. Charles says as he stands from his desk and looks toward Peter expectantly. Let's go. I have a lot of work to get back to, so we might as well get this over with as quickly as possible. Although Peter wasn't lying when he told Steve that Charles didn't like invading other people's minds, he may have misled him a little bit. Charles has no problem invading the mind of another, as long as it's for their own good. Luckily, a broken and brainwashed super assassin was right up the professor's alley. Sorry, Steve. But I promised Tony some alone time, and you would never agree to that. Stepping through a portal with Charles following closely behind, Peter appeared in between Bucky and Blonsky's cells. Spider-Man. Blonsky exclaimed as he rushed to the glass wall of his cell. Can I become an Avenger now or what? Blonsky was very eager to leave his cell. Question mark. Charles looked at Peter in confusion. I'll explain later, Peter says as he turns to Blonsky. Not right now. I have a meeting with your neighbor. Eh? Blonsky grunted in disappointment. Fine, but hurry it up, will you? I'm dying to see some sunlight again. 
I'll bring your situation up in the next council meeting, I promise, Peter says as he walks over to the controls and isolated Blonsky's cell. Instantly, his cell was muted, and the glass became foggy, blocking him from seeing outside for the time being. Alright, sorry about that. Peter says as he and Charles turn to see Bucky shooting a stream of fire in their direction. Thankfully, the glass separating them is extremely strong and heat resistant, so no flame that he can produce would ever work against it. You didn't say anything about this? Charles comments. The fire is new. Peter says as he turns to see a curious look on the professor's face. He's not a metahuman, if that's what you're thinking, I see. Charles nods in confusion. Can you do it from here, or should I put him to sleep so you can go inside? Peter asks. I got it. Charles says as Bucky suddenly collapses to the floor unconscious. Open it up. Tapping a few buttons on the control panel, the cell swings open and Charles strolls inside. Let's see. Charles mutters as he sits beside Bucky and places his hand on his forehead. As soon as he touched Bucky's head, it was like both of them froze in time, remaining completely still for minutes at a time. Silence filled the cell as Peter waited patiently for Charles to finish whatever he was currently doing. Soon enough, Peter heard the sound of footsteps headed his way. Hey, is he dash Tony appears, looking oddly disheveled compared to before. Shook, Peter shushes him and points inside the cell, where Charles was working his magic. Taking a minute to eye him up and down, Peter could see that Tony's clothes were slightly out of place and his body was covered in a thin layer of sweat. Not only that, but he was giving off a lot of heat as well. Did he think I wouldn't notice? Peter wondered as he instantly figured out that Tony took a dose of Extremis. Most likely in preparation for the fight to come. As Peter was thinking this, Bucky started to whimper and shake in his sleep, as if he was having some sort of seizure. Ah, Bucky groaned as a few stray tears rolled down his cheeks. As this was happening, a frown formed on the professor's face and didn't leave it for the remainder of the process. This continued for a few minutes before Bucky suddenly calmed down and slept peacefully. He's been through a lot. Charles comments as he felt nothing but pity for Bucky. I know. Peter nods in understanding. Is it done? Are his memories back? Yes, when he wakes up, Bucky should remember everything about himself. Both good and bad. Charles clarifies as he steps out of the cell. Thank you. Peter says as he opens a portal. I know you have a lot of work to do, so don't let me hold you from it any longer. No problem. It's times like these where I can appreciate this intrusive power of mine. Charles says as he steps through the portal and ends up back in his office. Snapping the portal shut after saying farewell, Peter turned to Tony, who was silently staring at Bucky in contemplation. Go ahead, Peter says as he motions to the open cell. I'll lock you both inside. Without uttering a single word, Tony enters the cell, which locks tightly behind him. You can go now, Peter. Sure, remember Dash, no killing, I know. Tony finishes Peter's words, as he's heard them a million times already. Walking down the hall, Peter waits until he's out of sight before turning invisible and backtracking to the cell once again. In the cell. As the cell locked itself shut and Peter walked away, Tony had no idea what he was going to do. At first, he planned to trick Peter into allowing him the chance to kill Bucky with his own hands, but did he really want that? He's been through a lot. Charles's words replay in his mind. After learning all that Bucky has been through, and looking him up out of curiosity for his enemy, Tony couldn't help but feel pity for the man. Though that pity soon faded when he recalled the image of his father's caved-in skull and his mother struggling for air. Rise and shine. Tony exclaims as he gets a running start and kicks Bucky's head like a soccer ball. Killing or not, Tony would decide that after showing him 1000 times the pain his parents felt in their dying moments. Ugh. Bucky woke with a start as he was punted across the cell and smacked into the glass wall. Where am I? Leaning against the cell wall, Bucky froze as every suppressed memory he ever had came crashing down on him. From the happy blissful days as an oblivious child to the sickening assassinations of innocent people, Bucky remembered everything. What have I done? He muttered in horror as he started shaking. Get up! Tony yelled as he waited in the center of the cell. I'm not done with you yet. Wait! Bucky held his hands up, hoping to calm the situation somehow. Tony stalks forward and grabs Bucky by the neck. Lifting him off of the ground with a single hand, Tony chokes Bucky who was still in a state of confusion and refused to fight back. S stop! Bucky struggles to speak as he grasped Tony's arm. Did you stop when my mother begged you to? Tony asks as his grip on Bucky's neck tightened. Could my father even speak as you beat his head in? Copying the actions he saw in the video of his parents' deaths, Tony made use of his free hand and started raining superpowered punches down on Bucky's face. Blow after blow, Bucky's face started to contort and bleed, though it was soon covered in a golden light, which healed any wounds he incurred in a matter of seconds. Seeing Extremis do its work, Tony took it as a challenge and quickened his pace, hoping to outdamage Bucky's healing ability. After almost a minute of gasping for air and being berated by heavy punches, Bucky had enough and pulled his leg up, sending a powerful kick to his attacker's stomach. Instantly, Tony was forced to drop Bucky as he tumbled backward, holding his stomach in pain. Wait! Bucky gasps as he fell to the floor, breathing heavily to fill his oxygen-deprived lungs. You're... Tony Stark? 
Did you stop when my mother begged you to? Tony's words echoed in his mind. Could my father even speak as you beat his head in? Realization dawned on him as the chilling memory of murdering Howard and Maria Stark surfaced in Bucky's mind. I killed your parents, Bucky muttered in shame and disgust with himself and his actions. Just figured it out, huh? Tony scoffs as he picks himself off the ground. Get up. Bucky remained seated on the floor, staring up at Tony in both sympathy and shame. Get up. Tony yelled angrily, though Bucky didn't budge. I said, get up. Just kill me, Bucky said as he waited patiently on the ground. That's what you're here for, right? Just get it over with. I deserve it. After seeing all of his horrible actions throughout the years, Bucky was already feeling suicidal, so having Tony here to do the dirty work for him was a win-win for both sides. One wanted revenge, while the other wanted to repent. Glaring down at Bucky, Tony's hands gripped into tight fists. Letting out a frustrated sigh, Tony turned away from Bucky and called out. Open the cell. I'm done. Bucky looked up at Tony in shock as the cell door swung open. Wait. Kill me, I won't resist. Bucky practically begs as Tony ignored him and continued his way out of the cell. Tony said as he turned to look Bucky straight in the eyes. You want to die? The look on Bucky's face was more than enough to confirm Tony's statement. Killing you would be mercy? Tony says as the cell seals itself shut. You don't deserve my mercy. No, you deserve to live every day of your long life, hating everything about yourself. Bucky just sat in his cage with a dumb look on his face. He didn't want to be alive anymore. The screams of his victim seemed to always fill his mind, throwing him into a crippling depression. Without another word, Tony turned away and marched down the hall, leaving Bucky to stew in his cell. Wait. Come back. Bucky scrambled to the sealed door of his cell and started banging on it. Kill me. Kill me. Kill me. Please kill me. Peter stayed behind long enough to see Bucky break down into tears, hoping for someone to end his suffering. It's a good thing that every cell is made to be suicide-proof, Peter thought sadly as he rushed to catch up with Tony. You knew I was there, Peter says, as he followed Tony into the elevator and removed his invisibility. You were too worried that I'd kill him, Tony solemnly stared forward. Can you blame me? Peter looked at Tony worriedly. Are you okay? No, but I will be. After dropping Tony off with Pepper, who is far better equipped to handle Tony's emotions, Peter stood outside Steve's apartment door. I feel like a kid who's about to get an earful from his parents. Peter thought as he hesitated for a moment before knocking on the door. Yeah. Peggy asked as the door swung open, finding Peter on the other side. Did Charles agree to help? Yeah. Peter says as he peeks inside the door. Is Steve awake? Yes, I am. Steve eagerly rushes to the door. Is Charles here already? About that? Peter sighs heavily as he explains what happened, as well as his deception. As he finished speaking, the piercing glares of two super soldiers weighed down on him. Peter's heart might have been in the right place, as his actions settled the mounting tension between Tony and Bucky, but it was hard for them to see it that way. Pow! Suddenly, Steve wound his fist back and socked Peter across the face. Of course, Peter could have easily dodged it but chose to remain still and take the hit. He deserved it for deceiving them, after all. Where's Bucky? Peggy asks flatly as Steve seemed to realize what he just did and froze. In his cell, Peter says as Peggy grabs Steve's hand and pulls him down the hall without another word. Wait. Stopping in their tracks, Steve and Peggy turn to look over their shoulders. He's suicidal? Peter reveals with a frown. If you want him to live past the night, don't let him out. He won't be able to do anything to himself in the cell, especially with his new regeneration. Nodding her head, Peggy pulls Steve away in a rush to check on Bucky. That went about as well as it could have. Peter sighed as he opened a portal to his house. I still have a couple of hours to kill before the guardians arrive at Xanov. When Steve and Peggy arrived at Bucky's cell, they found him sitting in the corner by the door, staring off into the distance. Bucky, Steve tapped the glass. Bucky instantly recognized who it was. Turning to look, he saw both Steve and Peggy looking at him with hopeful eyes. Do you remember me? Steve asks. Yeah. Bucky sounded devoid of all happiness. Where did we meet? Steve asks just to make sure. A small, almost unnoticeable smile formed on Bucky's lips as he recalled one of his fonder memories, which managed to drown out all of the bad for just a single moment. You were getting your scrawny but handed to you by a few neighborhood bullies, Bucky's voice held a fond touch to it this time around. I stepped in and gave them a dose of their own medicine, you're back. Steve exclaims as he rushes to open the cell. As the cell door swung open, Steve practically ran inside and pulled Bucky into his arms. A slash N, truly, a bromance for the ages loudly crying face, I missed you, buddy. Steve says, as Bucky stiffened for a moment before reluctantly returning the hug. Bucky eyed the open cell door as they separated. Can I leave? Ah. Uh, Steve hesitated as he looked toward Peggy. Peggy answered resolutely as she stood in the doorway, blocking the path out. It'll be safer for you in here. If this is about Stark, then we already settled it. Bucky argues. No, Bucky. Steve says with a shake of his head. It's about you. We know you're suicidal. Peggy states bluntly. Turning over his shoulder, Steve looked at her as if to say really? 
What? Tiptoeing around the subject won't solve anything. Peggy rolls her eyes and turns to Bucky, who is currently looking down in shame. It's okay, Bucky. You've been through a lot. We'll find you a good psychologist and maybe get you some antidepressants as well. And once you're feeling better, we'll go out on the town and visit all of our spots, Steve says in support. Did you know Joe's Pizza is still open? They closed Freddy's about 20 years ago though. Sure, sounds good. Bucky hesitantly agreed as he did all he could to hold himself back from rushing out of the door. He knew that he wouldn't get far anyway. Good. Steve smiled happily as he walked over to close the door, locking all three of them inside. No one said you have to be alone in here. Thanks, Steve. While Steve and Peggy were spending the night with Bucky, hoping to help him through what's probably the worst point in his entire life, it was finally time for Peter to return to space. After tucking Lily into bed and saying goodbye to his loved ones, Peter donned his suit and opened a portal. Stepping back into Quill's ship, Peter found all of the Guardians sitting around the room, glaring at one another. Groot was missing some of his bark. Gamora looked a lot more pissed than usual. Drax had all sorts of doodles drawn on his face, though he didn't seem to notice. Quill's face and arms were littered with small animal scratches. And lastly, Rocket was missing clumps of his fur, as if someone pulled them out by the fistful. What the hell happened while I was gone? Peter asks as everyone started complaining all at once. After hearing everyone throw their complaints at him, Peter let out a sigh as he put the puzzle pieces together. Let me get this straight, Peter speaks as all of them finished whining. All of this started because you guys couldn't decide on sleeping arrangements? After Peter left, Groot was able to separate Quill and Rocket, though the petty arguments didn't stop there. Soon enough, it came time to decide who slept where, and the ship only had two bedrooms. Of course, Quill, being the love-struck man he is, offered the guest room to Gamora, leaving his bedroom as the only other option. Luckily, Drax didn't mind and fell asleep on one of the couch-like benches alongside Groot, who didn't need much in terms of comfort to get a good night's sleep. The only problem left was Rocket, who refused to sleep anywhere else but Quill's bed and wooden chair. Quill instantly refused, and a fight broke out between the two, which eventually woke everyone up. Groot was the one to break up the scuffle, though he took a small bit of damage in the process. Whilst Peter was trying to figure out how to deal with this, both Quill and Rocket were sneaking peeks at Drax and doing their best to hold back their laughter. They must have done that to Drax before the fight broke out. Peter thought as he saw a veiny dong drawn on Drax's forehead. Drax, go and wash your face, hot. He grunts in confusion as he touches his cheek. Is there food on my face? The low snickering of both of his assailants could be heard, causing Drax to grow even more confused. You'll see, just go to the bathroom, Peter says as Drax walks off, wondering what the hell's going on. While he's washing the graffiti off, I'll add some rooms to the ship, so everyone can have their own sleeping space, Peter says as a loud shout could be heard from the nearby bathroom. Scoundrels. Drax sounded pissed. Before heading off to remodel the ship, Peter looked toward Quill and Rocket, who seemed nervous after hearing Drax's reaction to their little prank. If I were you, I'd either apologize and hope he forgives you, or find somewhere to hide until things blow over, Peter says as he walks off. Quill. Rocket. An hour later, Peter used his knowledge of the mystic arts to swiftly remodel the ship, turning the two bedrooms as well as some unused storage space into six medium-sized bedrooms with their own personal bathrooms. One for each of member of the crew. Although Peter didn't exactly need a room, as he could easily portal home and sleep, he made one for himself anyway. Maybe I'll give it to Mantis if she still joins the crew, Peter thought as he arrived at the cockpit and caught sight of the busy spacefaring planet of Xanov growing closer and closer. Looks like you guys won't be getting back to sleep just yet, what did you do to my baby? Quill exclaims as he finally saw all of rooms Peter constructed. He was far too busy hiding from Drax until now to notice. What? If we're going to be a crew, then everyone needs their own room, Peter says as Quill came storming over. Who the hell said we would be a crew? Quill asked as he complained. My bedroom is half the size it was before and most of the storage room is gone. You didn't need that much space and the storage room was completely empty, to begin with, Peter argues with a shrug. That's not the point. Quill shouts in exasperation as a faint beeping sound could be heard from the controls. We got an incoming transmission from the fascist core. Rocket yells as he hesitates to answer the call. Answer it. Peter leaves Quill to his tantrum and joins Rocket at a large screen, which lit up just in time for his arrival. An older pink-skinned man in a Nova Corps uniform appeared, eyeing Rocket and Peter suspiciously. Unidentified Milano M-Class ship, wait patiently while a patrol ship is dispatched for inspection. Failure to do so will result in your fiery deaths. The soldier warned with a stern glare. Damn Nova scum. Rocket mutters just loud enough for the man to hear. Hello, I'm Spider-Man. Peter ignores Rocket's attitude and introduces himself. Irani Rail should have informed your superiors about my arrival? Please hold. He says as the screen darkens. I'm gonna clean my guns. Rocket turns and walks off. Let me know when we land. Seconds after Rocket left, the screen lit up again, and a man who looked to be a much higher rank than the last appeared. My apologies for the harsh welcome, the orange-skinned man says with a reverent look on his face. 
Ever since the Sons of Ronan appeared, we've had to up the planet's security by a large margin. It's no problem, Peter nods understandingly. That's good to hear. The Nova official seemed to sigh in relief. If you wait in your current position, I'll dispatch a couple of patrol ships to escort you to our headquarters. Sounds good. Please prepare all of the relevant information on the Sons of Ronan in the meantime. I'd like to get started as soon as we land. Only ten minutes later, two patrol ships painted in the colors of the Nova Corps appeared and escorted them to the capital city of Xanov, Varus. Finally, I can wet my blades with the blood of the Sons of Ronan. Drax exclaims as he holds his dual knives at the ready. Well, we have to find them first, Peter says as they land at this planet's Nova Corps main base. Stepping out of the ship, Peter and the Guardians were greeted by a congregation of high-level officials, who were being led by the orange-skinned man from earlier. Welcome. He says as all of the officials look at Peter in either awe or skepticism. Please follow me. I've prepared everything as you asked. Lead the way, Peter says as they're led into the building. As you already know, the Sons of Ronan have terrorized our planet ever since you killed Ronan and his men, the orange man explains as he hands a handheld tablet to Peter. We've managed to capture a few of their members, but they're all fanatics who would never betray their cause da. Can't we just round up all of the Kree on the planet? Quill asks as Peter scrolls through all of the information on the tablet. Sadly, no. The man shakes his head. Although our Kree citizens make up the lowest percentage of our population, that number is still in the millions. We don't have the manpower or the authority to detain millions of law-abiding citizens. Where are these prisoners? Peter asks as finished reading and handed the tablet over to Gamora. Follow me. The Nova official in charge says and leads them out of the room. This is our high security prison. He says as they pass multiple security checkpoints before finding themselves strolling through the halls of what looked like a high-tech solitary confinement wing. Each of these cells holds members of the Sons of Ronan. Gesturing to the sealed doors, the orange man waits patiently for whatever Peter would ask next. <laughs> Peter thought for a moment. Which one is the highest level member? This one? He replies instantly. Open it up. Peter practically orders. Are you sure? The man asks but Peter simply nods. All right. Open cell 6257. Beep, a brief high-pitched sound is heard as the door swings open, revealing a scar-faced blue Cree man, sitting on the toilet with his pants around his ankles. That's disgusting. Rocket comments harshly. I am Groot. Groot nods in agreement. Finish your business quickly, Peter says awkwardly as he swiftly closed the door. Minutes later, the door opened once again and thankfully this time the man was fully clothed and off the toilet. Let's try this again, shall we? Peter says as he strolls into the cell. I'll ask once, where's the base of operations for the Sons of Ronan? The man smirked and simply remained silent. Okay, let's start the fun. After his door was sealed shut once again and he was left alone, the scarred Cree man could hear the screams of his comrades, who most likely chose to remain silent as well. For days at a time, the Cree man was forced to listen to the excruciating wails of his people, growing antsy with every one passing moment. Why have they left me alone? He thought in confusion and dread for what was to come. Boom, suddenly, the scream stopped and a huge explosion rocked his cell, tearing a hole in the wall big enough for him to fit through. Thion. A voice called from the other side of the hole. Jaren? Is that you? The scarred Cree prisoner asked as he rushed up to the hole. Who else would it be? The voice replied gruffly. I'm here to save you, hurry up. What about the others? Thion asks in hesitation. They're all dead, Thion. The voice says in sadness. You have to hurry. We don't have much time. Listening to the voice, Thion rushes through the hole just in time for his cell door to bust open with Nova Guard swarming inside. What did you do to him? Gamora asks Peter as he stood in front of the scarred Kree prisoner, who was currently staring forward in a hypnotic trance. Peter never left the cell and only a few minutes passed since he stepped inside. As soon as the prisoner refused to speak, he quickly formed a spell circle, which shot into the man's forehead and sent him spiraling into a fantasy world of Peter's choosing. Quiet. Peter shushed the crowd of onlookers as he stared into the dazed eyes of his mind-scrambled victim. You have to escape, Thion. Find your comrades and bring about the future that Ronan dreamed of. I have to escape? Ronan's dream. He mutters hazily. Yes, but where will you escape? The sons of Ronan need you. They're hopeless without you. You need to find them as soon as possible. Everyone watched in shock as Peter manipulated the prisoner with ease. They need me. He uttered. Yes, now where will you go? Peter asks. T the provincial tower, floor 217. He reveals. Although he got what he wanted, Peter didn't stop there. No, he kept pushing for more and more information. Peter constantly changed the scenario unfolding in Thion's mind, dragging the hypnotized Kree terrorist on a crazy journey while draining him dry of all relevant information along the way. Throughout Peter's manipulation, he was able to get eight different locations, such as bases and safe houses, as well as the names and addresses of over 16 high-level members of the Sons of Ronan. And it took less than 30 minutes. Sleep. Peter orders as the man collapse onto his bed like a puppet without strings. That's the scariest shit I've ever seen. Quill comments as everyone couldn't help but nod their heads in agreement. 
Gamora isn't responding. Corvus Glaive frowned as he lay in bed with his wife. I said this would happen. His wife, Proxima Midnight comments, draped over her husband's lean naked alien body. A slash N, Corvus is sorta ugly, so enjoy picturing that. P.S. They are married in the MCU. Google it. She's just like her sister. Traitors, all of them, Proxima scoffs in distaste. It does seem that way, doesn't it? Corvus nods. I never understood how father could fawn over them so much, especially that hoe, Gamora. Proxima hisses in jealousy. After a while, the Mad Titan started to treat the Black Order and its members more as subordinates instead of adopted children. This turn of events was easily noticed by their members, especially Proxima, who practically worshipped the ground her father walked on. Even Nebula, who was constantly verbally and physically abused by their father, was the subject of Proxima's unending jealousy. In her mind, Nebula was at least receiving the attention of their father. Proxima would gladly undergo the same hellish upgrades that were forced upon Nebula as long as her father would pay even the slightest bit of attention to her. It seems that we'll have to act before father grows even more impatient than he already is. Corvus ignores his wife's usual hate toward his other sisters as he untangles himself from her and climbs out of bed. Not only did that hoe ruin father's plans, but now she's ruined our evening together as well. Proxima spat venomously as she reluctantly got up and paces off in a fit of anger. I can't wait for the day Gamora and Nebula are dead. Corvus thought, as he wouldn't have to hear his wife's complaining nearly as much. With a long list of names and locations, thanks to the hypnosis spell he learned a few months ago, Peter turned to the orange-skinned Nova commander, who was looking at him with shock and a written all over his face. After all, he tried everything he could to get even a fraction of the information that Peter was able to get in less than a half an hour. Ready your men? Peter ordered as he left the Kree terrorist sleeping in his cell. I want to hit every location at the same time. Once the properties are finished, we can start hunting the names on the list. Why yes, sir. The commander stuttered as he ran off to prepare everything. Dude, you'd tell me if you mind-controlled me before, right? Quill asks nervously. He wasn't the only nervous one in the group either, as each member of the Guardians looked at Peter with wary eyes. Quit looking at me like that. I would never use that spell on you guys. Peter rolls his eyes as they stare at him skeptically. That's actually the first time I've ever done that to someone. Sure, Rocket says in doubt. Just keep your mind voodoo away from me and Groot. We don't consent to nothing to. I am Groot. Groot nods at his friend's words. I wasn't planning on it. After waiting almost an hour for the Nova Corps to gather their members and prepare, Peter and the Guardians accompanied the commander and his men, who would be assaulting the main base of the Sons of Ronan. The Provincial Tower, Floor 217. Talk about an easy payday. Quill says with a giddy smile on his face. Peter and the Guardians were currently in a fairly high-end Nova ship alongside the commander and his trusted soldiers. Surrounding them were dozens of patrol ships, each filled with Nova soldiers, ready to unleash hell on the people who have been terrorizing their planet. It's safe to say that the Nova Corps took this situation very seriously. With all of these soldiers helping us, we'll all be 100,000 units richer in no time. Quill smirked in greed. Seeing the greedy look spread from Quill to Rocket, Peter couldn't help but roll his eyes. They both looked almost relaxed, as if this would be a walk in the park. Just because we have help doesn't mean we should slack off. Peter reprimands them a bit. Overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer? Yeah, whatever. Rocket waves his hand, uncaring. Hearing Rocket's response, Peter opted to remain silent. If they wanted to act foolishly, then Peter would let them and, hopefully, it will lead to a good lesson for them. Who owns the 217th floor? Gamora asks as they flew to the tall shard-shaped tower in the distance. Drax and her seem to be the only two members who took this mission even remotely seriously. That would be a company named Aaron Productions? The commander says as he looked into each location before leaving. Seriously? Peter asks incredulously, as he instantly understood the anagram. They scrambled the letters in Ronan's name and used it for their company, and you never found out? Hearing Peter's words, the commander's eyes went wide in shock as he just realized it now. Soon, the ship was filled with all sorts of alien curse words, as the commander started reprimanding his men for missing such an obvious clue. Arriving at the tower, the dozens of Nova patrol ships surrounded the place, while others landed in order to evacuate the building. While this was happening, the commander's ship landed on the roof. All right, listen up. Peter calls out as everyone exited the ship. You follow my commands and dash we don't work for you, jackass. Rocket comments as he and Groot stroll past Peter and enter the building. You know what, okay. Peter nods to himself as he steps aside. Does anyone else want to work on their own? One by one, Quill, Gamora, and Drax entered the building, unused and unwilling to work with others. Sir, should we stop them? The Nova commander asks. No, let them deal with the repercussions of their actions. Inside the building I am Groot. Groot commented as he follow after Rocket, who held a large high-tech assault rifle in his hands. What the hell are you talking about? Rocket asks as they enter the elevator and head down to the 217th floor. We never needed nobody but us, and that ain't changing just cause you made some friends. I am Groot. Groot disagrees. If you like them so much, then go. 
Rocket blows up on his longtime friend. I don't need ya, ding, suddenly, as they were arguing, the elevator doors parted, revealing a line of blue-skinned men with weapons aimed in their direction. Oh, crap. Meanwhile, seeing that the elevator was already taken, Drax chose to instead take the stairs. Driven by bloodlust, he rushed down as fast as he could, passing each floor swiftly as he grew closer and closer to 217. Just as he passed floor 218 and turned to head down one more flight of stairs, Drax was too caught up in his own anger and drive for battle to notice the thin trip wire on the next step. Boom, with a single step, Drax was blown across the stairwell by a hidden explosive, dropping his knives as he tumbled down the rest of the steps, where an armed group of Kree men and women stood. Not nearly as dumb as Drax, Groot, and Rocket, Quill, on the other hand, chose to utilize the large ventilation system to make his way to floor 217. Crawling through the metal vents, he endured many drops and slides before finally arriving at his destination. Just one more drop and he would go from floor 218 to 217. Here goes nothing. Quill thought as he maneuvered himself backward and fell feet first. Bang, sadly, unlike all of the other drops he took to get here, this one led directly to a grated vent, which instantly buckled and broke under his weight. Ugh. Quill grunted as he tumbled out of the vents and crashed onto the floor. Hot, looking around him, Quill found himself surrounded by a shocked group of blue men and women, who instantly pulled their weapons on him. Shit. As for Gamora, she watched all of this take place from the safer of the building's security room, hoping to gain some useful information before facing the enemy. She watched from the cameras in the stairwell as Drax blew himself up, and in the elevator when Rocket and Groot were forced to surrender. As for Quill, she only saw him enter the vents, but later assumed that a similar fate befell him as well. Thinking to herself for a moment, Gamora left the security room and made her way back to the rooftop, where she found Peter and the Nova Corps standing around leisurely. Gamora, you're back? Peter smirked under his mask as he leaned back onto the nearby wall. Did one of you finish the job already? No, they're all captured. Gamora admits, taking a bit of pride in the fact that she wasn't among them. I see, Peter says uncaringly. It's your turn now, I guess. Don't worry. I know you don't want my help, so I won't interfere. Gamora instantly went quiet as a frown formed on her face. What? You forget something? Peter asks. I was wrong? She admits and receives a knowing nod from Peter. And what were you wrong about? Peter asks, enjoying the moment. Rolling her eyes at him, Gamora plays along. We should have worked together as you said instead of rushing in separately. Just as she said this, a nearby Nova soldier ran over with a tablet in hand. Sir, the terrorists want to trade hostages for free passage out of the building. He says as he hands over the tablet, which showed a live image of the captured guardians with over a dozen rifles pointed in their direction. All of them looked unhurt, except Drax, who seemed to be unconscious and slightly burned, though he was breathing steadily, which is good. Hello, who am I speaking to? Peter says, as the image changes to an elderly Cree man in a nice suit. My name doesn't matter. He says in a tired yet confident tone. I have your men and if you want them back alive, then you'll let us go. Let me talk to the hostages one by one and you have a deal, Peter offers. Of course, they wouldn't be leaving here, unless it's in cuffs, but Peter wouldn't say that. Why must you dash this isn't negotiable? Peter cuts him off. You can listen in on our conversation, but this needs to happen before anything else. The elderly man seemed to think for a moment before nodding his head. Alright, one moment. Muting the tablet while waiting, Peter turns to the Nova commander beside him. Are all of the civilians evacuated? Yes, it's only floor 217 that's currently occupied. He nods. Good. Peter says as he unmutes the tablet and sees a rocket on the other end. Hey, rocket. How's it hanging? Fine, I got these punks right where I want em. He replies in fake confidence. Sure you do. Peter says sarcastically, eliciting a glare from his furry acquaintance. If you admit that you were wrong, I'll help you out. Not gonna happen, you witchy freak. Rocket exclaims in anger. Are you sure? Peter asks as he saw five different rifles pressed up against Rocket's head. Because this looks serious? Yeah, I got this covered. He continues to lie. I am Groot. Groot disagreed from off camera. All right, if you say, so then the deal is off. Peter shrugs as the tablet is instantly turned back toward the aged Cree man. You would leave them to their deaths? He asks in confusion. If my men can't be team players, then what use do they really have? Peter shook his head as Quill started yelling in the background. I was wrong. I'll be a team player. Just get me the hell out of here. He called out. It's a package deal, I'm afraid. Peter says uncaringly. Rocket would have to admit that he's wrong as well. That ain't happening. Rocket yelled sharply. You know what? Peter says as he looks the old man in the eyes. I'll give you 10 minutes. If Rocket changes his mind by our next call, then our deal will be back on. Though please do remember that any physical actions taken against my men will result in the deaths of every Kree in the building, including yourself. Wait, this is not Dash by. Peter ends the call with a wave. Your evil Gamora comments with a smirk. Is it okay to do this? The Nova commander asks worriedly. 
Your companions may not make it out of this alive, they'll be fine. Peter taps his ear. I'm listening in. If things get rough, I'll go down and end this, but until then, Rocket needs to learn how to play with others. Floor 217, just as Peter abruptly ended the call, Quill could be heard berating Rocket. What's wrong with you? Quill shouted angrily. Just tell him that you were wrong. You don't even have to mean it? Rocket simply remained silent and looked forward, ignoring Quill's words completely. What should we do? An armed Kree man asks the elderly leader. I can get him to say whatever you want. A very muscular man with a bald head eyes Rocket with a bloodthirsty grin. Just give me a knife and some cleaning supplies. He'll follow any script we give him after that. No, the hostages are our way out of this. The elderly man shakes his head. We can't afford to anger the Nova Corps. The room goes silent as everyone looked between one another. Sighing to himself, the Kree leader turns to Rocket and looks him in the eyes. Will you do as he wants? He asks. Rocket answers defiantly. All right. The man nods his head as he turns to his subordinates. Set the charges as we initially planned. In the corner of the room sat a long table full of high-tech bombs, which were originally planned to be used for future targets. Are you sure? Someone asks as this plan didn't guarantee their escape. In all likelihood, the majority of them would die, allowing for only a select few to escape among the wreckage. Yeah, just get it done, the nameless leader orders solemnly. Instantly, half of the men and women in the room grab a few explosives each and rush off. Though one of them didn't leave the room and stayed behind to set multiple charges on the support beams. I am Groot. Groot says in dread. Seriously. Quill hisses at Rocket, who continued to remain silent, watching the bombs get placed and armed to blow at any moment. Time ticked by slowly as those who went to place the bombs filled the room once again, finished with their job. Sat at his desk, the elderly leader stared down at a small device with a single black button, which would be used to detonate the many explosives. I think it's been 10 minutes, sir, one of the Cree men says. Should we call Dash? Someone spoke as the tablet on the desk started beeping, indicating an incoming transmission. Hello? The elderly man answers as the room goes deathly quiet. Hello again, Peter says as he stares down at the tablet. Did Rocket change his mind? Of course, Peter already knew the answer, as he was listening in on them the entire time. No, he refuses to do as you say, the man states as he sends an annoyed glare to the stubborn raccoon. So we've decided to change the deal. Allows us free passage out of this situation, and we won't demolish this building into the ground. And how are you planning on accomplishing that? Peter asks. This dash the man says as he reaches to grab the detonator but finds nothing there. You mean this? Peter asks as he held the detonator up to the tablet. Or maybe this. He then turns the tablet around to show a pile of disarmed explosive charges, which he portaled over shortly after they were placed. Of course, the Nova Corps brought their own version of a bomb squad, as they were dealing with terrorists who've been using explosives left and right. So Peter let them do all of the work when it came to disarming. Oh, I forgot these as well, Peter says as he opens a few small portals and reaches his hand through. The first to notice what was happening was Quill, who saw the portals open next to the few remaining bombs in the room. Though just as everyone else began to catch on, Peter had already reached his hand through each portal and snatched the last of the bombs. Hey, disarm these two, Peter orders as he hands off the remaining explosives to a couple of very nervous-looking Nova soldiers. Soon enough, realization dawned on the old Kree leader's face. His hostages were worthless and his backup plan was thwarted before it could even be revealed, leaving him nothing. Bring the hostages forward, he orders, breaking his subordinates from their state of panic. Doing as they're told, the hostages are prodded forward by the barrels of multiple high-tech rifles. Hey! Quit pushing! Quill yells irritably. Rocket remained silent as he was kicked forward. I am Groot. Groot looks at Rocket one last time. ZZZ. Drax remained asleep as he was dragged forward by his arms. Let's start with the tree, the leader says as he pulls a pistol from his desk and aims it at Groot. Exclamation point. Rocket's heartbeat quickened as he stared worriedly at his only friend. Allow us free passage or I'll start killing hostages one by one. The leader threatens as he shows Peter the lineup of guardians. Okay, go ahead. Rocket watched in shock as Peter shrugged uncaringly. The old man seemed to hesitate for a moment, as they would be killing their only leverage, but his gaze soon hardened as he turned the tablet to look Peter in the eyes. Remember, you brought this on yourself, he said as he turned the tablet back to Groot. Alright, execute dash stop. Rocket yells as he thrashes in the hold of multiple Kree men. I admit it. I was wrong. Are you happy now? What were you wrong about? Peter asks through the tablet. Rocket remained quiet for a moment, though the guns trained on Groot got him talking again. I was wrong to go off on my own. You were right about working as a team. Now get us out of here. Although Rocket was frantic at first, now he just seemed very angry with Peter. Was that so hard? Peter asks as the tablet is turned back to the old leader. Do we have a deal? He asks, looking much more relieved. Sure, Peter says as he waves his hand and opens four portals in the air. Instantly, the floor below the captured guardians opened up, dropping them onto the roof in front of Peter. 
Quickly, Peter snapped the portals shut and looked toward the shocked Kree leader, who just lost his last hope of escape. Here's the deal, Peter says as the Guardians pick themselves up off the ground, realizing that they're safe. We won't kill any of you as long as you surrender peacefully, aye. The elderly man was lost for words by this point. I'll give you another 10 minutes to make your decision, Peter says, as he could see the pissed off looks of the people that he just rescued. Choose your next actions wisely. With those final words, Peter ended the call for a second time. You bastard. Quill exclaimed as he charged over to Peter, with everyone following closely behind him. Though Drax, who was still knocked out, was currently being treated by some Nova medics. What? Come to thank me for saving you? Peter asks as Rocket grabs the gun of a Nova soldier and starts firing in his direction. That's not very nice. Peter comments as he sidesteps each laser bolt with ease. Not very nice. Rocket repeats in anger. Groot almost died because of you. Me? Do you actually believe that? Peter asks incredulously. First of all, you were the one who didn't want to take any orders and ran off alone, though I think we can all see where that got you. Secondly, I offered you an easy way out, and you refused to take it until the very end like the stubborn moron you are. Pew pew pew, upon hearing Peter's response, Rocket didn't verbally reply and simply started shooting once again. Of course, Peter continued to dodge each shot with ease. Stand still and take it like a man. Rocket shouted as he kept firing. Okay, I think that's enough, Peter says as he shoots a web and used it to yank the gun from Rocket's hands. Give me that. Rocket jumps toward Peter, but receives a boot to the face, sending him tumbling back to Groot. I don't know why you're all so angry, Peter says as he aims the gun forward and fires at the newly rescued guardians. Pew pew pew. Everyone watched in shock as he shot at his own comrades, though that shock soon grew as the red laser bolt seemed to bounce off of them, leaving Rocket, Groot, and Quill completely unharmed. You weren't in any danger, to begin with, Peter says as the spell he placed on them for protection fades away. I'm alive. Quill muttered as he thought for sure that he was dead. Why you? Rocket stutters in frustration, as he didn't know whether to feel pissed or thankful anymore. I am Groot. Groot says in confusion. While they were arming the bombs, I was able to open a small portal and place a spell for protection on all of you, though it's all used up now so don't go getting yourselves killed. Peter explains as the tension on the rooftop started to simmer down. What was the point of all this? Quill asks in confusion. To teach you a bit of a lesson. None of you are strong enough to be running into dangerous and unknown situations alone, Peter explains his mindset. That orb that you're all dying to get your grubby little hands on is going to bring you far worse opponents than this. You'll need to learn how to work together to overcome them because I won't always be around to save you. They all turn silent, as if their parents just lectured them into the ground. He's right, Gamora nods in agreement. The dangers ahead of us are much deadlier than a group of weak Kree terrorists. Fine, so what's the plan? Rocket sounded a bit hesitant, though he seemed ready to work as a team now. I'm willing to work together, Quill sighs and agrees as well. I am Groot. Groot seemed happy with the outcome of this situation. I'm with you as well. Drax, who managed to wake up in time to hear Peter's little speech, shouted as he shoved the medics away and joined the group. The plan is simple. Peter smirks as the Guardians started to finally come together as a team. If they don't surrender peacefully, we go in and raise some hell, Sadly for the Guardians, who wanted a bit of good old-fashioned revenge against the terrorists that bested them, the Sons of Ronan gave themselves up as soon as Peter called them again. Their elderly leader seemed to have a good head on his shoulders. He realized that Peter wasn't even taking him seriously, to begin with. In fact, they were used as a sort of training tool for the former hostages, as if this was a harmless exercise for new recruits. Though what really helped him make his decision was the portals. If the Nova Corps could open those portals anywhere, then they could be flanked and killed at any moment, making any sort of resistance literally impossible. With nothing else to do, the man chose to surrender in hopes that the Kree Empire would trade for their release. After all, they had to be funded by somebody, and everyone knew that the Kree Empire was forced into the treaty that sparked all of this. Of course, the Kree Empire would never admit to funding a terrorist cell, which would be more than enough to skate away from any responsibility, as the Nova Empire wants to maintain the peace more than anything. This was a good mission, Peter says happily as he watches the Nova Corps drag the sullen sons of Ronan away. For you, maybe? Quill says with a scoff. The rest of us had the pleasure of learning your lesson da. Well, it was an important lesson to learn, don't you think, da? Peter asks as he turns to Gamora. As Gamora nods her head, Rocket speaks up. Yeah, we learned that we're useless and weak. He sounded both annoyed and sullen about the whole situation. Just a bunch of powerless losers. True, Peter agreed with a nod. Hey, you ain't supposed to agree with him. Quill shouts in protest. But you could be great if you work together? Peter clarifies as he continues to watch the terrorists being arrested. I was hoping they would put up a bit more resistance so that you guys could have your first fight together, but I guess I scared them a little too much. There's always next time though. Who are you? The captured terrorist leader asks as he passes Peter on his way to the patrol ships. Just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Peter responds cheerfully with a wave. Question mark. 
The confused man felt that he was being played with as a Nova soldier prodded him forward. So, how did the other locations go? Peter asked as they returned to the Nova Corps headquarters. The rest of the Guardians ran off to get some food, leaving him to finish up the work. Although they asked for him to join them, Peter has always been the type of person to finish his work before anything else. Just as planned? The commander replies readily. I sent more than enough soldiers to deal with them. Sadly, a few of my men didn't make it back, but that's always expected in an operation like this. I'm sorry to hear that. Peter says respectfully as he eyes a short list of names. Are these the highest ranking members that were captured today? Yes, sir. The commander nodded. All right, I'll extract information from them one last time and then leave you to finish the cleanup? Peter says after a moment of thought. That would help us immensely. The commander was very eager for the treasure trove of information that Peter would give him, especially from that elderly Cree, who seemed to be the head man in charge of the Sons of Ronan. Good, let's get it done then. Hours later, after a few hours, Peter finished hypnotizing each high-level terrorist, providing the Nova Corps with far more information than they thought was possible. First, they found all of the remaining bases and individuals related to the Sons of Ronan. Acting quickly, the commander started the hunt as soon as the information was brought to him. Secondly, the Sons of Ronan seemed to be sponsored by quite a few people, including the Kree Empire, though the commander didn't seem all that surprised by that information. As for the other sponsors, there seemed to be a handful of wealthy radical Kree sympathizers on Xanov, sending money whenever they could. One of which was also the Connect who supplied the Sons with explosives. Of course, these people would be quite surprised when the Nova Corps came knocking at their doors. I believe that wraps up everything, Peter says as he stood before the Nova commander. Yes, we can handle the rest from here, he says with a tired yet accomplished look on his face. I want to thank you on behalf of Xana for all that you've done. Without you, we would still be chasing shadows while more of our civilians died in droves. I'm happy to help, Peter says as he shook the man's hand one last time and went on his way. After leaving the Nova Corps headquarters, Peter found the Guardians in what looked like an alien noodle shop, eating and drinking together. Unlike before, they seemed to be a bit more friendly with one another. Rocket was actually talking to everyone without his usual gruffness. Drax looked to be drunk off of some blue alien wine. Quill was still fawning over Gamora, who didn't seem so distant anymore. And lastly, Groot was drinking from a pitcher of amber liquid with a happy look on his face. Either today's lesson was a good one, or they feel more united in their annoyance with me. Peter thought with a shrug. Either way, the outcome was worth it. After watching them for a moment, Peter strolled over and joined them at their table. Spider. Drax shouted drunkenly as he held up his cup of wine. You must try this Sandarian juice. It is splendid. Looking at Quill and Rocket, Peter could instantly tell that they were behind Drax's misconception. You know what? Sure, why not? He shrugged uncaringly and took the cup, downing the entire thing through his mask. It's too tiring to be the responsible one all the time. After a long night out that some among the crew wouldn't remember, everyone awoke on Quill's ship, groggy and extremely hungover. My head? Quill muttered in pain as he regained consciousness on the floor of the ship's bathroom. Pulling himself off of the floor, Quill left the bathroom and found his new friends in a similar state to his own. Drax was puking into a bucket with a dead look in his eyes. Groot seemed to be in a similar state, though instead of throwing up, he was losing a few leaves on his branches as if fall had come early. Rocket was still passed out on the floor in front of Groot, hugging a bottle of booze like a teddy bear. Gamora? She looked completely fine. How come you're not hungover? Quill asks, feeling the dryness in his mouth with every word. I didn't drink last night. Gamora admitted. You're no fun. Quill rolled his eyes as he found a bottle of water and downed it in a matter of seconds. Good morning. Peter shouted as he walked in from the cockpit. Instantly, Quill twitched and covered his ears as Rocket woke with a start, holding his liquor bottle like a weapon. Fascist scum. He screamed as he threw the bottle, which shattered against one of Quill's naughty posters of a naked alien woman. I hope you enjoyed your sleep because we just arrived at Xander. Peter continued to speak loudly, knowing exactly what he was doing. Can you keep it down? Drax asked as he emptied his stomach into the bucket once again. Wait a minute. Quill muttered as he looked at Peter in confusion. You definitely drank last night. I remember you downing a bottle of what looked like battery acid. How are you not like us? Perks of having superpowers? Peter shrugs as everyone glares at him in jealousy. What? Don't look so negative. You should be happy. We're all about to be 100,000 units richer. As Peter says this, both Rocket and Quill seem to turn a complete 180. The hangover symptoms quickly vanished as they rushed into the cockpit, where they saw Planet Xander in the distance. Haha. Ha. We're gonna be rich. Hours after the Guardians left the peaceful planet of Xana behind, a large Chitauri fleet appeared on the horizon. Are you sure they were spotted here? Corvus asks his wife, as they both stare at the peaceful planet below. Yes, my information broker is hardly ever wrong, Proxima sounded very sure of herself. Suddenly, before they could say another word, an image of an orange man in high-level Nova Corps garb was projected before them. Unknown invasion force, you are ordered to turn your army around this instant. 
Any attacks on this peaceful planet will not be taken lightly. The Nova Empire will not stand idly by. My love, look at him, Proxima smirks at the Nova commander. Barking orders like a scared little animal. It's always the weakest that make the most noise? Corvus agreed in distaste. Seeing the lack of fear in the people he was talking to, the commander changed his tactics in hopes of settling this without bloodshed. Why are you here? Now we're talking. Corvus says with a smirk. Your puny planet may make it out of this alive, after all. Get to the point. The commander says impatiently. Maybe not. Corvus muttered as he sent some information over. We have information that these life forms have visited your planet. Give them to us and we will not invade. As the images of Xan of Saviors appeared before him, the commanded eyes widened in shock. You've seen them. Corvus read him like a book. No, they aren't here. The commander shakes his head, only partially lying. Of course, he met them, but they left about ten hours before this invasion fleet arrived. Turn your ships around and leave? His eyes harden as he glares at the children of Thanos. He had a debt to Spider-Man and refused to give him or his friends up so easily. That was the wrong answer, I'm afraid? Corvus shook his head. After he spoke, the Chitauri fleet came to life once again and rushed to the planet below. This is an act of dash the commander screams, but the call was swiftly cut off. I'll kill that one myself. Proxima commented as she grabbed her spear and walked off. Whatever you want, dear. Hurry up and land already. Quill complained as Rocket took the controls and sped into Xander's atmosphere. You don't gotta tell me twice, Rocket replied, matching Quill's energy perfectly. Both of them wore greedy looks as they stared down at the planet, ready to collect their credits. How shameless. Gamora commented from the side. They barely do anything, yet they're ready to take an equal cut. Hey, whose ship do you think ferried all of you to and from Xanov? Quill argued back. Yeah, Rocket agrees. Besides, you didn't do much either. The woman is right. Drax marches over and takes Gamora's side. The woman has a name, Gamora said in annoyance, though Drax didn't seem to notice. We should give our shares to Spider. He did all of the work, Drax said. Hell no. Quill exclaimed as Rocket stood on the pilot's chair beside him. There ain't no way I'm sharing my money with nobody. Rocket denied vehemently. Guys, relax. Peter inputs himself into the conversation. My cut is more than enough. All of you can keep your credits. After all, there are a lot more credits to be made together in the future. Hearing Peter's words, everyone went quiet as they all looked around, feeling uncertain about that possibility. They all may have started to like each other, if only a tiny bit, but that didn't mean they would definitely be sticking around. Reading the atmosphere, Peter knew what they were thinking and could only sigh internally. I'll turn them into a fully-fledged crew soon enough. Welcome back, Spider-Man. Irani Rail welcomed Peter and the Guardians as they landed. You handled my terrorist problems far faster than I thought possible. I aim to please. Peter smiles under his mask. Can we get this show on the road? I got credits to spend. Rocket complains. Ah, yes. Irani nods as she pulls out six thick-looking alien credit cards and passes them out. Since you finished the job far faster than expected, I threw in an extra 50,000 credits as a bonus. Easiest money I've ever made. Quill laughed as Rocket snatched Groot's card and stashed it away with his own. I am Groot. Groot instantly used his roots to bind Rocket. Hey, relax, big guy. Rocket shouts as he tries and fails to break free. I'm only keeping it safe. Last time you had money, you got scammed into buying a jar of piss for a thousand credits. You. Gamora groans in disgust. I am Groot. Groot reluctantly conceded as he released Rocket. You sure picked up an odd group of characters. Irani says to Peter as she watched the small squabble unfold. Yeah, but at least they're interesting. After getting their payment, Peter and the Guardians didn't stick around much longer. Irani Rail watched as they boarded their ship and flew off into the sky, leaving the planet at full speed. After all, Rocket was driving. While Irani was feeling happy with her transaction as she initially doubted the Guardian's success rate, especially since they were all criminals except Peter, a man in a Nova Corps uniform came running in her direction with a distraught look on his face. Ma'am. He yelled in a panic. Question mark. Turning around, Irani wondered what the hell was going on. Ma'am. It's Xanov. The Chitauri have invaded Xanov. He rambled. Instantly, Irani's good mood was turned upside down. I'm rich. Rocket muttered as he stared in awe at the card in his hand. I'm gonna buy a new multi-shot hand cannon. Maybe an energized electron blaster too. I want to upgrade the ship a bit. Quill says as he held his card as well. The brakes on this thing ain't been so good lately. After that, I'll spend the rest on whatever catches my eye. I'll set my funds aside for the war against Thanos and Ronan surviving minions. Drax joins in. Gamora remained silent. Good, but we have to come to a decision now. Peter says as he pulled the orb out of nowhere, catching the eye of everyone around the room. What are we doing about the orb? It was mine, to begin with, so I don't see how everyone else should have a say in this. Quill complains. You took it from some ruins on Morag. The orb never belonged to you in the first place. Gamora counters with a hostile look in her eyes. Yeah, the orb belongs to me and Groot. Rocket throws himself into the argument. We saved your life back on Xander. 
Without us, you would have been off by this witch. You owe us. What? You were only trying to capture me so you can sell me off to Yandu and his ravagers for a quick payday. Quill was starting to get heated, as everyone seemed to have a claim to his property. And you dash Quill turns and locks onto Gamora next. I did take the orb from a ruin. An abandoned ruin on an empty planet. It belonged to no one until I took it. Quill was fed up with everyone's greed. I would like to point out that possession is nine tenths of the law, Peter says as he plays with the orb in his hand. Also, it's ten tenths of the law when you're strong enough to do whatever you want. Quill couldn't help but sigh in frustration, as he didn't see a possibility of getting his orb back anymore. He could argue with everyone else for days and even fight them for it if he had to, but Peter is a different story altogether. Now, since this orb belongs to me dash Peter says as he enjoys the annoyed looks on everyone's faces. That means that I can do whatever I want with it. And I'd be more than happy to share it with my friends. Instantly, everyone's mood seemed to perk up a bit. Just like our last job, we can split the profit six ways. Peter says, knowing that there probably won't be any profit since the orb is completely empty. Though maybe we can scam somebody? After all, it would definitely be a very Guardian's thing to do. I'm fine with an even split. Rocket was the first to agree, as he knew that his claim was fairly weak anyway. I am Groot. Groot agreed as well. I don't care for this orb. Drax shook his head uncaring, detaching himself from this conversation. The only reason he still stuck around was the fact that Gamera's family may come around. Drax wanted nothing more than to kill everyone related to Ronan, and that included Thanos and his children. Of course, Gamora was able to get a pass, but that was only due to her severing all ties with her father. Fine, I'll share my orb. Quill says, feeling like he was screwed over in this situation. But I don't have a buyer anymore. He backed out when he heard about my run-in with the Chitauri. Thanks to his talks with Gamora, Quill learned about the odd alien bug soldiers that attacked him on Morag. That only leaves you. Peter turned to Gamora, who looked extremely reluctant. You must have been offered a crap ton of money to be this hesitant to share. Hearing Peter's assumption, both Quill and Rocket looked toward Gamora with greed shimmering in their eyes. Now that you say it, I do remember her saying she had a buyer. Quill says as he leans in. How much did they offer? That's none of your business? Gamora replies defiantly. Oh, he's right, isn't he? Rocket joins Quill in staring fixedly at Gamora. Just tell us how much it is. It's not like you can take the orb now. Silence fills the room for a moment as Gamora slowly gave in to their demands. Fine. She says as she whispers the price. Nobody else was able to hear her but Peter, and although he knew the price already, he was still surprised to hear such an astronomical number. It is an infinity stone after all. Peter thought to himself. Speak up, come on. Quill prodded her excitedly. Four billion units? Gamora states, shocking everyone. Rocket, who was probably the most money-hungry of them all, dropped his 150,000 credits onto the ground in complete shock. Even Drax, who wasn't interested earlier, couldn't help but feel tempted by such a large amount of money. D did you say a billion with a B? Quill asks in disbelief. Yes. Gamora uttered in frustration. After all, she would be losing most of that money in the six-way split. How the hell did you get a buyer willing to spend that much? Quill jumps to his feet. My broker was only gonna give me a few million and I thought it was the payday of a lifetime. Sounds like he was scamming you, Peter says as Quill's eyes widen in realization. That weasel bastard. He shouts in anger. Once Quill and everyone else calmed down, it was time to figure out where the hell they were going. So, who's the buyer and where are we headed? Peter asks. He calls himself the Collector. He has the largest collection of interstellar fauna, relics, and species in the galaxy. The orb is just another relic for his growing collection. Gamora explains, leaving out the fact that the orb held an infinity stone. Alright, where to? Rocket rushed to the cockpit, ready to make his money. Nowhere? Gamora answers, confusing everyone. What? Where are we going, woman? Don't waste my time. There's money to be made. Rocket starts complaining, like usual. Gamora couldn't help but sigh in frustration. First, she has to share her billions and now she has to deal with this. With their destination known after some explaining from Gamora, Rocket ran off to set the coordinates and fly to his next big payday as quickly as possible. How long until we get there? Peter asks as everyone started separating to either sleep or do what they would normally do. Let me see. Rocket hummed as he took a seat in the cockpit and started hitting random buttons and switches. About six hours, but I can cut that down to four or five. Anyone could see that Rocket was in a hell of a hurry. After all, this is his biggest payout yet. If the Collector actually pays them without any sort of trickery, each member of the Guardians would make over 600 million units each. The money-grubbing raccoon's eyes practically flashed with money signs as he pushed the ship into overdrive. All right, I'm going to take a nap. Peter says as he walked off to his bedroom. Don't get everyone killed while I'm gone. Yeah, whatever. Rocket muttered uncaringly. Beep beep beep, suddenly, just as Peter left, an incoming transmission rung in the cockpit. Looking toward the monitor, Rocket frowned as he saw the Nova Corps insignia on the caller ID. Nope. He refused flatly and swiftly declined the call. 
Rocket went even further to block whoever was calling when they ended up trying a second time. Rocket? Did someone call? Quill asks as he ran over. Nah. Shit. Irani rail cursed as she failed to get in contact with the Guardians. She was sending an army to Xanov in order to combat the Chitauri, but she wanted to hire the Guardians to accompany them. After all, Spider-Man is a one-man army, so having him involved with this would all but guarantee victory. And he would most likely be thrilled to join, as the Avengers already have bad blood with Thanos. But sadly, the Guardians didn't answer her call. Of course, she did get in contact with Jarvis, but she was told that Spider-Man wasn't reachable at the moment. Most likely because he isn't on the planet. She thought in frustration. Right when I need him, he disappears. Ma'am, the ships are ready to go. A well-dressed Nova soldier informs her. Send them out? Irani reluctantly orders. Without Spider-Man, the fight would be harder, but she couldn't hold off any longer. Yes, ma'am. Soon enough, Irani watched from her office balcony, as the sky over the city was filled with large Nova warships. She looked on solemnly as they all rushed off into space, headed for war. Xanov in the burnt and destroyed city of Varus, Proxima Midnight stood over a disheveled and heavily injured orange-skinned man in a Nova Corps uniform. The beautiful city that once matched the capital city of Xander was nothing but a graveyard now. If Peter and the Guardians were shown an image of the wreckage, they wouldn't recognize it whatsoever. Now, tell me what I want, or we'll spread from the city to the rest of your world, bringing nothing but death and destruction in our wake. Proxima glared down at the dying commander with a predatory look in her eyes. The Nova commander was silent for a moment as he battled within himself, though soon enough one side won. T they came to do a job for us, but they left about 10 hours before you arrived. That's all I know, I swear. What a pity. She mutters in distaste as the spear jutted forward, piercing the commander's neck. What a waste of time. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Corvus appeared behind his wife as she flicked her spear, throwing the commander's corpse aside like trash. What is it? She asks hopefully. Take a look at this. Corvus hold up a tablet, which showed the security footage from the Nova Corps headquarters. What about it? Proxima asks as she watched the guardians walking through the halls together. That's right, you weren't there when father learned that his newest lackey was dead. Corvus nods in understanding as he pauses the image and zooms in on Peter. This is the man that killed Ronan the accuser and challenged our father. As she heard this, a big almost horrific smile bloomed on Proxima's face. Good, killing him would please our father very much. Bloodlust emanated from Proxima's entire being. We should call father and let him know dash no. Proxima hurriedly cuts him off. Imagine the surprise on his face when we bring him his latest enemy on a silver platter. Corvus remained silent as Proxima started daydreaming about the smile that would grace her loving father's lips. Let's hurry, we need to find them. Proxima rushes off toward the ship, leaving her husband behind. Corvus stood among the ruins of Varus in uncertainty. As much as he loves his wife, she tends to think irrationally when it came to their father. After a moment of thought, Corvus opted to ignore his wife's words and secretly send a message to his father. Once the brief but informative message was sent, Corvus walked back to his ship while poring over all of the data he stole from the Nova Corps. There we go. Corvus muttered as he found the make, model, and registration number of the ship that the Guardians left in. Hurry up, my love. Proxima yelled impatiently from the large hangar door of their ship. Yes, dear. Earth in his large and messy workshop, Tony Stark could be seen wielding a blowtorch with an Iron Man-style welding helmet. In front of him was a large machine of his making, which would hopefully be capable of producing nanobots, which he would use for many things, like biomedicine, environmentalism, food production, etc. Although all of that was great, Tony was far more excited about the nano version of his Iron Man suit. A full Iron Man suit that would cover his body at a moment's notice. Never again would he have to carry around a suitcase or call for a delivery when a situation occurred. Truly the pinnacle of technology. Once it's done, I can program the nanobots to etch the armor pieces in those runes. Tony thought as he peeked over at the tall stacks of books that Peter gave him. Tony had the distinct urge to cackle like a mad scientist as he thought of the unlimited applications, but, sir, there's a situation. Jarvis spoke from the speakers in the room. What is it? Tony asks as he switches off his blowtorch and pulls up his mask. The Nova Corps called? Jarvis reveals as he explains the conversation that he just had with the Nova Prime. That little crap went off to have to play in space and left me here. Tony complained as he tossed his torch and mask aside. It would seem so, sir. Jarvis didn't agree with his master's language, but he was correct. Thinking to himself for a moment, Tony clicked his tongue as he donned his welder's helmet once again and grasped his torch. Prepare one of the Kree ships, he ordered as he lit his torch and got back to work. We're heading out once my new armor is finished. Tony wouldn't miss out on alien wars and other adventures for much longer. In fact, he might even make his own if he can't find Peter. Yes, sir. Jarvis replied readily. Maybe I'll invite Rhodes and Pepper. Tony thought as he peeked over at all of the other Iron Man models he made, which were locked up behind glass cases. Rhodes did seem like he wanted his own suit. After a nice nap, Peter woke up and used the bathroom before donning his suit and leaving his room. 
As soon as the automatic door swung open, Peter was forced to step aside as Rocket, Quill, and Groot came tumbling through with surprised looks on their faces. What are you doing? Peter asks as they hit the floor and looked up at him, like children who were caught red-handed with their hands in the cookie jar. They were trying to sneak in and peek under your mask while you slept. Gamora snitched on them from the hall. Hey, you wanted to see it too? Quill counters with a betrayed look on his face. Of course, Gamora knew better than to confirm anything and simply kept quiet. Yeah, you lying witch. Rocket yells as he picks himself up and looks at Peter curiously. Just show us already. It can't be that bad. Me and Groot don't got anything against ugly. Just look at Quill. Hey, I'm handsome. Quill protests. Whatever you say. Rocket says unbelievably. Before a fight could break out in his room, Peter threw them all out one by one. Hey, watch the fur. Rocket yelled as he flew out last and landed in Groot's waiting arms. Are we there yet? Peter asks as he follows them out and walked to the cockpit. Everyone instantly sighed in disappointment as Peter changed the subject completely, unwilling to show what's under his mask. Arriving at the cockpit, Peter caught sight of a cloudy space illuminated by bright green and blue colored gases. And in the center of it all was a giant severed head. Freaky, right? Quill asks as he and everyone else joined Peter in the cockpit. Is that a head? Peter pretended to be clueless. It's hard to believe that was a celestial, though it's even weirder that people live inside of it. Oddly enough, the giant head reminded Peter of the journey he went on before meeting the Great Weaver for the first time. At that time, Peter witnessed two colossal figure fighting on a dying world. Every blow they landed on one another shook the planet worse than the strongest earthquake possibly could. They say it's the skull of a fallen god. Gamora briefly explained the lore behind it. The man we're going to meet mines the remains and sells them for a very high price. You, what kind of sick bastards would buy that? Rocket said in disgust. There's all sorts of crazies out there. Quill said in agreement. Whatever, let's just hurry up and land. Just as Peter and the Guardian started their journey toward nowhere, Yondu Yudanta was still on the hunt for Quill and the Orb. Stepping into the broker's shop on Xander followed by a few of his more intimidating crew members, Yondu casually perused the broker's goods. Do you got any other cute little buggers like this one? I like to stick em all in a row on my control console. Yondu asks as he eyes a tiny blue figurine. I can't tell if you're joking or not. The broker spoke nervously. He's being serious. A ravager spoke up from the side. In that case, I can show you. The broker nods as he walks over to the figurine, but he was stopped by Yondu, who stepped in front of him. But first, you're gonna tell me what this orb is, and why everybody cares so damn much about it. Then you're gonna tell me who out there might wanna buy it. Yondu says with a smile as he straightens the broker's suit for him. Sir, the high-end community is a. He says but Yondu interrupts. Havina K.L. Jan Shibek. Yondu started speaking absolute gibberish, which both confused and somehow intimidated the meek broker. T the high-end community is a. He tries to speak, but Yondu continues to make up his own language. It's a tight-knit. Tight-knit. The high-end community is a very tight-knit. Yondu kept acting like a crazy man, making all of his men laugh as they crowded around the shaking broker. I cannot possibly betray the confidentiality of my buyers. The broker had enough and shouted in order to finally get his point across. Whistle Yandu stopped speaking gibberish and whistles, calling his trademark arrow out of its holster. Don't raise your voice at me. Yandu turned seriously in an instant as his arrow hovered inches away from the shivering broker's face. That's disrespectful. And my apologies? The broker looked like he was about to crap his pants. Now, who is this buyer of yours? In the center of the carved out habitable portion of nowhere sat parked a large ship, which belongs to the collector. Inside the ship, the collector himself, Tanalir Tyvan walked through his museum with a scrutinizing eye. Tyvan wore expensive clothes made from the finest silks and furs. His skin was pale, and his white hair stood straight up, defying gravity. Insert picture of the collector here, Karina. Tyvan calls out as he swiped his finger across a nearby table, finding a tiny speck of dust on his glove. Yes, master. A scared-looking pink Krylorian's girl answered readily. Behind her was a big glass display case, where a pale dark elf lay trapped. Your people do have elbows, do they not? The collector asks pointedly. We do, master. Karina answers in confusion. Then use them. I don't have to remind you what happened to the last attendant who disappointed me. Do I? The collector lectures her as he gestures to another display case. Karina fearfully turned around and looked at the collector's previous servant, who looked almost exactly like her. The poor girl was locked up in one of the glass cases, bound and connected to some sort of torture device. Karina shook with crippling fear as she stared at what could be herself if her master deemed it so. Chop chop. Our guests will be here soon. The collector says, snapping the poor girl out of her fearful state. Acting quickly, Corrine grabs a rag and goes back to cleaning the glass cases with much more attention to detail than before. Walking the streets of nowhere, Peter and the Guardians admired the alien metal city before them. Due to the fact that they were currently in a floating celestial skull in the middle of space, the city didn't have any dirt, grass, or stone. It seemed to be completely crafted out of metal, from the floor underneath their feet to the shops and buildings all around them. 
Hundreds of years ago, the Tyvan group sent workers in to mine the organic matter within the skull, the bone, brain tissue, and spinal fluid. All rare resources, which are highly valued in black markets across the galaxy. It's dangerous and illegal work. Gamora explains and she turns to Quill. Suitable only for outlaws? Well, Spider and I come from a planet of outlaws. Billy the Kid, Bonnie and Clyde, and John Stamos, Quill brags with a smirk. Robin Hood, Rambo, Captain Jack Sparrow? Peter continued the list. Oh, I know, Robin Hood. Quill sounded excited that someone could finally relate to him. Who's Rambo and Captain Jack? Is he like Captain Crunch? Peter chuckled as he shook his head. You know what? Once we're done with this, I'll go pick up some movies for you to watch. Rambo and Pirates of the Caribbean is probably a good start. Can we eat McDonald's again too? Quill gave Peter his best puppy dog eyes, though it wasn't cute at all. Fine, just stop looking at me like that. Peter shrugged as his head whipped to the side, and he reached out to grab the hand of a small, raggedy-looking homeless child. Give it back. Holding out his other hand expectantly, Peter waited as the kid reluctantly handed over a black wallet. Here, Peter says as he hands it over to Quill. What the? Quill muttered as he felt his empty pockets and realized what happened. Keep a lookout for pickpockets, Peter reminds everyone as he pulls a bag out of nowhere and hands it to the kid. Here, enjoy. Reluctantly taking the bag, the young thief didn't stick around for long and disappeared into one of the many maze-like alleyways. What did you give him? Gamora asks curiously. Just some food. As the young pickpocket found a safe place to stop after quadruple checking for anyone tailing him, he hesitantly opened the bag with a hopeful yet scared look on his face. On one hand, the oddly dressed man could have been kind and given him something good, but on the other hand, he could have given him trash or something dangerous, like a bomb. Peeking his little head inside, the ragged alien child was shocked to find it full of both food and credits. Ignoring the food for now, which was hard as he hasn't eaten since yesterday, the kid did his best to count the money, but sadly there was just too much of it for him to know for sure. It's not like he went to school or anything. Though he did know one thing, it was a lot of money. After walking the streets for a while, Gamora led Peter and the Guardians to a rundown bar with a lot of shady-looking aliens inside. We have to wait here for the collector's representative to pick us up, she said, as everyone spread out among the bar. Although some of the shady characters tried to pick a fight here and there, the Guardians could easily handle themselves in a place like this. Taking a seat at the bar, Peter looked over the bar's menu, which was written in a language he didn't understand, and ordered himself a drink at random. Sipping his bright green drink, which tasted far better than he thought it would, Peter watched through the window as Gamora and Quill talked outside the bar. They seemed to become fairly intimate as Quill put his Walkman's headphones on Gamora, who seemed pleasantly surprised by the music that played. Soon enough, the two were swaying back and forth in each other's arms, like real lovers. Quill's got some game, I'll give him that. Peter thought as Quill leaned in for the kiss. Well, maybe not. Just as their lips were about to touch, Gamora pulled a knife from her belt and held it against Quill's throat. Maybe next time, bud. Peter thought as he noticed a familiar pink woman entering the bar, taking a seat in the corner. Isn't that the collector's slave girl? A moment later, Gamora came back inside after what appeared to be a bit of an argument. As soon as Karina laid eyes on Gamora, she left her seat and rushed over. Milady Gamora, I'm here to fetch you for my master, she says with a respectful bow. As Karina escorted the guardians to the collector's ship, Peter was wondering what he should do about this pink alien girl. First, he doesn't like slavery, no one does. Second, she kills herself with the power stone in the movie in order to free herself, but sadly for her, the orb is empty this time around. Although her death was tragic, it also freed her from a life of hellish servitude at the hands of a sadistic and cruel master. Now she wouldn't have that opportunity anymore. While Peter was thinking of how to save this poor slave girl, they arrived at the collector's huge ship and were swiftly taken to his museum. I present to you, Tanalir Tyvan, the collector. Karina introduces the man himself as he came strolling in. Oh, my dear Gamora. How wonderful to meet in the flesh. Tyvan leans down to kiss Gamora's hand as his eyes wander around her body. Exclamation point. Quill did not look happy about the way his love interest was greeted. Let's bypass the formalities, Tyvan. We have what we discussed. Gamora felt annoyed at the way he was looking at her, though she wouldn't say anything about it. At least, not until the money was in her hand. Eyeing the group behind Gamora, Tyvan's mood seemed to brighten as he noticed Groot. What is that thing there? He asks with a look of awe and wonder in his eyes. I am Groot. Groot answers as the Collector rushes to his side. I never thought I'd meet a Groot. The Collector poked Groot's body a few times. Sir, you must allow me to pay you now so that I may own your carcass. At the moment of your death, of course? I am Groot. Groot looked to Rocket for advice. Why, so he could turn you into a frickin' chair? Rocket didn't like the idea at all. Is that your pet? Tyvan asks Groot. His what? Rocket exclaims angrily as he reaches for his gun. The Collector laughed as Gamora rushed to Rocket and stopped him from ruining the deal. Tyvan, we have been halfway around the galaxy, retrieving this orb, Gamora says as she got Rocket under control. Very well, then. Let us see what you brought. 
The collector acted as if his fun was taken away. Gamora looks to Peter, who pulled the orb out of thin air and tossed it over to the collector, who scrambled to grab it out of the air. This is a priceless treasure. Do not throw it around like a child's plaything. Tyvan turned serious as he held the orb like a loving mother would hold her baby. It's empty anyway, Peter thought with a shrug. As the collector put the orb into a device, which started unlocking it before everyone's eyes, he goes into a very dramatic explanation. Oh, my new friends. Before creation itself, there were six singularities and then the universe exploded into existence. He tells them all about the Infinity Stones and their beginning. Dude, every sketchy bad guy I've ever met explains stuff like this, Quill whispers to Peter. You're telling me. Peter has dealt with dramatic villains like this more times than he can count. Alongside Tyvan's detailed explanation of the Infinity Stones, he also showed them a video of giant beings, who use the Infinity Stones as weapons. These carriers can use the stones to mow down entire civilizations like wheat in a field. The collector explains as the video ends with a giant planet covering explosion. There's a little pee coming out of me right now, Quill comments half-jokingly. Ignoring the snide comment, the collector turned to the orb, which was finally unlocked and slowly opened, revealing. Question mark. Tyvan stared in confusion as he found absolutely nothing inside the orb. That was anticlimactic? Peter mutters. Instantly, Tyvan turned to the guardians with a suspicious glare, though they all looked just as confused as him. After all, none of them but Gamora knew that the stone was inside the orb. They didn't even know that it could open. What's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of this? The collector looked pissed, like a spoiled child who opened his Christmas present and found nothing but an empty box. Question mark. Gamora was stunned into silence. How the hell are we supposed to know? Quill comes to her rescue. You asked for this orb and we brought it. Now, pay up. Hearing Quill's demanding tone, Tyvan looked furious as he reached into his pocket and pressed a bottom. In an instant, the ceiling opened up and countless blaster turrets descended into the museum, each of them taking aim at the guardians. I agreed to pay for the contents of the orb, not the orb itself. The collector says as he glares at the group menacingly. Now, which of you insignificant little bugs is greedy enough to think that you can trick me? Watching the group suspiciously, Tyvan began to wonder if it was only one of them that tried to cross him, or if all of the guardians were involved. Meanwhile, poor Karina was cowing in the corner, shaking like leaf. As the guardians stared down certain death, each of them could only think of one person. In tandem, each of them turned to look at Peter in suspicion. After all, he was the one that took possession of the orb blast, unless the Nova Corps somehow swiped it beforehand, which was unlikely. Don't look at me. Peter lies with a shrug. I didn't even know the thing could open. Seeing every suspect turn to the masked man in red and blue, the collector made a motion with his hand, directing the majority of the turrets toward Peter. Where is my infinity stone? Tyvan asked threateningly. I don't know. Have you checked that bird's nest on your head? Peter answers uncaringly and without an ounce of fear. This may be a good opportunity for them to learn how to fight together. Wrong answer. The collect says as the turrets all fire at Peter, ripping him into shreds. Everyone watched in shock as the strongest member of their crew was turned into Swiss cheese and collapsed onto the ground in a puddle of his own blood. Karina, dear. Tyvan runs a hand through his hair as he turns to his pink slave girl. Clean up this mess and make an appointment with my stylist. I'm having second thoughts about my hair. Maybe something shorter would be better. Why yes, master. She stutters in fear as she rushes off to get the proper supplies. Spider. Drax was the first of the guardians to react as he drew his blades and rushed forward. Wait, Drax. Gamora exclaims as she tries to stop him. Bastard. Quill broke from his shock as he pulled his blaster and started firing at the turrets, hoping to give Drax some cover as he goes for the attack. Meanwhile, Rocket watched on before scrambling toward the door. I am Groot. Groot shouts as his roots grew and tangled themselves around his longtime friend's ankles. Groot. Let me go, right now. Rocket reprimanded his tree companion as he was pulled backward. We need to get the hell out of here, you brainless moron. I am Groot. Groot pulls Rocket up to his eye level and says decisively. After a brief staring contest, Rocket was released and crashed onto the floor headfirst. Fine, stay here and die for all I care. Rocket huffs as he looked over his shoulder one last time before rushing out of the room on all fours, leaving his friends behind. Ag. Drax let out a loud war cry as he rushed forward. Fool. The collector commented as the turrets shifted toward Drax. No. Gamora gave up on stopping Drax and pulls out a handful of throwing knives, joining Quill in destroying as many turrets as they could. Pew pew pew, a slash n, PewDiePie lol, as the turrets locked onto Drax, they instantly let loose a hundred lasers in a single second. Just as everyone thought another person would be joining Peter in the afterlife, countless brown tree roots swiftly crept their way across the metal floor before shooting upwards, interweaving with one another and creating a thick wooden shield for Drax. I am Groot. Groot shouted as his roots took all the damage. Haha. <laughs> Drax laughed as he was saved. This dumb tree is my ally. Hearing that unneeded insult, Groot grunted as his roots began to burn, catching fire from the hundreds of lasers that he just endured. Ra. 
Gamora roared as she kicked off Drax's shoulder and leaped over the burning root barrier. And this green hoe is as well? Drax exclaimed happily as Gamora expertly threw one of her larger knives in the collector's direction. Hey, don't call her that. Quill reprimands Drax as he ran to the edge of Groot's barrier and fired a few shots at Tyvan as well. As the knife and blaster shots were only inches away from the collector's body, a blue force field lit up, deflecting all attacks easily. Your efforts are useless dash, just as he was about to continue to taunt the guardians, Tyvan caught sight of Groot's fire spreading to one of his bookshelves, igniting it fairly quickly. How dare you ruin my collection? Is he always like this? A voice asks, scaring Karina as she cowered behind one of the doors with cleaning supplies still in hand. Turning around quickly, the poor slave girl came face to face with a ghost. Why you're dead? She stuttered in fright as Peter waved at her disarmingly. Nah, just a little sleight of hand, see, Peter says as he points to where his corpse once was. H how? Karina asks in shock as she turned to see a clean and empty floor, where a mangled body once lay. Just a bit of magic, Peter says as he gives her a magician's bow. The reality stone is really useful for times like this, are you not going to help your friends? She asks hesitantly. Are you not going to help your master? Peter counters with a question of his own. No, she admits, hoping that Tyvan would die in this encounter. Same, though I think that we both have a different reason for that. Peter says knowingly. See can they win? Karina asks nervously. Sure, as long as they work together. Peter says as they watched Groot save Drax's life. So, why do you want your master dead so badly? He's horrible. Karina went into detail about all the abuse she and the Collector's former slaves were put through. It seemed like the Collector's is an extremely sadistic psychopath. Not only did he torture his slave woman in all sorts of horrid ways, but there was a reason why each of them was of Krylorian's descent. The rich pervert had a thing for torturing and assaulting beautiful pink-skinned women, which only made Peter even more clear on what had to happen. Especially after the poor slave girl started bawling her eyes out in front of him. I see. He muttered as this whole conversation just became extremely serious. How would you like to set yourself free? Why can't that idiot just listen to me? Rocket muttered under his breath as he marched through the halls of the ship, looking for the exit. Sentimental overgrown houseplant. As he grew closer and closer to the exit, Rocket's hushed insults for his friend began to disappear, and his speed seemed to slow. Soon enough, Rocket stood frozen at the exit as his tiny raccoon hands gripped into fists and his jaw clenched shut in frustration. F this. How dare you ruin my collection? Tyvan screamed in furious anger. Never has anyone dared to enter the collector's museum and even so much as touch one of his pieces, let alone set a whole shelf of priceless tomes on fire. I am Groot. Groot groaned in pain, the fire started spreading from his roots and toward his body. Ignoring the screaming manchild, Drax rushed to Groot's side and used his blades to sever the burning roots, saving the tree's life in return. Now we're even, my dash before Drax could say another word, Groot toppled onto the floor and remained unmoving. Although he was saved from the fire spreading to his main body, Groot was still extremely dried out and exhausted from the whole experience. He would need a lot of water and rest in order to recover, or else Groot would continue to dry out completely and die. Groot. A shocked voice muttered from the nearby doorway. Heads turned to see a devastated raccoon standing there with a large cannon-like alien blaster in hand. Just in time for his arrival, the root barrier that shielded the guardians crumbled into a pile of flaming ash and twigs, revealing the man behind all of this. You! Rocket exclaimed as he marched into the room with his weapon pulsing menacingly. You killed my friend? What a shame that his carcass has been damaged. The collectors lamented as he did his best to ignore his burning tomes. It isn't good enough to be put on display in my museum anymore, but perhaps I can mount his head in my bathroom? Arg! Rocket screamed in rage as he charged up his cannon-like weapon and fired. Boom, as he pulled the trigger, Rocket was blown backward by the recoil as a giant basketball-sized body of energy soared across the room. Just like before, the collector's barrier appeared, saving his life, though it couldn't absorb all of the impact. Ugh. Tyvan grunted as he was thrown across the room by the force of it. Master. Karina burst through the doors and rushed over to the collector's side. Slap. Don't touch me. Tyvan exclaimed as he picked himself up and backhanded the poor slave girl across the face, sending her falling to her knees. Disgusting filth. Turning to the group of guardians, who were surprised to see him still alive after all of that, the collector smirked evilly as every remaining turret shifted into place once again. This has gone on long enough, the collector says as an unnoticed figure rises to its feet behind him. First, you try to rip me off, and then you destroy my dash shink, as Tyvan spoke, a long knife melted through his force field and pierced into the back of his head, poking out of his eyeball. A shocked look froze on the collector's face as the life drained from his body and he fell to the floor, dead. Aye aye. Karina stuttered in disbelief as she gripped the bloody knife, which was just in her master's head only a second ago. You did a good job, Karina. Peter comforted her as he walked into the room and took the knife from the petrified girl's hand. He deserved far worse than that. You're free now. Karina stared down at her former master for a moment before turning her gaze back to Peter. I'm free. Yes, congratulations. 
No one can hurt you anymore, Peter as he waves to the guardians. Hey, guys. Before any of them could voice their feelings about Peter's fake death, a loud southern voice echoed across the ship. Quill. Where are you, boy? Quill. Where are you, boy? A loud southern drawl echoes through the ship. Oh, crap. Quill mutters as he rushes to the door and locks it shut before destroying the control panel with a few blasts of his pistol. Groot. Rocket exclaims as he rushes over to his fallen friend. Let me have a look, Peter says as he walks over. Putting out the fire and smoke in the room with a wave of his hand, Peter stood above Groot and casts a quick spell on him. Don't touch him. Rocket yells as he turns his gun on Peter. He's alive, relax, Peter says as he opens a small portal above Groot's dry open mouth. Instantly, fresh spring water from Earth pours out of the quarter-sized portal and quickly fills Groot's mouth, forcing him to swallow. Before Rocket's very eyes, Groot's dried out body slowly but surely started to rejuvenate. He's dehydrated and exhausted, Peter explains as he ruffles the fur on Rocket's head. After a good night's rest and some watering, he'll be back to normal? After explaining everything, Peter opened a portal under Groot, sending him falling into his bedroom back on the ship. Quill. Yondus yelled as he banged on the locked door a few times. I know you're in there. Don't you move, boy. I'm coming for you. Okay, now is a great time for one of your portals, Spider. Quill rushed up to Peter and practically begged. What? You don't want to introduce us to your Ravager Space Daddy? Peter asks jokingly. He is not my dash boom. Suddenly, the door was blown open and a blue-skinned man with a flat red metallic mohawk came strolling in. Daddy's home. Yondu made his entrance as his eyes locked onto Quill. What a coincidence to see you here. Hey, Yondu. Quill waves awkwardly as about 30 Ravagers came pouring into the room. You betrayed me. Try to steal my money. Yondu exclaims as he points a blue finger Quill's way. When I picked you up as a kid, these boys wanted to eat you. They ain't never tasted Terran before. I saved your life. That seemed to be the last straw for Quill, as his awkward demeanor vanishes and is replaced with furious anger. Oh, will you shut the hell up about that? God. For 20 years you've been throwing that in my face, like it's some great thing not eating me. Normal people don't even think about eating someone else. Much less, that person having to be grateful for it. You abducted me, man. You stole me from my home and my family, Quill ranted. You don't give a damn about your Terra. You're just a scared, soft little boy. Yandu shouts as he marches toward Quill with his man at his back. You can't even begin to understand the good I've done for you. You're only alive today because of me, eaten or not. I raised you into the man you are today, and you spit in my face. Exclamation point. The time for words came to an end, as Quill pulled back his fist and clocked Yandu square in the face. Just as the surrounding Ravagers were about to pounce on Quill, a golden dome-shaped barrier blocked their path. This is a fight between father and son, Peter says as he walked up with the Guardians and Karina at his back. Let them solve it on their own, are you sure this is a good idea? Gamora asked worriedly as she watched Quill take an elbow to the face. Yeah, I'm getting some pretty heavy daddy issue vibes from this, Peter explained. He knew that Yondu cared for Quill in his own way, so the two of them would have to settle their differences and now seemed like the perfect opportunity to do just that. While Yondu and Quill were slugging it out, a few Ravagers, who didn't look happy about the situation, tried to attack Peter and the barrier, but, ugh, arg, ah. Each time someone stepped out of line, Peter sent them tumbling through a pair of portals, leaving them screaming as they fell infinitely at the back of the room for all to see. When both sides calmed down, the fun could finally start. Taking bets. Peter shouts like an expert bookie. Odds are 2 to 1 in Yandu Yudanta's favor. Place your bets with me and hand your credits to my furry friend here. That seemed to liven up the mood as a bunch of Ravagers rushed up to bet on their captain. Of course, Rocket was more than happy to take their money. 300 credits on captain. 1000 credits on Yandu. 50 credits. 2000 credits on Quill. One of the Ravagers said in a hushed tone, though everyone seemed to hear it. Every Ravager turned to him with betrayed looks on their faces. What? If he wins then I double my money, inside the barrier you took me from my home. Quill exclaimed as he kicked Yandu in the stomach. I showed you the universe, you ingrate. Yandu countered as he dipped past a punch and elbowed Quill in the ribs. I'm sorry that I'm not grateful for being kidnapped. Quill rebutted with a fist to the face. I saved you, boy. Yandu roared as he missed a punch and took a knee to the stomach. Save me from what? A loving family? Quill asked as he knocked his opponent on his back and follows after him, sending hammer punches to his face in the process. Whistle, Yandu shielded his face with his arms as he let out a loud whistle, which caused his yaka arrow to shoot out of its holster and rest on Quill's neck. You didn't have a family. Your mommy died and I took you in. Yandu says as Quill froze in place. Don't you talk about her? Quill says threateningly, as if he was the one with an arrow to Yandu's neck. Face it, kid. I saved you from a mediocre life on some mediocre world. Yandu smirked as he looked up at Quill tauntingly. Hell, I might as well be your daddy. Exclamation point. Quill didn't take too kindly to that statement as he went to attack once again. Whistle, I don't think so. 
Yandu smirk widens as the arrow at Quill's throat presses forward slightly, breaking his skin open. I already won, boy. Give up. Sadly, that isn't the case, Peter says from the other side of the barrier, confusing the Ravagers who were celebrating their win. This was a fist fight, not an arrow fight. Quill takes the win by default. As Peter says this, the arrow vanished from Quill's neck, shocking Yandu and his Ravagers. I won. The sole Ravager that bet on Quill exclaimed in victory as he collected his winnings from Rocket, who reluctantly handed it over. What the hell is going on? Yandu stood up alongside Quill and seemed to finally notice the barrier around them. Where's my arrow? That would be my friend's doing, Quill says as the barrier surrounding them disappeared. He's a magician. Well, tell him to work his voodoo and hand over my arrow, Yandu says threateningly as the Ravagers circle around Peter and the Guardians. Sure, but first let's come to an understanding. Peter says as he snaps his fingers and conjures a long table with chairs and took a seat. Every Ravager including Yandu were shocked as the table appeared. After all, a barrier could be explained through technology, but this was just crazy. Everyone take a seat, Peter says as he turns to the Ravagers. Except you grunts. Feel free to wait outside the door while we talk. They ain't going anywhere, Yandu says as he took a seat at the head of the table. Without uttering another word, Peter gestured to the few Ravagers at the back of the room, who were still falling through the portals. They weren't even conscious anymore. Why you know, boss. We'll wait for you outside, one of the Ravagers says as he and the rest rush out of the door in fear. Yandu didn't know how to handle the situation anymore. His men were scared shitless, and he didn't even have his Yaka arrow anymore. What do you want? Yandu asks, knowing that he wasn't the one calling the shots anymore. It's good that you understand the situation, Peter says with a nod. Since a member of my crew wronged you, we will come to an agreement for compensation. Your crew? Quill shouts incredulously. Whose ship have you been staying in rent-free? I'd say the 150,000 credits I brought you was more than enough to make up for that, Peter says as he turns to Quill. But if you'd like the captain position, then we can decide it like warriors? Quill fell silent as he turned his head away. Even Rocket, who wanted to weasel his way into being the captain, didn't say a word after that. For billion credits? Yandu states plainly. What? Quill and Rocket jumped out of their seats in disbelief. You greedy mother dash that orb you stole from me is worth 4 billion, and I won't take a unit less. Yandu enjoyed the look on Quill's face. The orb was empty, so it wasn't actually worth that. Peter says as he gestures to the corpse of the collector. As you can see, he refused to pay. Yandu didn't look happy after hearing that. But, since you're my first mate's daddy dash stop saying that. Quill shouted in distaste. I can offer you a few things. Wait, did he say first mate? Quill asks, though everyone ignores him. Well, Yandu hurries Peter along. First, we can give you a small cut of what we take from the collector. Peter says as he motions to the surrounding museum. There's probably a vault in here somewhere as well. What else? He asks in interest. Second, you could become a member of our crew dash what? No, not happening. Quill immediately shouted, though Peter continued to ignore him. We split everything equally, so your cut of the collector's stuff would be much larger. Peter explains, hoping to recruit Yandu. He's one of the cooler characters in the MCU. Hehe, <laughs> I like you. Yandu laughs at Quill as he leans back in his chair. Though, I don't know if I could be in the same crew as a traitor. Good, don't. Quill said in relief. Don't try to play me, Yandu. Peter says with a smirk under his mask. I looked you up, and I know all about your little kidnapping spree. It even got you exiled, didn't it? Ravagers don't traffic children. It's against the code, right? Question mark. Quill never heard that part of the code before. Why would he kidnap me then? The money was good. What's your point? Yandu asks. Why didn't Quill get to his destination? Peter asks, knowing the answer already. In 1988, Yandu was hired by Ego, Quill's celestial father, to travel to Missouri on Earth and kidnap Quill. Aware that the other children he had delivered had been murdered, Yandu chose to keep Quill and raised him to be a ravager. You took a liking to him, didn't you? Peter asks as he leans forward tauntingly. He wasn't like the other snot-nosed brats you picked up. You saw potential in him and decided to raise him like your son instead of sending him to his death. Yandu practically jumped out of his skin as he heard that. How do you know that? Everyone watch in silent shock, especially Quill who was learning a bit more about his origins. It's not hard to see that every child you took never appeared again, Peter says as he looks Yandu in the eyes. But you wouldn't let that happen to Quill, would you? He would be your son. A ravager through and through. Fine, you're right, Yandu admits, shocking Quill even further. But that don't mean he still ain't a traitor. Who were you supposed to bring me to? Quill asks, curious to know who was killing all those children. You know what? Forget this. Yandu gets up and walks to the door. How odd. A ravager leaving without his payment. Gamora speaks up in confusion. If you leave, you're saying goodbye to the biggest score of your life. Peter calls out, stopping Yandu in his tracks. Trust me, this guy was loaded. I wouldn't be surprised if he has tripled the amount of credits he offered on this ship alone. Silence filled the room as Yandu seemed to battle within himself. 
After all, a billion credits is a hard thing to turn down. Fine, I'll join your crew, but keep that little traitor away from me. What the hell did you do? Quill started screaming his complaints as soon as Yandu left the room. Do you have any idea the shitstorm you just brought on us? He will ruin everything. How could you think that this is a good idea? Waiting until Quill finished ranting, Peter finally found a chance to speak. I think it's a great idea for him to join, especially since I actually believe that he cares for you. Peter says, as he watched Quill stare at him as if he were mentally unsound. What could have possibly given you that idea? He asks incredulously. As I said earlier, I looked Yandu and his Ravager clan up. When the other Ravager clans found out that your blue daddy broke the code dash ug. Please, stop. Quill hates hearing that. By trafficking children, they exiled him and his clan. Then he went and picked you up on earth for whatever reason, Peter explains as he places a hand on Quill's shoulder. Why do you think he chose not to deliver you as planned? Because he's a sick freak with an unhealthy obsession? Rocket answered for him, though Quill certainly appreciated the backup. No, because he didn't want you to die. You were probably like the son he never had, and chose to raise you instead of sending you to die. Peter explains clearly for Quill. I'm not saying that he isn't an asshole for what he did, but at the end of the day, I truly think that he cares about you. But does he have to join us? Quill whined like a child. Can't we just go our separate ways? He can even keep my portion of the job's pay as long as he's gone. Seriously? You would give him billions of credits just to go away? Peter asks as Rocket pulls out his gun again. Give me your share and I'll blow his head off for you right now. Rocket was ready to double his share in an instant. No, nobody is blowing anyone's head off. Peter sighs in exasperation. Yandu has already joined the crew, so there's no changing that. What about his crew? Gamora brings up a slight problem. Are we taking in his whole clan as well? Maybe, Peter says uncertainly. My ship isn't big enough to hold everyone, Quill states. Well, I was thinking we could use an upgrade anyway, Peter says as he gestures around them. It's a bit big, Drax says in distaste. That's true, Peter agreed as he thought for a moment. A smaller ship helps bring everyone together. If we switch to a huge one like this, it'll ruin the feeling, Looking toward Karina, who was standing at his side like an attentive servant, Peter spoke up. Does your old master have any other ships? It's like heaven. Rocket muttered as they were shown to the ship's hangar, where around 15 other ships were parked. This one could work, Peter says as they toured the ships. In front of them was a fully blacked out Benatar class ship, just like the second ship that the Guardians use in the movies, though it was a bit different. First, it was about double the size of a normal Benatar M class ship, giving the Guardians more than enough room in case Yandu plans to take his Ravagers along with them. Second, the whole thing was extremely high-tech and lavish, making it obvious that the Collector had it upgraded to a crazy degree. What about the other ships? Rocket asks as he sees nothing but credits when he looks around the hangar. We could sell them, Gamora replies. While the Guardians were figuring out the logistics, Peter followed Karina through the ship toward the Collector's vault. Have you ever been in here? Peter asks as they arrived at a giant metal door, which was locked shut with multiple forms of security. No, Master never allowed anyone to access, Karina replies dutifully. Well, he's dead now, so let's check it out, shall we? Peter says as he waves his hand. Before Karina's shocked eyes, the vault door transformed into a much smaller normal door, which Peter opened with ease. Following him inside, Karina stared in awe at the contents of the vault. In the center of the room, a giant pile of credits was stacked high up to the ceiling, which was definitely more than 4 billion as Peter thought. What is this? Peter asks as he found many sealed containers of odd-colored liquids and what appeared to be white dust. That's what was collected from the mines, Karina explains. Oh, Peter muttered in realization. It's blood, bone, brain tissue, and spinal fluid. As Peter eyed the containers filled to the brim with celestial body parts, he suddenly had an idea. What would happen if I made the resurrection elixir with celestial ingredients? Peter wondered. After a moment of thought, Peter opened a portal under the containers and sent them to Earth, where he would research them later on. Karina's worship of Peter seemed to only grow as he continued to show his awe-inspiring abilities. You're amazing, master. Karina mutters as she covered her mouth, realizing what she just said. Peter immediately felt something awaken in him. After all, a beautiful pink alien slave girl just called him master. It's every corn addict's wet dream, Peter thought jokingly. Quickly getting himself under control while also planning to visit MJ to relieve some stress later on, Peter turned to Karina with a stern look. Karina, you have no master anymore, Peter makes things clear. Although I'm flattered, you should learn to live your life normally from now on, why yes, sir. Karina stuttered as she looked down at the ground like a scolded child. Good, now let's go back, Peter says as he empties the vault and strolls out, with Karina following closely behind. When Peter returned to the hangar, the Guardians were taking pictures of the other ships. What are you guys doing? Peter asks curiously. We're posting these ships online. We already sold two of them while you were gone, Quill explains as he pointed to two of the ships. Nice, I have all of the credits, but it's far more than I can count at the moment, Peter says as he walks over to their new ship. 
I'll dump them in the ship for now. After leaving a huge pile of credits in a locked room of their new ship, Peter followed Karina to the museum, hoping to find something interesting. Everything else would either be sold, left behind, or destroyed based on how dangerous the items are. Who's that? Peter asks as he was led to a room with a sleeping dark elf and what appeared to be Karina's twin in some sort of torture device. The collector's former slave, she explains without using the word master this time. I see. Peter nods as he waves his hand, releasing the poor girl in an instant. She didn't seem to fully understand what was happening as she sat there with a dumb look on her face. Once Karina explained what was happened to her, the poor traumatized girl broke down crying as she thanked Peter over and over again. It's no problem. You're free now, just like Karina, Peter says warmly as he looks around the museum. Would either of you know about anything interesting in this place? Following the two former slaves, Peter was shocked at the amount of weird and overpowered objects in this museum. Biogram image, creates a controllable image of the wielder while hiding his real location. Birthstones, can summon a vulture of Nepenthe, whose claws are allegedly electrified. Boxers, rectangular interdimensional traps that can weaken a victim's strength and sanity. Coats of Hercules, animated animal hides that engulf their targets totally, cutting off their oxygen supply enough to render them unconscious. Etherion armor, an armored battlesuit made of the alien metal Etherion, which amplifies the wearer's strength to superhuman levels, and it has jets that permit flight. Tony would like this. Peter muttered. Durgosian gun, a large artillery weapon fires pellets that freeze the surroundings upon impact. Cosmic Viewer, a mirror that can be used to monitor events on various worlds. That could be useful, Peter thought. Electrified Comb, a comb that produced a low level of electricity, which allows it to stay attached to anyone touching it. That's extremely useless, Peter muttered as he moved on. Incendiary Capsules, grenades that burst into flames a few seconds after being discarded. Chameleon Flute, can translate any language. I haven't really had to worry much about language barriers yet. Peter chalked it up to being in a comic book slash movie world, which was originally made in English. Magic beans, seeds that can conjure up warrior giants. Obedience potion, an elixir that compels the drinker to do the supplier's bidding, though it wears off over time. I need to keep this out of the wrong hands. Peter wondered whether he should destroy the potion. Philosopher's stone, a legendary alchemical substance capable of turning base metals into gold. It is also capable of creating the elixir of life that provides the user a semi-immortality. The drinker wouldn't age and be immune to all sickness, but getting killed by other means was always possible. Damn. Peter stared in awe at the stone before quickly stashing it away. I'll play with that later. Shockwave Gong, a gong that sends out a shockwave against enemies when struck. The poison, the most powerful poison in the known universe. I wonder if this would work on Thanos? Peter wondered as he carefully stashed away the vial. Tibetan Crystal Balls, crystal balls that emit mystical rays. Vampire Stones, when hit together, can summon or banish a swarm of vampires. Vampires exist? Peter hasn't seen a single one yet. Maybe they're aliens? The Collector also had zoos of alien beasts, like one snake, which Peter stayed far away from and even contemplated killing. Snake Eyes, an enormous alien serpent with hypnotic powers. Though, there were two objects in the collection that Peter was extremely tempted to use. Ali Baba's Lamp, a lamp that can summon a four-headed jinn with mystical powers. Ali Baba's Flying Carpet, a Persian flying carpet, which could morph into a cape for personal use. Obviously, one of these things is far more appealing than the other. Ali Baba's Lamp. Peter stared at the Persian-style lamp with greedy eyes. Has the collector used this lamp yet? No, he was incapable of summoning the jinn. The newly freed Krylorian spoke up. He toiled over that lamp for a year before giving up. Maybe it needs a magical nudge? Peter thought as he was tempted to experiment on the lamp. Genies or jinns are supernatural creatures from pre-Islamic and Islamic mythology. They are associated with shape-shifting, possession, and madness. In later Western popular representations, they became associated with wish-granting and often live in magic lamps or bottles. This could be dangerous, Peter thought as he quickly stashed the lamp and carpet away. On one hand, he could get three wishes and that would be amazing. On the other hand, the whole idea of granting wishes could be a lie, and releasing the jinn could bring about some sort of untold calamity. I need to talk to the Ancient One. While Peter was carefully looking through the Collector's Museum, making sure to take what he wanted and destroy anything that could cause problems in the future, the Guardians finished up posting the extra ships for sale and headed out to the bar to unwind. So, can we pick up where we left off? Quill took Gamora into his arms as they stood outside the same bar once again. I know who you are, Peter Quill. And I am not some starry-eyed waif here to succumb to your pelvic sorcery. She refused him harshly. Reaching up, Gamora pushes his face away before it could get too close and strutted into the bar. Quill's head snaps to her swaying hips. Damn. She's gotta be doing that on purpose dash, just as Quill was enjoying the view, a furry figure flew past Gamora as a commotion started in the bar. Whoa. Whoa. What are you doing? Quill rushed in to see what was happening. This vermin had a few drinks and started picking fights with my boys. Yandu spoke up from the bar. 
Seconds after speaking, his many Ravager subordinates stood up from their seats and drew their weapons. Ain't we supposed to be on the same side here? Yandu asks as Rocket pulls out his gun and aims it in his direction. That is true. Rocket shouts drunkenly as he swayed on his feet. He has no respect. Yandu continued while leisurely enjoying his drink. That is also true. Rocket yelled as Drax stood beside him with his blades drawn, ready to fight if needed. Hold on. Hold on. Quill stood between the bloodthirsty Ravagers and his drunken friend. Meanwhile, poor Karina and her lookalike were hiding in the corner, regretting accepting the invitation to join the Guardians for a drink. Keep calling me vermin, tough guy. You just wanna laugh at me like everyone else. Rocket waved his gun around, scaring a few of the regulars who were watching the spectacle. Rocket, you're drunk. Alright? Quill says as he slowly steps forward to take the gun for him. No one's laughing at you. He thinks I'm some stupid thing. He does. Well, I didn't ask to get made. I didn't ask to be torn apart, and put back together, over and over, and turned into some, some little monster. Rocket broke down as he recalled some bad memories. Rocket, no one's calling you a monster. Gamora spoke from the side. He called me vermin. They called me rodent. Let's see if you can laugh after five or six good shots to your damn face. As Rocket went to wave his gun around again, Quill rushes forward and ripped it out of his hands. Just as everyone let out a calming breath, suddenly, the loud and powerful engines of a large spacecraft shook the building, confusing everyone inside. What the dash Quill muttered as he peeked out of the windows and found a fleet of Chitauri ships entering the mouth of nowhere. Even those on the streets outside were rushing back to their homes and ships, hoping to avoid the well-known planet-culling army. Gamora! He yelled nervously. Rushing up to Quill with the rest of the bar following closely behind, Gamora saw some very familiar ships getting closer and closer. We need to leave, now. Why? What's so scary Dash Yandu spoke casually as he strolled up and caught sight of the incoming army. Back to the ship? Instantly, everyone rushed out of the bar, just in time for the Chitauri riders to pour out of the ships and rush to the defenseless city with their weapons drawn. Ah. Uh, Agar. No, please Dash Gamora and the Guardians did their best to ignore the dying screams of the unsavory civilians of nowhere as they hurriedly rushed back to the collector's ship. Watch out. Quill shouted as he drew his pistol and fired a few inches above Gamora, who was about to be beheaded by a Chitauri soldier on a hover bike. Luckily, his aim was perfect as the soldier took an energy bolt to the face and crashed into one of the many bars in the city. Boom, whistle, Quill. Yandu yelled as an arrow came shooting his way. I knew it. Quill froze as the arrow whizzed past his ear and tore through five different Chitauri soldiers behind him before returning to Yandu's holster. Get moving, you idiot. Yandu said as he pushed Quill forward. Why yeah? Quill stuttered as he rushed to catch up to everyone else, with Yandu at his back. As the group of guardians and ravagers ran through the city, defending themselves from the invading army, they could hear and see that everyone else in the city wasn't faring so well. Of course, they wouldn't rush to save these people, especially when their lives were on the line. When they finally caught sight of the collector's ship in the distance, the guardian sighed in relief, though it might have been too early for them to relax. Hello, sister. A voice spoke. Gamora froze as Corvus Glaive dropped in front of their path with a spear in hand. See Corvus. Gamora spoke nervously, still refusing to call him family. Just as the guardians were looking to turn back and run, another voice appeared from behind. Why so scared, sister? Proxima Midnight dropped behind the group with a sword hung at her waist. You should welcome your family with open arms? Corvus reprimanded her. Unless, of course, you're a dirty little traitor who betrayed her family for some riffraff. Proxima exclaimed angrily, though she was certainly enjoying the moment. Father took you in and raised you as his own child, Gamora. Corvus was the next to lay on the guilt. Your actions disgrace his kindness. Kindness? Kindness. Gamora snapped after hearing that. That lunatic killed my parents in front of me. Is that kindness? Was it kindness when he slaughtered half of my planet? No, you're right. It had to be kindness when that sick son of a bitch ordered his men to behead the children I went to school with. My friends. I didn't know you felt this way, little one. A deep rumbling voice spoke as a third much larger figure walked up the path behind Proxima. Gamora's eyes widened as her entire body shook with fright. Corvus instantly turned and dropped to his knees followed by Proxima, who looked absolutely shocked at Thanos' arrival. Father. Corvus greeted Thanos respectfully. Father, what are you dash shush, Proxima? Thanos dismissively waves at his eldest daughter. Father. Gamora ground out those words in distaste. Gamora. Thanos looks at her like a regretful father. Where is Dash, what's all this ruckus out here? Another new arrival entered the fray. I was in the middle of Dash Spider-Man. Thanos finishes his question as he turns to see the man himself come strolling out of the ship behind Corvus. Oh, Peter grunted as he realized that Thanos was actually there. I expected those two. He points to Proxima and Corvus, who continue to bow to Thanos. But not you. He then points to Thanos. What's the matter? Come to take your favorite daughter home, or looking for this. Peter held his hand up as the sealed orb appears in his palm. Both. Thanos speaks plainly. I see. Peter nods as he looks at the trapped guardians and ravagers. 
Well, except Drax, who had his eyes trained on Thanos, ready for a battle. Can you guys fight? Peter asks, knowing they've been through a lot today. Aff. Drax lets out a war cry as he grips his blades tightly. Yeah, what he said. Quill nods as he held his pistol at the ready. Hey, give me my gun back. Rocket yells as he snatches his weapon from Quill. Ravagers are always ready for a fight. Right boys. Yondu yelled as his clan let out their own war cry. Gamora, Peter asks the stunned and frightened woman. Thanos looked straight at her, waiting for her to make the choice. I, Gamora was petrified by the mere presence of her father. I see, Peter says as he waves his hand. Suddenly, a portal appeared under Gamora, sending her away before snapping shut. Gamora, Quill yelled as she disappeared. Where did you send her? Thanos asks demandingly. On Earth, Nebula woke up early to watch the sunrise as she sipped a hot cup of coffee with extra milk and sugar. Ever since she betrayed her father, Nebula has been staying in the Avengers Tower, though she wasn't a member just yet. Peter practically ordered her to enjoy life for a while before making any big life decisions, so that's what she's been doing. Touring the world, Nebula tried all of the foods and drinks that caught her eye as she took in the sights. Luckily, everything was paid for by Peter so she was able to enjoy her life like a rich young lady. Of course, her inhuman appearance drew a bit of attention, but with the introductions of metahumans, she wasn't bothered much. This planet is beautiful, Nebula thought as a golden portal opened over her couch. Question mark. She watched as a very familiar green figure tumbled out. What dash Gamora muttered as she looked up to see her scowling sister looking down at her with a mug in hand. What are you doing here? Nebula asks in annoyance. I was having such a good morning. She would either get herself or someone else killed, so Gamora can go visit her sister for a while. Peter says as Thanos nods his head in understanding. You should come to visit as well. I could use a few more ships. You can never have a big enough space fleet, after all. I plan to but sadly, you won't be there to welcome me. Thanos states threateningly. We'll see. Peter shrugs as he looks at the kneeling Corvus glaive. Let's even the odds, shall we? As Peter spoke, a portal opened underneath Corvus, causing him to fall through just like Gamora. Though, unlike his rebellious sister, the golden portal snapped itself shut a bit earlier, wrapping around his neck and decapitating the son of Thanos in an instant. Corvus. Proxima screamed in anger, disbelief, and despair as her husband's headless body fell in front of her and Thanos. Why are you here? Nebula asked gruffly as she stood in front of her sister. Did Spider-Man send you? I don't even know where here is. Gamora says with a scoff as she stands and walks past her sister. This is Earth. Why are you here? Nebula repeats herself as her sister peered out of the floor-to-ceiling windows. Is this Spider-Man's planet? Gamora continues to avoid the question. Yes, he's very popular here. Nebula nods as Gamora caught sight of an electronic billboard in the distance with Peter's masked face on it. New York City, home of Spider-Man, now stop avoiding the question. Why are you here? Nebula asks as Gamora felt the cold steel of a gun on her back. Is father planning something? No, I've already betrayed Thanos, like you. Gamora says as she whips around and throws Nebula over her shoulder, taking the blaster in the process. You're rusty, sister. Damn you. Nebula spat as she groaned on the floor. Is this your new home? Gamora asks as she steps past her down sister and tours around the place. Yes, now leave. Nebula spat as she picked herself up. You're not welcome here. Spider-Man sent me here, so apparently I am. Gamora commented as a knock could be heard from the door. A visitor? No, don't dash Nebula tried to stop her, but it was too late. The door opened, revealing a demonic-looking blue man with a sharp black tail. You're not Nebula. Nightcrawler commented as he noticed the gun in her hand. Before Gamora could say a word, Nightcrawler disappeared in a blue mist and appeared to her right, snatching the weapon from her hand. Exclamation point. As Gamora tried to counter him, Kurt disappeared once again. Where's Nebula? Nightcrawler asks as he held the gun to the back of Gamora's head. I swear, if she's hurt. Sister, is this your lover? Gamora asks over her shoulder. Following her gaze, Kurt saw Nebula standing behind him, safe and sound. That's none of your business? Nebula states as she walks up and takes the gun from Nightcrawler, prodding her sister out the door. As I said, you're not welcome here. Bam, Nebula slams the door in Gamora's face, locking her out. That's Gamora? Kurt asks curiously. Yes, now wait here. I'll be ready for our date soon. Giving up on talking to her sister, Gamora traversed through the tower until she ran into a roadblock. Access denied? A cybernetic voice said as she tried to use the elevator. Great, now what? She sighed in annoyance. Exclamation point. Suddenly, the elevator closed, locking her inside as it climbed up to the higher floors. Who are you, pretty lady? The doors opened, revealing a smirking Tony Stark. Gamora, she says plainly. Spider-Man sent me. Alien then? He asks and she nods. Good. I could use a navigator. Follow me. What the hell did I get myself into? The look on the mad titan's face didn't change a bit as his son's headless body landed on the ground before him. On the other hand, Proxima wasn't taking it so well. She looked between her husband's lifeless body and his separated head at Peter's feet with an anguished look on her face. Haha. Ha. 
that was badass. Yandu laughed as he stared at his new captain in awe. At first, he had second thoughts about becoming subordinate to another, as he's been the king of his own crew for a while now, but after seeing his new captain's display of power all of his doubts disappeared. Now, he just has to live through this encounter to reap the rewards of his smart decision. You! Proxima yelled as her hate-filled eyes turned to Peter. Me! Peter played dumb as he pointed to himself. You're dead. I'll rip you open and tear out your insides. Gouge out your eyes. Bleed you dry, feed you too. While the mad woman was ranting about what she would do to the man who murdered her husband, Peter turned to the guardians in front of him. You guys deal with the angry widow, and I'll handle Gamera's daddy, Peter says as he looks at Thanos. Just remember that an emotional enemy is a sloppy enemy. She may be stronger than you, but her sights are set on me. Use that. Are you done preparing? Thanos asks knowingly. He waited patiently this entire time and was getting tired of it. Yeah, sorry. Usually, my lackeys would be better trained, but these are new. Peter apologizes as the guardians turn to glare at him for his comment. Good, let's begin. Thanos said as Peter kicks off of the ground and appeared in front of Proxima, punting her across the street towards the guardians. Good luck. Peter gave them a wave as he stepped to the side, dodging a big purple fist to his back. Try not to die. Using his spider senses to dodge a few more punches to his back, Peter turned away from his crew and gave Thanos his full attention. Attacking a man when his back is turned. How cowardly. Peter commented with a shake of his head. Did you not do the same to my son? Thanos motions toward the headless body between them. You got me there. Agar. Proxima screamed as she emerged from a pile of rubble. Instantly, her eyes lock onto Peter's back, though they don't stay there for long. Whistle, suddenly, a Yaka arrow flew towards her head, but sadly, Proxima's hand moved swiftly and caught the arrow with ease. Our captain doesn't have time to deal with lackeys like you. Quill commented as Proxima's arm shook under the power of Yandu's arrow. Whistle, as Yandu's whistle grew louder and louder, Proxima found it harder to hold back the arrow from piercing her face. We. She muttered as her grip tightened and the arrow split in half, losing its power in the process. Arg. Yandu groaned in pain as his red mohawk flashed for a moment. You alright? Quill asked worriedly. Yeah, just give me a gun. Yandu said as one of his men tossed him a pistol. That arrow was expensive, you ugly bitch. Without waiting for anyone else, Yandu started opening fire, though everyone else joined in soon enough. Exclamation point. Kicking off of the ground, Proxima weaved through the many energy bolts sent her way, growing closer and closer with every shot fired. I wonder how he'll feel if I slaughter all of you. Proxima asked menacingly as she appeared in front of one of Yandu's clansmen. Die. Piercing her hand forward, Proxima dug her hand into the poor guy's chest and ripped out his heart. You. Rocket groaned in disgust as she tossed the heart at his feet. Ah. Drax rushed forward and swung his blades toward Proxima's back. Clank, swiftly spinning around, Proxima pulled her sword and clashed with Drax's dual blades. Prepare yourself, ho spawn of Thanos. Drax grits his teeth as she overpowers him, sending him crashing into an abandoned food cart. Pew pew pew, just as Proxima was about to follow after Drax to finish the kill, Quill and everyone else opens fire on her. Ugh. Proxima grunts as a few shots land, though she managed to dodge most of them. She can bleed. Keep it up, boys. They seem to be having fun, Peter commented as he carefully weaved around Thanos' attacks. You may lose your fourth child today, you've only killed one. Thanos corrects him as the two stand across one another, merely testing out one another before the real fight begins. True, but the other two abandoned you, didn't they? Peter taunted. For the first time since they'd met, Peter saw the Mad Titan's calm facade crumble for a moment. Though I think we both know you only care about one of those children. Peter continues his poking and prodding. Compared to Gamora, the rest are all either disappointing or simply lacking, aren't they? Thanos' facade continues to crumble. It must hurt for her to betray you. I mean, Nebula didn't matter, but Gamora on the other hand. The Golden Child rebels, Peter continues. She'll return soon enough. Thanos gets himself under control as he steps forward. Let's stop playing around. Ah, you're no fun. Peter whines as he pulls out the orb and tosses it to his opponent. Here you go. Question mark. Thanos caught the orb in confusion, though that was a mistake on his part. Suddenly, the orb started glowing with golden spell lines and swiftly exploded, completely engulfing the Mad Titan. Boom! Father! Proxima turned just in time to see her father's figure disappear behind a bright golden explosion. Pay attention! Quill chided her as he rolled over a familiar-looking device, which stopped at her feet and opened up. Instantly, Proxima's sword was magnetized to the ground below, disarming her just in time for Drax to appear with his blades drawn. Die! He bellowed as he slashed his knives downward. Exclamation point! Proxima, who was far too distracted by her father's predicament, tried to dodge the attack, but, swish due to her carelessness, Proxima's right arm was severed cleanly from the shoulder, finally wetting Drax's blade with the blood of his enemies. Your move, ho spawn. Father. Proxima ignored Drax's taunt as well as her severed arm, which was still gushing blood everywhere, and rushed into the blast zone. Where do you think you're going? 
Rocket yelled as he and everyone else turned their weaponry in her direction. Instantly, a dense hail of colorful blaster bolts shot toward Proxima's open back, though she never turned back nor did she even try to dodge. Her father's safety was her and the Black Order's top priority, after all. Ugh. Proxima grunted as her back was pelted with blast after blast, trudging her way to her father's position. This lady is nuts, Rocket commented as another one of his shots hit her on the shoulder. Petty tricks. Thanos muttered as the smoke cleared, revealing his slightly disheveled form. F father. Proxima smiled weakly as she fell at his feet, continuing to leak blood everywhere. Although the explosion was powerful, it only left the mad titan with a few spots of black soot on his body and some torn clothes, making Proxima dying efforts absolutely meaningless. His body didn't seem to have the slightest scratch anywhere, which was impressive because the area around him showed just how powerful that explosion really was. Thanos stood in a ten feet deep crater where the street once was. While the buildings around him, which were practically untouched only moments ago, have completely collapsed from the shockwave. Question mark. Thanos curiously peered down at the orb in his hand, completely ignoring his dead daughter's body. I wouldn't open that if I were you, Peter warned. Of course, the mad titan didn't heed his warning. Ripping it open with his bare hands, Thanos expected to see the bright light of a purple infinity stone. As the orb separated in the middle, a spring-loaded jack-in-the-box clown popped out. Clown face Thanos didn't even flinch as he turned to look at Peter with a humorless glare. The game's end dash Thanos spoke, though he was interrupted by a wet surprise. PSSHHHT a black liquid shot out of the mouth hole on the clown's head, spraying the mad titan's face. A few sprays even landed in his eyes, nose, and mouth. Thanos quickly threw the orb aside and started wiping his face. What is this? As he looked down at his hands, which were now covered in a black substance, Thanos could feel his strength slowly leaving his body. And as his strength went, the pain started to kick in. Starting from his mouth, nose, and eyes, an excruciating burning shot through his entire body, unlike anything he's ever felt before. Peter watched in interest as Thanos' skin turned pale and his veins began to show, turning a deep black in the process. I told you not to open it? Peter said in an I told you so sort of manner. What did you do? Thanos screamed. His former calm and collected persona disappeared completely. When we sold off the power stone to the collector, I asked for something on top of the normal payment. Peter lies, as he doesn't want Thanos to know too much. Wait dash Drax was about to correct him when Quill reached over and covered his mouth in a hurry. That right there is called the poison, Peter reveals as Thanos' eyes widen in realization. Apparently, it's the strongest poison in the entire universe. I was only able to get a little bit of it from Tyvan before he ran off with his new purple pet rock, but it looks like it was enough. As Peter was speaking, Thanos began to stagger in place. This is not over. He muttered in torment before turning to run away, leaping over a large distance like the Hulk. Are we going after him? Quill asks as Peter remained unmoving. Nah, there's no antidote for the poison and I'd rather not get any of it on me in the scuffle. Peter says he points to the few drops of poison on the floor, which were melting through the metal street upon contact. Just punching Thanos in the face right now could transfer the poison to Peter, so the best bet would be to let Thanos escape and die on his own. So he's a dead man walking? Quill asks. Maybe, Peter says cryptically. What do you mean maybe? Rocket asks in confusion. Thanos is a very well-connected and powerful man. If he could hold out for long enough, then I have no doubt that he could get an antidote made. Peter explains with a shrug. It all depends on how long he can last. Silence filled the street as everyone hoped Thanos would have a swift death. Otherwise, they would have a very angry space warlord on their tail soon enough. They're leaving. Yandu said as he and everyone else watched the Chitauri retreat out of the city and fly off in a hurry. Good, you guys sweep the city for any leftovers, while I finish packing our spoils, Peter orders as he strolls back inside. I got some men that need taking care of, Yandu says as he gestures to his fallen clansmen. At the start of this, Yandu had around 40 ravagers in his clan. Now, he has about 20. A handful died when the invasion started, and the rest were killed off by Proxima, who now lay dead in a puddle of her own blood. We'll join you once we're done. Yandu nodded toward Quill as he and his men gathered their fallen brethren and walked off. Alright, let's make this quick. I want to get back to the ship and take a long nap after this. Quill said tiredly as he, Drax, and Rocket started their search of the city, killing any and all of the Chitauri stragglers. As Thanos rushed into his ship and flew off, the effects of the poison had already started to worsen. Drowsiness, dizziness, weakness, high temperature, chills, headache, irritability, though that could be chalked up to his recent loss against Spider-Man, difficulty breathing, skin rash, blurred vision, mental confusion, etc. Name a symptom, and Thanos was currently experiencing it to an extreme degree. The few Chitauri soldiers who rushed to help him instantly died upon contact with the black poison that coated much of their leader's body. G get Ebony Ma. The Mad Titan ordered before collapsing into a coma. Rest in peace, Peter saluted as he opened a portal under the Collector's dead body, sending him straight to the nearest sun and thanks for all of the cool stuff. Especially the genie's lamp. With Tyvan's body gone and his collection empty, P 
Peter hoped that Thanos would believe his lies from earlier. After all, the Collector is supposedly as old as the universe itself, so it's safe to say that he would be able to hide from the Mad Titan fairly easily. With this, Thanos will hopefully keep underestimating me, Peter thought as he got back to work cleaning out the Collector's museum. I should probably kill that mind-controlling snake. Tony, what's so important that I have to rush here during a meeting with three generals? A dark-skinned man in a military uniform came storming into Tony's lab and who the hell is that? Rhodes turned to the green-skinned woman who was leaning on a car in the corner. That's our navigator, Tony says excitedly as he grabs a thin glowing object and slaps it on his friend's chest. W what are you doing? Rhodes asked as he looked down at the arc reactor attached to him. It's a present, Tony says as he taps the reactor like a button. Instantly, waves of metal shoot out of the reactor and covers Rhodes' body completely, forming an all-black War Machine armor set. Insert picture of War Machine Mark 7 here, Gamora watched on with an impressed look on her face. For a non-space-faring planet like Earth, weaponry of this caliber was completely unheard of. Is this what I think it is? Rhodes shouted from inside the suit. Yup, I thought that since we're going to explore space together, you and Pepper would need your own suits, Tony says as the sound of high heels clacking could be heard. I get one too, Pepper asks with her arms crossed as she stood in the doorway, admiring Rhodes' new armor. Wait, did you say space? Rhodes kept screaming. You know, you don't have to yell. The helmet will project your voice to us, Tony explains. Oh, sorry. Rhodes practically whispered this time around. We're going to space. Pepper asks as she eyes a triangular-shaped arc reactor next to Tony. Who's going to run your company? Happy and Jarvis will have it covered, Tony says as he walks up to her with the arc reactor in hand. Come on, don't you want to see what's out there? Visit an alien planet or two? It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Pepper seemed to hesitate for a moment before grabbing the reactor from Tony's hand. So, how does this thing work? She asked as Tony smirked in victory. Just put it on like this. Tapping her chest just like before, Pepper was covered in a blue and silver form-fitting Iron Man armor. Insert picture of Mark 49 Iron Man armor here, looking good, Tony commented as he tapped his own chest. Once again, metal waves rushed out of the reactor and covered his body in his updated red and gold Iron Man suit. Insert picture of Tony's endgame suit here, can I have one of those as well? Gamora asks. No. Three voices deny her all at the same time. After packing everything that the Guardians would be taking from the museum, destroying everything that was just too dangerous to continue existing, and stashing away all of the best stuff for himself, Peter returned to their new ship. Zzzzzz. As soon as he stepped inside, Peter found the common area filled with empty liquor bottles and passed out Ravagers. Maybe recruiting Yondu wasn't the best idea? Deciding that he wouldn't be dealing with this right now, Peter made sure that the room holding all of the loot was secured by a spell before portaling away. Er? Peter checked the room for any lingering evidence before opening the door. Good morning, princess. Peter greets his daughter with an awkward smile on his face. Dad? When did you get back? Lily asks as she perks up from her sleepiness. Just now actually, Peter says as he steps out into the hall and closes the door behind him. Mom's in the bathroom, but she'll be out soon, where were you? She asks as Peter lifts her up into his arms. Taking care of some business in space. I beat up a very bad man and sent him running with his tail between his legs, Peter bragged with a confident smirk. Oh, can I go to space too? While answering all of his curious daughter's questions, Peter started cooking breakfast for everyone. Was it Thanos? Lily asks out of nowhere. How do you know that name? Peter asks in surprise. I hacked into the Avengers Tower. Lily admits as she turned her head away. Wow. Peter blurts out, impressed by her ability. And Jarvis didn't detect you? You mean that consciousness in the tower? Lily asks back and receives a nod. I just kept away from it. Peter was beyond impressed. His daughter was able to steal data out from under Jarvis' nose. Wait until Tony hears about this. Peter couldn't wait to see the look on his friend's face. You're not mad. Lily asks hesitantly. No, sweetie. Peter sends her a comforting look. Just be careful where you stick your nose. Others won't be as welcoming as me if they found out you hacked them. Okay. Lily answered in relief. She thought her father would be angry, though that did seem to be the case. If Lily was a normal girl, Peter would be a lot stricter with her, but since she's an AI given human form, things are a bit different. I've actually been meaning to talk to you about something, Peter says as he walks over with a plate full of food. Question mark. Lily looked up at him curiously as she nibbles on a piece of bacon from her plate. How should I say this? Peter wondered out loud. When I first started making you, I wanted to make an assistant, who would help me with my work, manage some of my responsibilities, and give me information while I'm out in the field. As Peter explains this, Lily begins to frown in contemplation. Am I not doing what I'm supposed to? Lily asks in realization. No, you're perfect exactly the way you are. Peter quickly explained the misunderstanding. That was just in the beginning. You're my daughter now and I love you far more than the cold and calculated assistant I was originally going for. Oh okay. Lily stuttered as she smiled happily at his words. 
What I'm trying to explain is, I need an assistant and since you're able to outweigh Jarvis now, I was wondering if you were interested. Peter offers. She already knows every bit of data in the tower and had the ability for the job, so Peter wasn't worried about much. The job could even be done from home, as a Wi-Fi signal should be more than enough for her to do just about anything. Lily's brain is made from the strongest alien computer that Peter could find at the time. Shrinking it with a spell and etching some runes for the weight, cooling, power, and a few other things, Lily would become the smartest person on this planet soon enough. Though, if you don't want to, I can make another less lifelike AI for the job. Peter gives her a way out. Either way, I'm still your dad and your mom's still your mom. Nothing changes whatsoever. Although Peter would prefer to make a second AI for this, he wanted to give Lily the choice. After all, someone as smart as her would need challenges and a purpose, so maybe this could give that to her. She may be childlike, but Lily is already mature enough to make her own decisions. Lily remained silent for a moment before answering. Can I think about it? Sure, I don't need an answer right this second. Peter nodded understandingly. Maybe ask your mom and grandmas for advice too. I'm sure they can help. Okay, I will. After a quiet breakfast, where Lily seemed to be thinking about her decision, Peter left her to MJ and suited up before portaling to Kamartage. Question mark. Peter looked around in confusion as he found himself stepping into a different location than intended. Did you reroute my portal? Sat in front of him was the Ancient One, who was sipping a cup of tea with a serene atmosphere surrounding her. Yes, you stole from the restricted section and used my name to do so. She gets straight to the point. Yeah, sorry about that. Peter says as he whips out a picture from his pocket. I needed information for this. I know about your daughter, Peter. She says plainly. Look at the picture. He took a seat and pushed the photo in front of her face. She's the cutest, isn't she? Sigh. The Ancient One rolled her eyes at Peter's typical fatherly behavior. Yes, very cute. Don't be like that. Peter whined at her unenthused demeanor. You have a granddaughter now. It's a happy occasion. Since when am I your mother? The Ancient One raises a questioning brow. Teacher, master, mother. Same thing. Peter shrugged. Of course, she knew that Peter was right, but would never admit it. When you take a personal student in Kamartage, that student is practically your child from that moment on. You teach and care for them as any parent would. Return the books, she states plainly. Without a word, Peter opens a small portal above the table, depositing the few books he stole with a smile on his face. There, are we good now? Peter asks. Yes, now why are you here? She asks, knowing that Peter only ever visits when he needs something. First, I wanted to invite you to meet your granddaughter, Peter says as he flashes her the picture once again. And secondly, I wanted to ask your advice on this. As he finished speaking, a Persian-style lamp appeared on the table between them. When her eyes landed on the lamp, the Ancient One's mouth hung open in shock as her eyes widened. I found this in the collector's collection, and based on your expression, I'd say it's real, isn't it? Peter looked at her expectantly. The Ancient One remained silent. Because if it is real, Peter says as he picks the lamp up and starts to play with it. Then you wouldn't mind if I summoned the jinn? Exclamation point. Acting quickly, the Ancient One reaches forward and pulled the lamp into her hands. Please think before you dash suddenly, the lamp in her hands turned to sand, which fell through her fingers and pooled in her lap. Of course, Peter wouldn't play around with a jinn's lamp like that, nor would he give it to the Ancient One so easily. You think I'm that stupid? Peter asks with a victorious smirk. Now, tell me about jinn so I can figure out how to get my wishes. I can't talk you out of this, can I? She asks with an annoyed sigh. No, it's literally a genie, Peter says matter-of-factly. Unless everything I know is wrong, and they don't grant three wishes? They grant wishes all right? She says with a far-off look, remembering some sort of past experience. It just depends on your genie's alignment, like good and evil, Peter asks in interest. Sort of, the Ancient One says as an old book appears on the table. With a wave of her hand, the book flipped open to a page with a portrait of a pitcher-black humanoid demon. It had large hands, a protruding stomach, three long horns, and the face of a wild beast with sharp tiger-like teeth. Meanwhile, on the opposite page was a much less threatening figure. It looked almost human except for the bluish skin tone and lack of legs and feet. In fact, both portraits lacked a lower body, as if they were some sort of disembodied ghosts. Jin, commonly known as genies, are a powerful race of wish-granting beings made of pure energy. They're gifted with phenomenal cosmic powers that allow them to bend the rules of the world and take on any form they desire. It didn't take long for genies to be seen as highly desirable slaves due to their great powers, as such their entire race was slowly captured one by one until none remained free. Masters of the mystic arts and other energy users bottled them up in lamps or any other containers, which forced them into never-ending servitude, she continues. Were you alive when they were turned into slaves? Peter asks curiously. No, I'm not that old. She replies with a roll of her eyes. My master was though and he always felt bad for what happened to the genie. Well, most of them. What do you mean by that? Peter asked. Not all genies were good-natured or neutral existences. 
In fact, the start of their enslavement was due to a rotten bunch that unleashed terrible and contagious plagues upon the world, among other catastrophes, the Ancient One pointed to the demon on the page as she spoke. From what my master told me, once the genies found out about their brother's horrendous actions, they sealed them away in random containers. So the genies sparked the craze for their own enslavement? Peter asked. Yes, the Ancient One nodded. They unknowingly started the downfall of their race. Masters experimented on the sealed genie and found a way to capture more of them, though that wasn't all. They also bound the genie to a master. So, basic genie stuff. I activate the lamp, a genie comes out, and I get three wishes. Peter sums up the rest. Does it just return to the lamp afterward? That depends on what type of container it is. The Ancient One shrugs unknowingly. You'd have to study the lamp and figure out its enchantments, though I can't emphasize enough how careful you should be. Why? Peter asks. Of course, he was planning to be careful in the first place, but the seriousness in her voice made him a bit nervous. Genies are an enslaved race of people and none of them are bound to be happy about it, not even the good-natured ones. She explains with a pointed stare. So what? If they're forced to grant me wishes, then what could possibly go wrong? Peter asks in confusion. They are forced to grant you wishes, but give them the slightest loophole or stray thought and they will pounce on it, twisting your wish for wealth into a theft leading back to you, or your desire for love into a curse of endless fanatical suitors. The Ancient One warned seriously. So be careful what you wish for? Peter muttered in understanding. Yes, that exact phrase was coined soon after the genie were enslaved. Remember it and be extremely careful. The Ancient One emphasized as she slammed the book shut. I would rather you just forget about this genie business, but dash yeah, no way. Peter shook his head as the Ancient One sighed tiredly. This is a wish-granting genie we're talking about. I've watched Aladdin far too many times to pass this up. After hearing a few more warnings from his bald teacher, Peter returned home just in time for Lily to get out of school. Quickly texting the family group chat that he would pick her up, he grabbed his keys and rushed out of the door. Pulling up to the school in his old rust bucket, which only needed some cosmetic upgrade at this point, Peter heard the bell ring and watched as the children started pouring out of the doors in waves. Beep beep, Peter honked the horn as he saw his daughter walk out with two children on each side of her. One of them was obviously Miles, who has quickly become Lily's best friend, while the other was someone that Peter hasn't met before. A girl about the same age as Lily with short blonde hair talked animatedly with them as she followed along. Insert picture of Gwen Stacy here. The group looked up as they heard the beeping and found Peter in his rust bucket. That's my dad. Lily explained to Gwen, who looked confused. Oh, I thought your mom was picking us up. Gwen asked as they all planned to go to Lily's house after school. Lily just shrugged as she walked over to the car and hopped in, followed by her friend filling up the back seat. Your friends are coming over? Peter asks, as Lily nods and motions back to her newest friend. That's Gwen. She came over yesterday too, but you weren't home? She introduces. Question mark. Peter looked back at the blonde girl for a moment. What's with my daughter and befriending future spider heroes? First Miles Morales and now Gwen Stacy. It's like she's building her own superhero group. It's nice to meet you, Gwen. While the kids were eating pizza and playing some Lego game on the Xbox in the living room, Peter left them alone and locked himself in his bedroom. He pulled the genie's lamp out of nowhere and placed it on his desk, where he sat down and simply stared at it in awe for a moment. I need to study this and then come up with some airtight wishes. Maybe I should write them down like a contract and have some lawyers look it over for any loopholes. Peter wondered as he got to work. Snapping his fingers, the lamp floated up to eye level as a nexus of golden spell lines surrounded the thing, scanning it meticulously. Now, what kind of enchantments are keeping you locked away? Peter muttered as he started getting some information. First, the lamp has a very intricate and complex prison enchantment, which seemed to be the main purpose of the container. Once he found that out, Peter started looking for how to summon the genie, as the collector tried and failed to do so for a year. Of course, he wouldn't be activating just yet. Almost an hour after Peter started his research, the door flung open and MJ came storming in. Do you know Dash the wind instantly left her sails as she caught sight of the floating lamp? What is that? A genie's lamp? Peter says plainly. What's with the grand entrance? A genie? She muttered in shock before shaking her head. You know what? I'm going to ignore that for now. Do you know what your daughter was doing downstairs when I got home? No idea, but since she's only my daughter for this scenario, I'd say it wasn't good. Peter says with a small laugh. She was? MJ pauses to peek out of the door before closing it. She and Gwen were taking turns kissing Miles. One would peck him on the lips and the other would go next dash I'm going to kill that little crap. Peter exclaims and he sprung out of his chair. A slash N, I have an 8 year old niece who told me some kids in her class kissed, so I thought that this would be an interesting development and a good reason for Peter to get pissed off. LOL, it can't always be fury. Downstairs do you think we're in trouble? Gwen asked worriedly. I don't know. I don't think Lily's mom was mad. Miles shrugged unknowingly. The kids did it at school, so I don't see the problem. Lily muttered in confusion. I'm going to kill that little crap. Peter's voice carried through the house to the living room. Gwen and Miles both jumped out of their seats in fright. Upstairs calm down. 
MJ yells in a hushed tone as she pushes Peter back into his seat. It's normal for kids to experiment like this, and you won't be killing anyone. They probably don't even know what they're doing. Can I at least beat him? Peter asked with a dangerous glint in his eye. No, they're children. MJ swatted him upside the head. I shouldn't have come to you for this. MJ instantly started regretting bringing this issue to Peter. Lily's grandmothers would have been a much better choice. Now, stay here while I talk to the kids. MJ sighs in frustration as she goes for the door, preparing herself for the awkward conversation. As she opened the door, MJ turned back to Peter with a piercing glare. If you leave this room and cause trouble, I won't sleep with you for a year. Seeing as he wasn't allowed to kill young Miles Morales for his transgressions, Peter threw himself back into examining the lamp. After a few hours, he came to a full understanding of the enchantments on the lamp and how to summon the genie. I just have to rub the lamp a few times while injecting it with energy. Peter thought as he sat back in his chair. Eldritch energy should work. Other than that, this particular lamp was made to do a few things. Although most of the enchantments are normal genie stuff, like summoning, becoming the master, getting three wishes, and all of that good stuff, the lamp also has a few add-ons. Though most of them don't really matter, except for one. The lamp will disappear after the third wish is granted, alongside the genie of course. Meaning, after the wish is granted, the lamp will teleport itself somewhere in the vast universe, ready to be used once again by whoever finds it. Maybe I should waste a wish on keeping it out of other people's hands? Peter wondered. After all, this is a comic book world, where villains lurk in every corner of the universe. Just imagining Thanos, Ego, or even some small-time bad guy finding the lamp and getting three wishes sends a shiver down Peter's spine. Looks like I'll only get two wishes, Peter muttered as MJ came walking into the room and let out a tired sigh. How did the talk go? He watched in amusement as MJ flopped onto the bed and pushed her face into a pillow. That bad, huh? Peter laughed. You have no idea, MJ says as she pulls her face out of the pillow. I had to explain to them, flashback MJ sat on the coffee table in front of the kids, who were attentively listening to her explanation. And that's why kissing like that is only for somebody you love, like your boyfriend or girlfriend? She finished her long-winded talk. Does that mean we're Miles' girlfriends now? Lily asked in confusion. I don't think my dad will like that I have a boyfriend. Gwen mutters in contemplation. George Stacy is a high-level member of the police department, who has made quite a few joking threats over the years about shooting his daughter's future boyfriend. I don't think my dad does either. Lily nods in understanding. Little Miles just sat there quietly with a confused look and a blushing face. No, that's not what I'm saying, flashback end, by the time I got them to understand that they weren't in Miles' harem, they started asking about sex, which was a whole other can of worms. MJ groaned as she threw the blanket over herself, disappearing from the world. Are you sure that I can't just beat the kid a little bit? Peter asks and receives a pillow to the face for his troubles. After having dinner, where Peter had to deal with May and Grace squealing about Lily's kissing fiasco, the family hung out for a while before Lily's bedtime. As Peter was leaving Lily's room after putting her to bed, he was immediately surrounded by the woman of the house. What's this about Lily being your AI assistant? Grace asks disapprovingly. Well, I made her because I needed an assistant, so I offered her the job. Peter explains with a shrug. But if she doesn't want to, then that's fine too. I can always make another less lifelike AI to do it. Good, because she's too young to be exposed to the type of criminals that you deal with, Grace seemed to be in favor of Peter's backup plan. Are you sure she's old enough to make this kind of decision? May asked worriedly. Lily isn't a normal 10-year-old girl, Peter says matter-of-factly. Actually, she's not even a year old, but that's not the point. Lily is already smart enough to have graduated from college with a master's degree 10 times over. Yeah, she's childlike and naive, and we'll keep treating her as a child, but that doesn't mean we should hold her back with the rules and expectations of a normal kid. That seemed to shut everyone up, as they didn't have a counter to Peter's little speech. Though, feel free to express your opinions to her, Peter says with a shrug. I have no problem either way. Fine, I'll talk to her tomorrow. Grace mutters as she walks off down the hall, followed by May. Both of them didn't seem to agree with Lily making the choice herself, especially Grace, but they couldn't exactly argue with Peter's logic. After all, he is her father. The only possible route of changing his mind would be convincing MJ, though she didn't seem too bothered with Peter's decision. I'm going to sleep. Today has been an exhausting day, MJ says as she walks off. We could pick up where we left off dash bam. MJ denies him instantly as she slams the bedroom door behind her, leaving Peter alone in the hallway. Peter sighs as he looks down at his right hand and smiles wryly. At least I still have you. After relieving himself the good old-fashioned way, Peter sat in the living room with a notepad and pen, thinking of good wishes that he could make. The list started with the obvious stuff. At first, Peter was thinking of the normal superpowers invisibility. Superhuman strength, though he already had that. Flying shapeshifting super speed, like the Flash. Super senses telepathy mind control telekinesis the list went on for a few pages before Peter gave up and crossed each of them out. It's just too generic? Peter thought as he started thinking more abstractly. 
Concept type power is centered on an idea that allows essentially any effect related to it. For example, autopotence, omnipotence over oneself, boundary manipulation, and subjective reality. Function type power is centered on what they do, which usually specialized in relatively specific fields. For example, creation, destruction, and most manipulations. Mechanism type power is centered on the manipulation of imminent laws of reality. For example, causality manipulation, physics manipulation, and virtual warping. Source type powers centered on their origin are usually supernatural, allowing a variety of applications. For example, divinity, lordship powers, magic, and supernatural dominion. Unfathomable powers without actual cause or mechanism, which are defined as beyond understanding. For example, author authority, logic manipulation, and systems. Systems like a game status screen, missions, shops, inventory, and everything else definitely piqued Peter's interest. I could literally live my life like a game character and grow infinitely in the process, Peter thought in interest, though the genie may not be powerful enough to do something like that. Actually, almost everything that I just listed is probably outside of any genie's power. Although he didn't believe that the genie would be able to grant him things like author authority, divinity, virtual warping, creation, and autopotence, Peter still left them on this list just in case it was possible. I only get two wishes, so I better make sure I'm thorough. Peter thought as he stayed up all night filling the pages of his notebook with all sorts of ideas. I could try tricking the genie into giving me more wishes. After thinking on that idea for a moment, Peter remembered the crazy intricate enchantments on the lamp. Yeah, that probably won't work, he muttered in disappointment. Every possible loophole he could think of seemed to be covered by the lamp's enchantments. A slash n, I can't make him too OP after all, by the time the sun rose and brightened the dark living room, Peter was just finished picking his wishes. He made three different sets of wishes. The first set consisted of the most overpowered stuff that he could think of, so basically omnipotence-related stuff. Though in case that isn't possible, Peter came up with two other sets of slightly lesser wishes. And if those two aren't possible, then he'll just have to go back to the drawing board once again. Peter also thought of wishing Thanos dead, though that seemed like a waste of a wish, as he could already be dead for all Peter knew. And even if he isn't, then Peter can still handle him on his own, as he originally planned from the beginning. I need to get a lawyer to write up three separate contracts for these wishes. Peter thought as only one name came to mind. Whipping out his phone, Peter called the best and blindest lawyer he knew. Ah, do you know what time it is? Daredevil answered the phone with a tired groan. Yeah, but I need some help with a few contracts. Peter heard another groan from the other end. Wake up, get some breakfast, and meet me in my office in an hour. Make it too, Matt muttered as he ended the call. So rude. Peter commented as he walked off to the kitchen and started making breakfast for the family. As Peter was cooking a large breakfast for the many women in his life, he heard a knock at the door. Who the hell is at my door? It's not even 6am yet? Peter thought as he walked over and pulled the door open. Why are you here? Standing across from him was the one and only bald spymaster, Nick Fury. My wife and daughter live here. How else am I supposed to see them? Fury scoffs as he pushes past Peter and strolls inside. Sorry, let me rephrase, Peter says as he closes the door and follows after his father-in-law. Why are you here so early in the morning? Not all of us can make our own hours, like you. This is the time slot that I have open today. Fury says as he walks into the kitchen and found a bunch of freshly cooked breakfast foods. I didn't know that you could cook. Peter watches as the old spy starts making a plate of food for himself. Well, no offense but your daughter is a horrible cook, so I ended up filling that role in the relationship. Peter says with a laugh. Oh, trust me, I know. Fury winced as he remembered the last time MJ cooked for him. Well, make yourself at home, I guess. Peter says as Fury sat down at the table with his food. I'm going to wake up. Peter was just about to say his daughter's name, but then he remembered that Fury has no idea that Lily even exists. Instantly, a smirk appeared on his face as Peter walked out of the kitchen, confusing Fury with his odd behavior. This will be an entertaining morning, Peter thought as he climbed the steps and opened Lily's bedroom door. Lily slept sprawled out on her bed with her mouth wide open and drool leaking out onto her pillow. Rise and shine, princess, Peter says as he walks over and pulls the curtains open, lighting up the room in an instant. Ugh. Lily groaned as the sun hit her face, waking her up. Five more hours? Isn't the line five more minutes? Peter asks as he takes a seat on her bed. Five minutes isn't long enough. Lily grumbled as she peeked up at her smiling father. Can you stop being so happy in the morning? It's a time of dread and slothfulness, not joy and happiness. Well, my little thesaurus, there's a reason for this smile, Peter says as Lily stares up at him in interest. Your grandpa is here, and he doesn't even know that you exist? Is it Fury? Lily asks in excitement. Instantly, her usual morning mood disappeared. She knew all about her grandpa from the data she stole from the tower. Yeah, and I was thinking we could prank him a little bit. Are you in? Peter asks as Lily's face blooms into a mischievous smile, matching her father's perfectly. What's the plan? After explaining the plan to Lily, 
Peter sent her off to the bathroom to get ready for the day and went to entertain his bald guest. Peter could already hear the rest of the house waking up, so he didn't bother them. After all, the grandmas have work and MJ has school. Technically, I have school too, Peter thought as he contemplated skipping out on school once again. So, how has the new and improved shield been holding up? Peter asked as he sat across from Fury with his own plate of food. Good, we're just barely functional again, Fury answered tiredly. Have you figured out which of the World Security Council was Hydra? Peter asked, as he hadn't checked up on them. No, I've been too busy with S.H.I.E.L.D. and chasing after the remnants of Hydra to even think about visiting my old employers, Fury says with a smirk. He seemed to almost enjoy the fact that the group that once bossed him around and made his life difficult was still held in captivity. I'm guessing Steve and Peggy are the ones chasing Hydra stragglers down, Peter receives a nod from his father-in-law. Though they were reluctant to leave Mr. Barnes behind, Fury says. How has Bucky been? Peter asks curiously. The last time I saw him, he was suicidal and begging Tony to kill him, he's still in his cell. The same psychologist that worked on Blonsky sees him twice a week. You'll have to ask Steve or Peggy for more information. I've been too busy to look further into it. Fury explains with a shrug. Now, are you going to tell me what you've been doing in space? It's a long story. Peter was reluctant to get into it. Simplify it. Fury insists. Hmm? I turned a group of alien criminals into a functioning crew of heroes for pay and fought Thanos, who might be dead. Peter explained simply, surprising Fury with the second bit of information. Did he have the Tesseract? He asks hopefully. Of course, Thanos wouldn't have the Tesseract as Peter was the one that stole it, but he wouldn't be admitting to anything. Not that I saw, but he's probably still alive, so we'll have another chance to find it soon enough. Peter technically wasn't lying. Just as Fury was about to ask more questions, MJ came strolling into the kitchen in one of Peter's old shirts, like a short dress. Since the majority of the house is women, leaving Peter as the only man around, they tended not to care about exposing themselves a little bit. For instance, MJ is currently wearing nothing but underwear and a shirt. Although this is normal for her in the morning, MJ instantly froze as she caught sight of her father, who was currently looking at her with a disapproving eye. Morning, beautiful, Peter says with a smirk as Fury turns to glare at him. Your dad came to visit, exclamation point. His words seemed to unfreeze MJ, who rushed out of the kitchen and up the stairs to find some clothes. Fury sighs in frustration as he heard Peter chuckle to himself. Once MJ returned, she brought the grannies with her, who were thankfully fully dressed. She must have warned them. Peter thought as MJ glared at him while chewing on a piece of bacon. Due to the surprise visit, everyone but Peter seemed to forget that Fury didn't know about Lily. Though that worked perfectly for his plans. You're so cute when you're mad. Peter smirks as he enjoys MJ's glare. Shut up. MJ spat as she rolled her eyes. So, how has school been? Fury started asking the normal absent dad questions. And while they were all talking, Peter could hear the pitter-patter of little feet rushing down the stairs. It's showtime. Peter smirked inwardly as he eyed the door. Seconds later, the kitchen door swung open and a three-year-old version of Lily came rushing in. Mommy! Lily exclaimed as she rushed up to MJ and jumped into her lap. Fury and everyone else were confused and shocked by her appearance. Even MJ had no idea what was happening. The one thing was for sure. This little girl looked exactly like MJ when she was this age, solidifying the fact that Lily is MJ's daughter in Fury's chaotic mind. Good morning, Daddy. Lily separated from her mother for a moment and smiled at Peter. Morning, Princess. Peter smiled back as he peeked over at Fury, who looked like a deer in headlights. W what is? Fury almost lost it at that moment. This bastard got my daughter pregnant. His hands gripped tightly as he glared at Peter with enough killing intent to shake a weaker man. Thankfully, a child was in the room, so he quickly reined himself in. Who's this? Fury projected a false calmness as he turned to his daughter, who was almost as confused as him. This is? MJ went to explain and froze for a second time that morning. Explaining Lily's origins was easy as a 10-year-old because she couldn't have possibly given birth to her at that age. But as a 3-year-old, the line begins to blur, which is why Peter used the reality stone to revert her to this form. This is our daughter, Lily. Peter finishes her sentence, enjoying the moment. Lily, why don't you go and give your grandpa a big hug? Okay. Lily jumps down from her mother's lap and rushes over to stand in front of Fury. She held her arms up, waiting for him to lift her into his lap. Fury matched his daughter and froze in place. Grandpa. Lily mutters as her eyes started to tear up. Do you not like Lily? Peter was filled with pride when he saw how great of an actress his princess was. And no. Fury practically shouted as he scrambled to pick her up. Grandpa would never. I like, how could I not? He sounded so awkward and forced as he tried to pacify the poor girl that Peter and Lily couldn't contain themselves anymore. Ha ha ha. Peter and Lily broke out into a fit of laughter. Question mark. Everyone looked at them in confusion. Although it took them a moment, the women of the house were the first to understand what was happening. Peter was messing with Fury, again. What the hell is happening? Fury shouted in exasperation. Language. 
Grace reprimanded him as she reached over to cover Lily's ears. Dad, you can turn me back now? Lily said as she pecked her grandpa on the cheek and hopped out of his lap. Being small was fun, but I want to go back to normal. Sure. Peter snaps his fingers, and the ten-year-old Lily returned in an instant. That's better. Lily nodded as she turned to Fury. Hello, Grandpa. I'm Lily Parker. Fury had no idea what was happening, but he knew one thing for certain. Peter was behind this. After explaining Lily's origins, Fury's confusion was instantly cleared up, though that didn't mean he was happy. You stole my daughter's DNA and made a child with it? Fury glared at Peter, ready to pull his gun at any moment. Would you rather I put a bun in her oven? Peter asks jokingly. I wouldn't mind, but the kids at school might say something. Hearing his words, Fury couldn't take it and pulled his dessert eagle from the holster. No guns at the table. Grace glared as she swiftly plucked the gun from his hand before turning to Peter. And you, stop antagonizing him. Yes, ma'am. Peter throws his hands in the air as Grace unintentionally waved the gun in his direction. I'll take that. May carefully took the gun from her for safety reasons. Seriously though, yes I took her DNA without permission, and we've already talked about it, Peter says as he looks toward MJ to back him up. Yes, and he won't be taking my DNA again unless I agree, right? She says pointedly and receives a quick nod. And although I didn't know Lily would be entering my life so suddenly, I most certainly don't regret it. MJ reaches over and combed her fingers through Lily's hair with a fond smile on her face. Besides, you're a grandpa now. You should be happy, Peter says as Lily smiles adorably in Fury's direction. I never said I wasn't happy. Fury couldn't help but be swayed by his granddaughter's cuteness. She looks just like MJ. I know it's crazy, isn't it? Grace nodded in agreement. She might as well be a clone. She looks like me too, right? Peter turns to May for some assistance, though she simply looks away. Look, she has my ears. May refused to speak. If I speak, I am in big trouble. Whatever, I have to head into the tower for some business. Peter changes the subject with a huff. Lily, why don't you have your grandpa drive you to school today? She goes to school? Fury asks incredulously. Yup, and she kissed a boy yesterday. Grace exclaimed like an excited schoolgirl. Exclamation point. Fury didn't look happy about that either. Mom, why would you tell him that? MJ sighed as she saw her father react the same way as Peter. She wasn't the only one to notice this either. Maybe an anti-Miles alliance can be formed between us? Peter pondered thoughtfully. After all, they can't let that kid get away with it. You want me to write up three separate contracts for a genie's wishes? Daredevil stared at Peter with a confused and incredulous look on his face. Yes, Peter nodded. Matt stared at him for a moment before speaking again. Did you find a genie or something? Because if not, then this is a giant waste of my time. I cannot confirm or deny anything, but I can say that this isn't a waste of time. Peter explains cryptically. After some more convincing, Peter clarified explicitly how important it was that the contracts were airtight, leaving no loopholes or room for misinterpretation. By the time Peter left him to do his work, Matt was convinced that his boss found a genie's lamp or some sort of monkey's paw that would grant him wishes. What a lucky bastard. While waiting for the contracts to be drawn up, Peter portaled back to the Guardians. As soon as he stepped into the ship, he found that his crew was rather somber and quiet, which wasn't like them at all. What the hell's going on? Peter asked in confusion. That city in Xanav we visited was destroyed by the Chitauri, Quill said as he showed a galactic news video of the decimated city ruins. They killed everyone, Drax said with a frown in his experience, the fact that the rest of the planet was spared was truly a godsend. Drax has chased Ronan and Thanos across the galaxy since his family's deaths, so he's seen far worse than this. So sadly, compared to most of Thanos' victims, Xanav was lucky. They must have been tracking us and attacked the city when we left, Peter muttered as he watched the video, joining the Guardians in their somber mood. While everyone was watching, no one noticed the thoughtful frown on Rocket's face. After all, he purposely ignored a call from the Nova Corps recently. After finishing the video, Peter turned to the crew. Some were less down than others, but nobody liked the fact that this happened, especially since it was done in the name of tracking them down. I'm going to go and say my condolences to Irani and explain some things, Peter says as he opens a portal. Wait, I'll come too. Quill hops up and follows Peter through the portal with a bit of trepidation. After all, he's seen the portals countless times, yet he never used them before. Question mark. Peter wondered why he wanted to follow along, but didn't care either way. Xander. Arriving at the front of the Nova Corps headquarters, Quill instantly spoke up. So, when are we getting Gamora back? Quill asks. And now I know why he tagged along? Peter thought in exasperation. I'll go pick her up once we're done here. That seemed to perk up Quill's mood, as he excitedly followed Peter into the downcast atmosphere of the Nova building. Peter could feel the mournful energy of most people inside. After all, they just lost the capital city of their empire's second most populated planet. Not to mention the fact that many of them most likely had some colleagues, friends, or family in the city at the time. I'm here to see Irani Rail. Peter stepped in front of the receptionist, who instantly recognized who he was. I'm so sorry, Irani. 
Peter says as he was escorted into the Nova Prime's office, followed by Quill. I rushed over as soon as I heard the news. Thank you, Spider-Man. Irani sighs tiredly from her desk, which was filled with all sorts of paper due to the tragedy. We tried to contact you, but... Peter raised an eyebrow at her words. I don't remember any calls, but we did just switch ships. Peter frowns unknowingly. I'm sorry, Irani. If we got your call, maybe Varus would still be standing. It's not your fault. Irani says understandingly, though her face hardens in the next moment. It's Thanos and his army. Speaking of Thanos, Peter quickly explains their run-in with Thanos and his children, as well as the fact that Varus was most likely attacked because of them. Once again, I'm sorry. Irani frowned as she took in everything that Peter just said. It's still not your fault. Maybe, maybe not. Peter shrugs. Is it true about Thanos? Is he really dead? Irani asks hopefully. After all, one city for the death of a cosmic tyrant like Thanos was a good trade in her book. He was severely poisoned when he fled, though I would bet on his survival. Men like Thanos aren't so easily killed. Peter's words cause the Nova Prime to sigh sadly. You're right, we shouldn't get our hopes up. Irani nods in agreement. But you did kill his children? Yes, Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight are dead. Peter answers. Can I have the bodies? Irani asks hopefully. Why? Quill asks as he didn't know why anyone would want that to begin with. We believe that the leaders in the destruction of Varus were these two people. Irani says as the video call before the invasion of Xanav appeared, showing Corvus and Proxima. And parading the bodies of the perpetrators around will help calm the scared masses? Peter understood her thought process. Not exactly a parade but yes. We need to show our citizens that we can protect them and our enemies that such attacks won't go unpunished. Irani clarifies. Alright, you can have the bodies. Peter says as he opens a portal and deposits the corpses of Thanos' children by the door. Thank you. Irani says as she hits a button and some subordinates come to take the bodies away. It's the least that I could do. Peter didn't mind. After all, he already took their possessions and didn't have any other use for the bodies. Just as Peter and Quill were about to be on their way, Irani seemed to remember something. Um, Starlight. Irani looks to Quill. It's Starboy. Peter corrects her with a smirk. No, it's not. Quill sighed in annoyance. It's Starlord? Mr. Quill? She opted to just use his real name. I thought that I should inform you. What? Am I dying or something? Quill asked as the mood in the room became serious out of nowhere. D do you know who your father is? Irani asks nervously. No, my mother called him an angel, but I think she was just covering up a one-night stand or something. She was very religious. Quill recalled the happy memories of his dying mother. Well, she may not have been wrong. Irani says as she shows them Quill's DNA, which was all sorts of weird. What is this? Quill asks in confusion. When we arrested you, we noticed an anomaly in your nervous system, so we had it checked out. Irani explains as she separates the image of his DNA. This is your mother's DNA and this is your father's. Compared to his mother's, which was the normal two linked strands that wind around each other to resemble a twisted ladder, his father was extremely odd and constantly changing shape, never remaining the same for long. I'm not a Terran? Quill asks in shock. You are half Terran. Your mother was of Earth. Your father, well, he's something very ancient that we've never seen here before. Irani says with a bit of trepidation. Peter watched as Quill finally learned a bit about his celestial origins. Now I have to deal with Ego's seed on Earth. Peter thought as he remembered the plot from the movie. Maybe I can get the Ancient One to deal with it? After all, Peter already had the genetic material from Nowhere Celestial, so he didn't exactly need any more. Meh, I'll check it out anyway. Peter thought as he said goodbye to Irani and portaled back to the ship with his stunned second in command in tow. As they left, Irani started spreading the word of Thanos' defeat and the death of his children. She even shared images of their dead bodies on the news. Of course, Irani was truthful with who was behind it and even provided pictures of the heroes for the news. Although the goal was to stabilize the situation and show the power of the Nova Empire, she knew that it wasn't a good idea to take full credit. After all, she and the administration of the Empire were still too scared to offend Thanos too much. In a matter of hours, the galaxy's many news corporations coined the name Guardians of the Galaxy. Instantly, not only was Spider-Man a galactic celebrity, but even his new crew of former criminals were all famous as well. Spider-Man, Star-Lord, Gamora, Rocket, Groot, and Drax the Destroyer were quickly becoming legends among the citizens of the Nova Empire and beyond. And of course, the Nova Empire made sure to explain the Guardian's close relationship to the Nova Corps. Sadly, Yondu was a new addition, so his name wasn't among them just yet. After dropping off Quill, who was still stunned into silence by the news of his father, Peter returned to the tower and picked up his three genie contracts from Matt. Though before he could summon the genie, which he was extremely excited to do, Peter went looking for Gamora, hoping that her return would help his first mate. Knock knock. Hey, where's Gamora? Peter asked as Nebula opened her apartment door. I don't know. Nebula shrugged uncaringly. Okay, I may have made a mistake. Peter thought as he rushed around the tower searching for his missing crew mate. Just as Peter was about to search Tony's penthouse, Jarvis' voice filled the room. 
Sir, Miss Gamora left the planet with Mr. Stark 20 hours ago, that bastard. After questioning Jarvis, who thankfully wasn't barred from telling him anything, Peter found out exactly what was happening. Tony was annoyed and jealous that Peter didn't bring him along for a space adventure, so he pretty much kidnapped Gamora in order to navigate for him. Forget it. Peter shook his head as he opened a portal to the mirror dimension with his genie contracts in hand. I'll check on Tony later. Thankfully, Peter placed a tracking spell on each of their ships, so he can go and take back Gamora at any moment. It's finally time. Peter thought as he pulled out the lamp. I'm sure Tony and Gamora will be fine until I'm done. What's happening? Tony yelled as he awoke to what appeared to be a crazy amount of turbulence. The Kree ship he commandeered was shaking and creaking like crazy, sending him and Pepper tumbling from the bed and onto the cold metal floor. Through the floor-to-ceiling reinforced glass window, he could see an odd-looking planet below, which seemed to be filled with trash, like some sort of junkyard. Though that wasn't what worried him. He could also see a good portion of the ship from this angle, and it wasn't looking good. The engines were smoking and a good portion of the hull seemed to be missing, and when he looked behind them, Tony spotted the culprit instantly. A giant wormhole hovered behind the ship, and it was still spitting out portions of some of the debris, solidifying Tony's fears. We flew through a wormhole, he thought in a mix of excitement and horror. Though that wasn't all. This trash planet seemed to be surrounded by countless other wormholes, and each of them was dumping junk out as well. Can we even leave this place? Tony was worried beyond belief. After all, one wrong move, and they could get sucked into the orbit of a wormhole, not that they could try with how damaged the ship is right now. Tony. Pepper called out in fear as she stood on shaky legs. Pushing his worries aside for now, Tony acted quickly and activated his armor, which covered his body in an instant. In a matter of seconds, Tony's chest lit up and a thick beam of white energy shot out, impacting the glass window. Sadly or luckily, depending on the situation, the glass didn't shatter as Tony hoped, so he had to melt it and slowly create an opening. As the hole was made, strong winds rushed into the room, nearly blowing Pepper off of her feet. Go! I'll meet you at the wreckage! Tony yells over the raging wind as he used his suit to remotely access Pepper's arc reactor. Before she even knew what was happening, Pepper was covered in her blue Iron Man suit and expertly launched out of the window. He watched as she landed safely before rushing out of the door, flying through the ship's spacious hallways. Rody, where are you? Tony called out over the communications built into each of their suits. Looking for you. Are you out of the ship? His friend's voice appeared in his ear. No, I'm looking for Gamora. Tony, are you okay? Pepper's worried voice filled their ears. Yes, follow the ship. I'll see you soon. Tony tried to calm her down. I found Gamora. Rhodes exclaimed over the comms. She's a little banged up, but she'll be fine. Good, let's get out of here before this thing crashes. Tony says as he rushes toward the engine room of the ship. Since every one of the Avengers ships is powered by one of his arc reactors, Tony had to be careful with each of them. After all, the arc reactor is a powerful weapon. In the wrong hands it could be used for some very nefarious deeds. Tony? Where are you? Pepper calls out worriedly. Rhodes and Gamora are already out. Just had to make a quick stop. I'm coming now. Tony answered calmly. Quickly ripping the small reactor from its connectors, Tony broke out of the ship, where he found Pepper, Rhodes, and Gamora waiting for him on a hill of junk. Thankfully, everyone was safe and in one piece. The only one that took some damage was Gamora. Who only had a few bumps and bruises from the crazy turbulence. Moments after Tony made his exit, the large Kree ship crashed down into a mountain of trash, sending junk flying everywhere. Thankfully, the ship didn't explode, as the trash piles absorbed a lot of the impact, but it was definitely damaged beyond repair. This is... Gamora looked up at the sky, which was filled with all sorts of wormholes. Sakar, You know this hellhole? Tony asked incredulously as he landed beside them and retracted his suit. Yes, Sakar is an anomaly. As you can see, it's surrounded by numerous wormholes that deposit space waste on the planet below. It's said that Sakarans and many other species are stranded here due to the wormholes. Though, nobody is dumb enough to even come near here, so it's all just rumors. How did we get here? As Gamora explained the small amount of knowledge that she had about Sakar, everyone took in the sight of the hills of junk, which were only growing larger thanks to the wormholes. This place is like a giant junkyard. Rhodes muttered. I refuse to believe anyone actually lives here. It's disgusting? Pepper winced as she covered her nose. Really? I think it's amazing. Tony smirks as he eyes the piles of trash for anything interesting. How could you possibly think that? Gamora asks in annoyance. I should have just waited for Spider-Man to pick me up. One planet's trash is another planet's treasure. Tony says as he bends down and picks up an advanced alien circuit board. In your point of view, this place is filled with garbage, but to any government or company on Earth, this place is a gold mine. They all watched on as Tony started running around collecting trash with a smile on his face. Oh, what's this? Is that a broken nuclear rubidium collector? How can someone throw this away? Oh my god. It's a cerium auto sequencers kit. I can use this quantum drive plate bonder to make an argon microfilament detonator. 
After a few minutes of scavenging, Tony started talking tech gibberish, which no one understood. Not even Gamora. Suddenly, as Tony was having a field day collecting his trash, a small dingy transport ship flew overhead before landing in front of the newly stranded group. People actually live here. Rhodes muttered in shock. As the doors of the ship opened, a large group of masked and hooded figures came walking out with weapons in hand. Um, Tony. Pepper called out to her boyfriend, who wasn't paying attention. What? Tony turned around with junk-filled arms. Are you fighters? Or are you food? One of the masked aliens asks as he rested his rifle on his shoulder. We're just passing through. Rhodes says as he prepares to activate his armor at any moment. They look weak. You guys can handle this? Tony looked the horde of ragged aliens over before turning back to collect his space junk. Oh, is that cesium compactor wire? It is food. The leading man yelled as the horde rushed forward. On your knees, food! Exclamation point. Rhodes acted much quicker than Pepper, who stood frozen beside him, as his bulky armor formed over his body in an instant. The last to form was the giant gun on his shoulder, which immediately opened fire on the oncoming horde of enemies. Do 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 do, aha, ugh, arg. Within seconds, the large wave of enemies was decimated by a never-ending stream of lead. For aliens, these guys were pretty weak. Rhodes mutters in disappointment. I told you so, Tony said as he dragged a pile of trash over to the transport ship. After throwing all of the junk inside, Tony turned back and waved everyone over. What are you waiting for? Let's go. Mirror dimension, Earth. With the lamp in hand, Peter laced his free hand with some eldritch energy before finally giving it a rub. Instantly, the lamp began to rapidly devour his eldritch energy. After a few seconds, Peter felt the lamp vibrate in his hand as it started to glow in a red light. This seems familiar, he thought. Suddenly, a loud screaming could be heard as a blue and red huge shimmering smoke shot out of the lamp, filling the open space before morphing into a familiar blue character. Insert picture of Genie from Aladdin here, ah! 10,000 years will give you such a crick on the neck. Genie held his neck in pain. Hang on a second. Genie motions for Peter to wait as he lifts his head off of his body and spins it around 360 degrees before putting it back on his shoulders. Wow, it feels good to be out of there. Genie says as a microphone appears in his hand. Nice to be back, ladies and gentlemen. Out of nowhere, clapping and cheering could be heard from all around, as if they were being watched by an audience. Genie looks down at Peter with his mic in hand. Hi, where are you from? What's your name? He asks as he held the mic up to Peter like a cringe late night talk show host. Did you read my mind and copy the genie from Aladdin? Peter asked as he caught a glimpse of a smirk on the genie's lips. Though it disappeared a moment later. As the ancient one said, genies have the ability to read their master's mind and although Peter's mental protections are perfect, it seems like it's still not strong enough for an entity like this. Peter? Hello, Peter. Nice to have you on the show. Can we call you Pete? Genie uses his name without being told, solidifying Peter's assumption even further. N Peter refused to be called Pete. Do you smoke? Genie asks as the mic turned into a cigar, which he stuck in his mouth. Mind if I do? Sure, go ahead. He shrugged. At the very least, the genie was amusing, and he sounded just like Robin Williams, which was a plus in his book. A slash N, rest in peace, Robin Williams Redheart. You're a lot smaller than my last master. Genie took a moment to size Peter up. Either that or I'm getting bigger. Check me out from the side. Do I look fat to you? Genie turned and stuck his stomach out before sucking it back in and flexing like a muscle-bound bodybuilder. Nope, looking good. Peter decided to just play along. Thanks, kid. So, what would you wish of me? The ever-impressive, the long-contained, often imitated but never duplicated. Genie of the Lamp. With every word, Genie acted out different scenarios and characters. Right here direct from the lamp. All for your wish fulfillment. Wish fulfillment, huh? Peter smirked. Three wishes to be exact. And no wishing for more wishes or other thought-up loopholes. That's it. Three. Uno, dos, trace. No substitutions, exchanges, or refunds, Genie explained theatrically. Sounds almost too good to be true. Peter continued to play along while wondering if he would actually start singing like the genie in Aladdin. Aladdin is my favorite Disney movie. The genie seemed to hear Peter's thoughts as that smirk returned once again. Master, I don't think you quite realize what you've got here. So why don't you just ruminate whilst I illuminate the possibilities? Genie said as familiar music started to fill the surrounding area. Musical notes Aladdin, friend like me musical notes, a slash n, I heavily recommend listening to the song while reading, though if you don't like this kind of stuff, then just skip the song portion. P.S. Make sure it's the original with Robin Williams. When Alibaba had them 40 thieves, Skiers Adai had a thousand tales. But master you in luck cause up your sleeves, you got a brand of magic never fails. You got some power in your corner now, some heavy ammunition in your camp, you got some punch, pizzazz, yahoo and how, see all you gotta do is rub that lamp, and I'll say. Mr. Peter, sir, what will your pleasure be? Let me take your order, jot it down, you ain't never had a friend like me. Ha ha ha. Life is your restaurant, and I'm your maitre d'. 
Come on, whisper what it is you want, you ain't never had a friend like me. Yes, sir, we pride ourselves on service, you're the boss, the king, the shah. Say what you wish, it's yours. True dish, how about a little more baklava? Have some of column A, try all of column B. I'm in the mood to help you dude, you ain't never had a friend like me. Wahaha, oh, my. Wahaha, no, no. Wahaha, my my my. Can your friends do this? Do your friends do that? Can your friends pull this out their little hat? Can your friends go, poof? Well, looky here, haha, can your friends go, abracadabra, let a rip, and then make the sucker disappear? So don't just sit there slack, jawed, buggy-eyed. I'm here to answer all your midday prayers, you got me bona fide, certified, you got a genie for your chair d'affaire. I got a powerful urge to help you out, so what you wish? I really wanna know. You got a list that's three miles long, no doubt, well, all you gotta do is rub like so, and oh. Mr. Peter, sir, have a wish or two or three. I'm on the job, you big nabob. You ain't never had a friend, never had a friend. You ain't never had a friend, never had a friend. You ain't never, had a, friend like me. Ah ha ha. Wah ha ha. You ain't never had a friend like me. Song end. As the song came to an end and Peter emerged from the whole crazy magical experience, which could almost rival the time his consciousness was thrown across the many dimensions, Genie sat there in front of him with a smirk on his face and a floating neon sign that read applause. Peter couldn't help it and started clapping. After all, he just had the chance to live out a childhood dream, so the least he could do is show some appreciation for the genie's effort. That was great, Peter says wholeheartedly. Though you can go back to normal now. You made your point, I don't think I will, genie said as a huge mirror appeared in front of him. I quite like this genie, so I think I'll keep the image. Ah, uh, okay, Peter nodded dumbly. So, what'll it be, master? Genie asked expectantly as the mirror disappeared. He seemed to be keeping with the Aladdin genie persona, which Peter didn't mind. Although he found it a bit weird, genies were already a complicated race to become with, and it's very likely that they've become a bit insane due to the many millennia spent trapped in containers. It's possible that this genie found Peter's idea of a perfect genie and latched onto it somehow. Or he's just evil and wants to put on a good front, Peter thought as the genie turned away, pretending not to listen to his master's innermost thoughts. Any more restrictions that I should know about? Peter asks. Well, there are a few limitations, a couple of quid pro quos, genie says. Like, rule number one. I can't kill anybody. So don't ask. Rule number two. I can't make anybody fall in love with anybody else. Rule number three. I can't bring people back from the dead. It's not a pretty picture and I don't like doing it. Other than that, you got it? Genie explains in his usual exaggerated self. There are a few other unsaid additions, but you'll find them if you're greedy enough. You're an all-powerful genie and you can't even bring people back from the dead? Peter asked, though he didn't plan on doing so in the first place. Excuse me? Are you looking at me? Did you rub my lamp? Did you wake me up? Did you bring me here? These are my rules. Take M or leave M, Genie says in annoyance. All right, here, Peter shrugs as he hands over his first and most powerful contract. Let's see here, Genie mutters as he takes the contract and morphs into a lawyer's appearance with a pair of big square glasses. Hmm. Details of the exchange. Addenda. Confidentiality clause. Termination clause. Consequences of breach of the agreement, and finally the date and signatures. Wow. I like to be thorough, Peter nods. Yeah, well, not going to happen. Genie shook his head as he ripped the contract into confetti and tossed it at Peter. Why? Peter asked as he swatted the paper away. First, I'm not some godlike being. I can't just snap my fingers and make you into a god. Genie waves his hands around. I mean, really? Omnipotence and omniscience? How can I possibly give you something that I can't obtain myself? Come on, kid. I'm a genie, not a miracle worker. With omniscience Peter would know everything. Quite literally. What could be, has been, and will be, Peter would know it all. As for omnipotence, he would have unlimited power with the ability to do anything that he could imagine. He would be an all-powerful god. Eh, I thought that might happen. Peter shrugs uncaringly as he pulls out his second contract. Another one? Genie reached out and grabbed the papers. Hm? What the hell is a system? Status, shop, inventory, missions, sign in, gotcha. What's a gotcha? It's like gambling for losers? Peter explains briefly. I see, and your second wish is. Gamer's body. Genie mutters in boredom as he holds the contract up and snaps his fingers, lighting it ablaze and turning it into ash. Not happening. Why? Peter actually cared a bit this time around. I'm not asking for anything godly, just the system alone is like six different wishes, and that's not counting every time you would use the shop. Genie explains with a wave of his hand. Get real, Pete. With the system, Peter would be able to live his life as if it were a game and increase his power with ease. And the gamer's body would assist in making him into a real game character, unlocking his potential into infinity. Of course, it came with a few extra perks, like receiving no physical damage from attacks. Only pain for a few seconds and a loss of HP. And after sleeping in a bed, it restores HP, MP, and cures all status effects. 
He would have truly lived as a game character. Please don't call me that. Peter sighs as he begrudgingly takes out his last contract. He couldn't help but hope it would work as he handed it over to the genie. After all, it's his last one. Let's see here. Genie pushed up his glasses and began to read for a third time. Hmm. Infinite potential and perfect evolution? These might just work. Infinite potential is as simple as it sounds. Peter's body, mind, and soul would have unending infinite potential to grow. Perfect evolution is just as simple as well. Peter would be adaptable to everything, developing into the strongest being that he could be. And with his infinite potential, there would be no limit to how far he could evolve. With these powers together, Peter could simply inject himself with the celestial DNA that he recently took possession of and evolve, integrating the pros of the celestial race into himself while shooing off the cons. His path to godhood would be much slower, but still possible. If Peter could use his third wish, he would ask for instant mastery or something like that, which would hasten his rise to power by a lot. After all, he would still have to train his evolutionary powers just like any other person. Even Quill, who is a celestial, has lived his entire life as a normal human. Power doesn't just build up on its own. It needs to be practiced diligently over time. Really? Peter asked hopefully. Yeah, but remember when I said there'd be some unsaid additions to the restrictions? Genie said hesitantly. Yeah, why? Peter raised a brow in question. Well, Sakar, what the hell is that? Pepper muttered as she peered out of the transport shuttle's window. After flying in nothing but a giant never-ending junkyard for a while, the group found a big city, which seemed to be made out of the scraps that fell from the many wormholes. Though two buildings stood out among the rest. A grand multicolored tower as well as a huge arena. On the outside of the oddly shaped tower were sculptures of faces, which were big enough to spot from far outside the city. Insert picture of the Grandmaster's palace here, as for the arena, although it was huge, that was about it. It didn't have any crazy art or colors like the tower, but it was certainly impressive. Insert picture of the Grand Arena here, okay, I was willing to believe that people live here, but this is just crazy. Rhodes muttered as he joined Pepper and Tony at the window. It's not actually that surprising, Tony says as he points to the pile of junk that he collected. This place is like a goldmine for alien tech and metals. As long as the people are smart enough to fix this stuff up, then a city like this is very possible. In fact, it's a bit pitiful in my opinion. Pepper, Gamora, and Rhodes raise a brow in question as Tony points to the rusted scrap metal buildings, which made up most of the rather large city. With all these resources, why didn't they just build factories to process the scraps and make some fresh metal to build with? The only two places that look to be built properly are that weird tower and the big coliseum over there. Tony points them both out. Maybe the leadership isn't the best? Pepper assumed. Even on Earth situations like this pop up in a few countries, where the leaders are either incompetent or corrupt, forcing the civilians to live a much harder life than they could be enjoying. We can always have a look. Tony changed course to the colorful tower with a bit of gleam in his eye. Although Tony isn't overly greedy, it was like this entire world was seductively calling his name. He wants to reap the endless technology from it. And if the current leader is lacking in his duties, or even better, a tyrant that misuses the power he holds, then maybe Tony should step in. For the good of the people, of course. He he he, Tony laughed quietly to himself as he stared at the never-ending hills of junk in the distance. Em, is he alright? Rhodes asks worriedly. Yeah, I think so. Pepper shrugs unknowingly. Although he wanted the junk, Tony didn't exactly enjoy the responsibility of leadership, so he would have to think carefully about how to handle this. As the ship landed not too far from the tower, Tony, Rhodes, and Pepper disembarked and looked for an entrance. Of course, Tony made sure to lock up the shuttle, as he didn't want his precious junk to be stolen. Hey! Are you new? Just as they found the entrance, some guards stopped them from getting inside. Each of them was dressed in matching black and brown heavy leather-looking armor, covering their entire bodies from head to toe. Insert picture of Sakaran guards here, and unlike the shabby scavengers that they met earlier, the guards were equipped with pristine weapons, which seemed to have been restored back to perfect working condition. Yeah. Pepper answered unsurely. Trash isn't the only thing that falls from the wormholes. People do as well. In fact, Sakar is said to not have a native species. Even the Salarians fell through the wormholes, though they were some of the first to arrive. Good, newbies have to use the other entrance. Follow me. A guard breaks off from the others and leads Tony's group to what appeared to be an amusement park ride on the side of the tower. Sat before them was an advanced roller coaster style train cart that connected to a rail, which led into the pitch black side entrance. Sit. The guard points to the seats. Gamora, Pepper and Rhodes didn't move an inch as they suspiciously eyed the train cart. Maybe we should dash Pepper tried to voice her suspicion, but stopped as she watched her boyfriend rush into the cart with an excited smile on his face. Come on, what are you waiting for? Tony turns to the group. This looks fun. Obviously, Tony had some suspicions as well, but with his suit always ready to deploy, not much could scare him these days. Tony Stark will be damned if he's afraid of a roller coaster ride. They all looked at one another for a moment before reluctantly following in Tony's footsteps. Taking out a small piece of paper, the guard starts reading in a bored tone. 
Please stay seated and keep your hands and feet inside the vehicle at all times. The Grandmaster is not responsible for any maiming, dismemberment, or decapitation that may or may not occur during your welcome experience. Please note that any defacing or destruction of the ride itself, including but not limited to littering, explosions, projectiles, and the excretion of bodily fluids will result in your swift and imminent death. Please enjoy your stay in Sakaar. What? Wait Dash Pepper exclaimed as the ride activated, driving them into the pitch black entrance. Before Pepper could continue speaking, suddenly, the walls lit up showing a perfect image of the universe, as if they were flying through space on a roller coaster. It looked so real that it shocked each of them into silence. While the trio was enjoying the view, a soothing female voice appeared. Fear not, for you are found. You are home, and there is no going back. No one leaves this place. As the voice spoke, music reminiscent of the movie Charlie and Chocolate Factory started playing in the background. Instantly, metal bindings shot out of the cart and wrapped around each of their wrists and ankles, trapping them in place. Tony. Pepper called out as she and Rhodes struggled against the metal straps. Relax? Tony said calmly as a small collection of formless metal dripped out of his arc reactor and fell toward the cart. Only moments after fusing into the train cart, the bindings retracted and the metal returned to the arc reactor, as if it were alive. See, no big deal, Tony says confidently. But what is this place? The answer is Sakaar. The tunnel walls change quickly, showing images of Sakaar's place in the infinite cosmos. Surrounded by cosmic gateways, Sakaar lives on the edge of the known and unknown. Images of the wormholes that cover Sakaar's atmosphere appear in perfect clarity, exciting Tony even more than he already was. This place is like a dream come true for him, it is the collection point for all lost and unloved things. Like you. But here on Sakaar, you are significant. You are valuable. Here, you are loved. What the hell is this brainwashing propaganda bullshit? Rhodes blurted out incredulously. And no one loves you more than the Grandmaster. The tunnel's images change again, revealing the Grandmaster, in silhouette, arriving at Sakaar all alone. He is the original. The first lost, and the first found. The creator of Sakaar and the father of the contest of champions, Suddenly, videos of the Grand Arena were shown, depicting awe-inspiring battles to the death between all sorts of alien races. The crowd roared and cheered, filling the tunnel with the excitement of battle. Where once you were nothing, now you are something. You are the property of the Grandmaster? The soothing voice sounded like a fanatic at that moment. What the actual hell is this crazy crap? Pepper, who rarely ever cursed, let out her innermost thoughts. This place is crazy, Rhodes muttered as he readied himself for a fight. I knew it. Tony thought as he found his reason to act. Congratulations. You will meet the Grandmaster in five seconds? The images around the tunnel begin speeding up. Chaos, violence, and confusion mixed in with the Grandmaster's face filled the surroundings. Pepper, who was already beyond bewildered, looked on the verge of panic at this point. After all, she isn't used to high-stress situations like this. Her life is rather mundane for a CEO of a trillion-dollar company. She didn't have the Avengers experience of Tony or the military experience of Rhodes to help her through this. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. You are now meeting the Grandmaster. Mirror Dimension remember when I said there'd be some unsaid additions to the restrictions? Genie said hesitantly. Yeah, why? Peter raised a brow in question. Well, for those that ask for something especially greedy, like yourself, a trial will appear for each wish. Genie explained as he morphed into a professor and a chart appeared behind him. See this? Anyone that asks for a wish that could lead to power higher than the Jin granting it would need to be tested? Why? Who made that decision? Peter asks in annoyance. He just wanted his wishes already. It ain't me, kid. Genie holds up his hands to show his innocence. You can thank the pricks that enslaved me and my people for this one. Genie broke character for just a moment, showing his true feelings about his predicament, before reverting to his chosen persona. Right, so how does this work exactly? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.